Prologue of the Black Moth This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tara Mendoza The Black Moth by Georgette Hare Prologue Clad in his customary black and silver, with raven hair unpowdered and elaborately dressed, diamonds on his fingers and in his cravat, Hugh Tracy Clare Belmanois, Duke of Andover, sat at the escritoire in the library of his townhouse, writing. He wore no rouge on his face, the almost unnatural pallor of which seemed designedly enhanced by a patch set beneath his right eye. Brows and lashes were black, the former slanting slightly up at the corners, but his narrow, heavy-lidded eyes were green and strangely piercing. The thin lips curled a little, sneering as one dead white hand travelled to and fro across the paper. "'But it seems that the fair lady has a brother, who, finding me enamoured, threw down the gauntlet. I soundly whipped the presumptuous child, and so the affair ends. Now, as you, my dear Frank, also took some interest in the lady, I write you for the express purpose of informing you that at my hands she has received no hurt, nor is not like to. This I in part tell you, that you shall not imagine yourself in honour bound again to call me out, which purpose, and I mistake not, I yesterday read in your eyes. I should be exceeding loath to meet you a second time, when I should consider it my duty to teach you an even severer lesson than before. This I am not wishful of doing for the liking I bear you. So in all friendship, believe me, Frank, your most obedient humble devil. His Grace of Andover paused, pen held in mid-air, a mocking smile dawned in his eyes, and he wrote again. "'In the event of any desire on your part to hazard your luck with my late paramour, permit me to warn you against the phantom brother, who is in very truth a fire-eater, and would wish to make of you, as of me, one mouthful. I shall hope to see you at the Queensbury rout on Thursday, when you may once more strive to direct mine erring footsteps on to the thorny path of virtue.' His grace read the postscript through with another satisfied sardonic smile. Then he folded the letter, and affixing a wafer peremptorily struck the hand-bell at his side. And the Honourable Frank Fortescue, reading the postscript half an hour later, smiled too, but differently. Also he sighed, and put the letter into the fire. "'And so ends another affair. I wonder if you'll go insolently to the very end,' he said softly, watching the paper shrivel and flare up. I would to God you might fall honestly in love, and that the lady might save you from yourself, my poor devil. End of Prologue Recording by Tara Mendoza Phoenix, Arizona, April 2011For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tara Mendoza The Black Moth by George Ed Hare Chapter One, At the Checkers Inn, Fallowfield Chadber was the name of the host, florid of countenance, portly of person, and of manner pompous and urbane. Solely within the walls of the Checkers lay his world— that inn having been acquired by his great-grandfathers as far back as the year 1667, when the jovial Stuart king sat on the English throne, and the Hanoverian electors were not yet dreamed of. A Tory was Mr. Chadber to the backbone. None so bitter against the little German as he, and surely none had looked forward more eagerly to the advent of the gallant Charles Edward. If he confined his patriotism to drinking success to Prince Charlie's campaign, who shall blame him? And, if when sundry Whig gentlemen halted at the checkers on their way to the coast, and calling for a bottle of Rhenish, bade him toss down a glass himself, with a health to his majesty, again, who shall blame Mr. Chadber for obeying? What was a health one way or another, when you had rendered active service to two of his Stuart Highness's adherents? It was Mr. Chadber's boast, uttered only to his admiring Tory neighbours, that he had, at the risk of his own life, given shelter to two fugitives of the disastrous forty-five, who had come so far out of their way as quiet Fallowfield, 
that no one had set eyes on either of the men was no reason for doubting an honest landlord's word but no one would have thought of doubting any statement that mr chadbear might make mine host of the checkers was a great personage in the town being able both to read and to write and having once when young travelled as far north as london town staying there for ten days and setting eyes on no less a person than the great duke of marlborough himself when that gentleman was riding along the strand on his way to st james's also it was a not to be ignored fact that mr chadber's home brewed ale was far superior to that sold by the landlord of the rival inn at the other end of the village altogether he was a most important character and no one was more aware of his importance than his worthy self to gentlemen born whom he protested he could distinguish at a glance he was almost obsequiously polite but on clerks and underlings and men who bore no signs of affluence about their persons he wasted none of his deference thus it was that when a little green-clad lawyer alighted one day from the mail-coach and entered the coffee-room at the checkers he was received with pomposity and scarce veiled condescension he was nervous it seemed and more than a little worried he offended mr chadber at the outset when he insinuated that he was come to meet a gentleman who might perhaps be rather shabbily clothed rather short of purse and even of rather unsavoury repute very severely did mr chadber give him to understand that guests of that description were entirely unknown at the chequers there was an air of mystery about the lawyer and it appeared almost as though he were striving to probe mine host mr chadber bridled a little and became aloof and haughty when the lawyer dared openly to ask if he had had any dealings with highwaymen of late he was very properly and thoroughly affronted the lawyer became suddenly more at ease he eyed mr chadber speculatively holding a pinch of snuff to one thin nostril perhaps you have staying here a certain uh, sir anthony fendel he hazarded the gentle air of injury fell from mr chadber certainly he had and come only yesterday of purpose to meet his solicitor the lawyer nodded i am he be so good as to apprise sir anthony of my arrival mr chadber bowed exceeding low and implored the lawyer not to remain in the droughty coffee-room sir anthony would never forgive him and he allowed his solicitor to wait him there would he not come to sir anthony's private parlour the very faintest of smiles creased the lawyer's thin face as he walked along the passage in mr chadber's wake he was ushered into a low-ceilinged pleasant chamber looking out on to the quiet street and left alone what time mr chadber went in search of sir anthony the room was panelled and ceilinged in oak with blue curtains to the windows and blue cushions on the high-backed settle by the fire a table stood in the centre of the floor with a white tablecloth thereon and places laid for two another smaller table stood by the fireplace together with a chair and a stool the lawyer took silent stock of his surroundings and reflected grimly on the landlord's sudden change of front it would appear that sir anthony was a gentleman of some standing at the checkers yet the little man was plainly unhappy and fell to pacing to and fro his chin sunk low on his breast and his hands clasped behind his back he was come to seek the disgraced son of an earl and he was afraid of what he might find six years ago lord john carstairs eldest son of the earl of wincham had gone with his brother the honourable richard to a card party and had returned a dishonoured man that jack carstairs should cheat was incredible ridiculous and at first no one had believed the tale that so quickly spread but he had confirmed that tale himself defiantly and without shame before riding off bound men said for france and the foreign parts brother richard was left so said the countryside to marry the lady they were both in love with nothing further had been heard of lord john and the outraged earl forbid his name to be mentioned at wincham swearing to disinherit the prodigal richard espoused the fair lady lavinia and brought her to live at the great house strangely forlorn now without lord john's magnetic presence but far from being an elated bridegroom he seemed to have brought gloom with him from the honeymoon so silent and so unhappy was he six years drifted slowly by without bringing any news of lord john and then two months ago journeying from london to wincham richard's coach 
had been waylaid, and by a highwayman who proved to be none other than the scapegrace peer. Richard's feelings may be imagined. Lord John had been singularly unimpressed by anything beyond the humour of the situation. That, however, had struck him most forcibly, and he had burst out into a fit of laughter that had brought a lump into Richard's throat and a fresh ache into his heart. Upon pressure, John had given his brother the address of the inn, in case of accidents, and told him to ask for Sir Anthony Ferndale, if ever he should need him. Then, with one hearty handshake, he had galloped off into the darkness. The lawyer stopped his restless pacing to listen. Down the passage was coming the tap-tap of high heels on the wooden floor, accompanied by a slight rustle, as of stiff silks. The little man tugged suddenly at his cravat, supposing— supposing debonair lord john was no longer debonair supposing he dared not suppose anything nervously he drew a roll of parchment from his pocket and stood fingering it a firm hand was laid on the door handle turning it cleanly round the door opened to admit a veritable apparition and was closed again with a snap the lawyer found himself gazing at a slight rather tall gentleman who swept him a profound bow gracefully flourishing his smart three-cornered hat with one hand and delicately clasping cane and perfumed handkerchief with the other. He was dressed in the height of the Versailles fashion, with full-skirted coat of palest lilac, laced with silver, small clothes and stockings of white, and waistcoat of flowered satin. On his feet he wore shoes with high red heels and silver buckles, while a wig of the latest mode marvellously powdered and curled, and smacking greatly of Paris, adorned his shapely head. In the foaming lace of his cravat reposed a diamond pin, and on the slim hand, half covered by drooping laces, glowed and flashed a huge emerald. The lawyer stared and stared again, and it was not until a pair of deep blue, rather wistful eyes met his in a quizzical glance that he found his tongue. Then a look of astonishment came into his face, and he took a half-step forward. "'Master Jack!' he gasped. "'Master Jack!' The elegant gentleman came forward and held up a reproving hand. The patch at the corner of his mouth quivered, and the blue eyes danced. "'I perceive that you are not acquainted with me, Mr. Warburton,' he said amusement in his pleasant, slightly drawling voice. "'Allow me to present myself.' Sir Anthony Ferndale, à vous souvenir. A gleam of humour appeared in the lawyer's own eyes as he clasped the outstretched hand. "'I think you are perhaps not acquainted with yourself, my lord,' he remarked dryly. Lord John laid his hat and cane on the small table and looked faintly intrigued. "'What's your meaning, Mr. Warburton?' "'I am come, my lord, to inform you that the earl your father died a month since.' The blue eyes widened, grew of a sudden hard, and narrowed again. "'Is that really so? Well, well. Apoplexy, I make no doubt.' The lawyer's lips twitched uncontrollably. "'No, Master Jack. My lord died of heart failure.' "'So you say. Dear me. But will you not be seated, sir? In a moment my servant will have induced the chef to serve dinner. You will honour me, I trust?' The lawyer murmured his thanks and sat down on the settle, watching the other with puzzled eyes. The earl drew up a chair for himself and stretched his foot to the fire. Six years, eh? I protest his prodigious good to see your face again, Mr. Warburton. And I'm the earl. Earl and high Toby, by gad. He laughed softly. I have the documents here, my lord. Carstairs eyed the roll through his quizzing glass. I perceive them. Pray. "'Return them to your pocket, Mr. Warburton. "'But there are certain legal formalities, my lord.' "'Exactly. Pray do not let us mention them.' "'But, sir—' "'Then the earl smiled, and his smile was singularly sweet and winning. "'At least not until after dinner, Warburton. "'Instead, you shall tell me how you found me.' "'Mr. Richard directed me to come here, sir.' "'Ah, of course. I had forgot that I told him my—' my pied a terre. When I waylaid him, the lawyer nearly shuddered at this cheerful, barefaced mention of his lordship's disreputable profession. Uh, indeed, sir, Mr. Richard is eager for you to return. 
The handsome young face clouded over. My lord shook his head. "'Impossible, my dear Warburton. I am convinced Dick never voiced so foolish a suggestion. Come now, confess. Tis your own fabrication.' Warburton ignored the bantering tone, and spoke very deliberately. "'At all events, my lord, I believe him anxious to make amends.' Carstairs shot an alert, suspicious glance at him. "'Ah! Yes, sir, amends.' My lord steadied his emerald with half-closed eyelids. "'But why amends, Warburton?' he asked. "'Is not that the word, sir?' "'I confess it strikes me as inapt. Doubtless I am dull of comprehension.' "'You were not wont to be, my lord.' "'No. But six years changes a man, Warburton.' Pray, is Mr. Carstairs well? I believe so, sir, replied the lawyer, frowning at the deft change of subject. And Lady Lavinia? Aye, Mr. Warburton looked searchingly across at him, seeing which my lord's eyes danced afresh, brim full with mischief. I am very delighted to hear it. Pray present my compliments to Mr. Carstairs, and beg him to use Wincham as he wills. Sir! "'Master Jack, I implore you!' burst from the lawyer, and he sprang up, moving excitedly away, his hands twitching, his face haggard. My lord stiffened in his chair. He watched the other's jerky movements anxiously, but his voice when he spoke was even and cold. "'Well, sir?' Mr. Warburton wheeled and came back to the fireplace, looking hungrily down at my lord's impassive countenance. With an effort he seemed to control himself. "'Master Jack! I had better tell you what you have already guessed, I know. Up went one haughty eyebrow. You know what, Warburton? That you are innocent. Of what, Mr. Warburton? Of cheating at cards, sir. My lord relaxed, and flicked a speck of dust from his great cuff. I regret the necessity of having to disillusion you, Mr. Warburton. My lord, do not fence with me, I beg. You can trust me, surely. "'Certainly, sir. Then do not keep up this pretense with me, no, nor look so hard, neither. I've watched you grow up right from the cradle, and Master Dick, too, and I know you both through and through. I know you never cheated at Colonel Dale's, nor anywhere else. I could have sworn it at the time. I, when I saw Master Dick's face, I knew at once that he, it was, who had played foul, and you had but taken the blame. No. I know better.' Can you, Master Jack, look me in the face, and truthfully deny what I have said? Can you? Can you? My lord sat silent. With a sigh, Warburton sank on to the settle once more. He was flushed, and his eyes shone, but he spoke calmly again. Of course you cannot. I have never known you to lie. You need not fear I shall betray you. I kept silence all these years for my lord's sake, and I will not speak now until you give me leave which I never shall. Master Jack, think better of it, I beg of you, now that my lord is dead. It makes no difference. No difference? T'was not for his sake? T'was not because you knew how he loved Master Dick? No. Then tis Lady Lavinia? No. But— My lord smiled sadly. Ah, Warburton, and you averred you knew us through and through— for whose sake should it be but his own? I feared it. The lawyer made a hopeless gesture with his hands. You will not come back. No, Warburton, I will not. Dick may manage my estates. I remain on the road. Warburton made one last effort. My lord, he cried despairingly, will you not at least think of the disgrace to the name, and you be caught? The shadows vanished from my lord's eyes. "'Mr. Warburton, I protest you are of a morbid turn of mind. Do you know I had not thought of so unpleasant a contingency? I swear I was not born to be hanged.' The lawyer would have said more, had not the entrance of a servant carrying a loaded tray put an end to all private conversation. The man placed dishes upon the table, lighted candles, and arranged two chairs. "'Dinner is served, sir,' he said. My lord nodded, and made a slight gesture toward the windows. Instantly the man went over to them, and threw the heavy curtains across. My lord turned to Mr. Warburton. 
"'What say you, sir? Shall we be burgundy or claret? Or do you prefer sack?' Warburton decided in favour of claret. "'Claret, Jim,' ordered Carstairs, and rose to his feet. "'I trust the drive has whetted your appetite, Warburton. For honest, Chadber will be monstrous hurt, and you do not justice to his capons. "'I shall endeavour to spare his feelings.' replied the lawyer with a twinkle, and seated himself at the table. Whatever might be Mr. Chadber's failings, he possessed an excellent cook. Mr. Warburton dined very well, beginning on a fat duck and continuing through the main courses that constituted the meal. When the table was cleared, the servant gone, and the port before them, he endeavoured to guide the conversation back into the previous channels. But he reckoned without my lord, and presently found himself discussing the pretender's late rebellion, he sat up suddenly. "'There were rumours that you were with the prince, sir.' Carstairs set down his glass in genuine amazement. "'Aye. Indeed, yes, sir. I do not know whence the rumour came, but it reached Wincham. My lord said not, but I think Mr. Richard hardly credited it. I should hope not. Why should they think me turned rebel, pray?' Mr. Warburton frowned. "'Rebel, sir. Rebel, Mr. Warburton.' I have served under his majesty. The Carstairs were ever Tories, Master Jack, true to their rightful king. My dear Warburton, I owe not to the Stuart princes. I was born in King George the First's reign, and I protest I am a good Whig. Warburton shook his head disapprovingly. There has never been a Whig in the Wincham family, sir. And you hope there never will be again, eh? What of Dick? Is he faithful to the pretender? "'I think Mr. Richard does not interest himself in politics, sir.' Carstairs raised his eyebrows, and there fell a silence. After a minute or two, Mr. Warburton cleared his throat. "'I—I I suppose, sir, you have no idea of uh, discontinuing your uh, profession?' My lord gave an irrepressible little laugh. <laughs> "'Faith, Mr. Warburton, I've only just begun.' "'Only but a year ago, Mr. Richard. I held him up.' I, But to tell the truth, sir, I have not done much since then. Then, sir, you are not uh, notorious? Good gad, no. Notorious, forsooth. <laughs> Confess, Warburton, you thought me some heroic figure. Gentleman Harry, perhaps? Warburton blushed. Well, sir, I, uh, wondered. I shall have to disappoint you, I perceive. I doubt Bow Street has never heard of me, and, to tell the truth, is not an occupation which appeals vastly to my senses. Then why, my lord, do you continue? I must have some excuse for roaming the country, pleaded Jack. I could not be idle. You are not compelled to, uh, rob, my lord? Carstairs wrinkled his brow inquiringly. Compelled? Ah, I take your meaning. No, Warburton, I have enough for my wants. Now time was, but that is past. I rob for amusement's sake. Warburton looked steadily across at him. I am surprised, my lord, that you, a Carstairs, should find it amusing. John was silent for a moment, and, and when he at length spoke, it was defiantly and with a bitterness most unusual in him. The world, Mr. Warburton, has not treated me so kindly that I should feel any qualms of conscience. But if it gives you any satisfaction to know it, I will tell you that my robberies are few and far between. You spoke a little while ago of my probable all fate on Tyburn Tree. I think you need not fear to hear of that. I—it gives me great satisfaction, my lord, I confess, stammered the lawyer, and found nothing more to say. After a long pause, he again produced the bulky roll of parchment, and laid it down before the earl with the apologetic murmur of, "'Business, my lord.' Carstairs descended from the clouds, and eyed the packet with evident distaste. He proceeded to fill his and his companion's glass very leisurely. That done, he heaved a lugubrious sigh, caught Mr. Warburton's eye, laughed in answer to its quizzical gleam, and broke the seal. Since you will have it, sir, business. Mr. Warburton stayed the night at the Checkers and travelled back to Wincham next day by the two o'clock coach. He played piquet and an ecarte with my lord all the evening, and then retired to bed not having found an opportunity to argue his mission, as he had hoped to do. Whenever he had tried to turn the conversation that way, he had been gently but firmly led into safer channels, and somehow had found it impossible to get back. 
My lord was the gayest and most charming of companions, but talk business he would not. He regaled the lawyer with spicy anecdotes and tales of abroad, but never once allowed Mr. Warburton to speak of his home or of his brother. The lawyer retired to rest in a measure reassured by the other's good spirits, but at the same time dispirited by his failure to induce Carstairs to return to Wincham. Next morning, although, he was not up until twelve. He was before my lord, who only appeared in time for lunch, which was served as before in the oak parlour. He entered the room in his usual leisurely yet decided fashion, and made Mr. Warburton a marvellous leg. Then he bore him off to inspect his mare, Jenny, of whom he was inordinately proud. By the time they returned to the parlour, luncheon was served, and Mr. Warburton realised that he had scarcely time left in which to plead his cause. My lord's servant hovered continually about the room, waiting on them, until his master bade him go to attend to the lawyer's valise. When the door had closed on his retreating form, Carstairs leaned back in his chair, with a rather dreary little smile, turned to his companion. "'You want to reason with me, I know, Mr. Warburton, and indeed I will listen, and I must. But I would so much rather that you left the subject alone, believe me. Warburton sensed the finality in his voice, and wisely threw away at his last chance. "'I understand his painful, my lord, and I will say no more. Only remember, and think on it, I beg.' The concern in his face touched my lord. "'You are too good to me, Mr. Warburton, I vow. I can only say that I appreciate your kindness, and your forbearance, and I trust that you will forgive my seeming churlishness, and believe that I am indeed grateful to you. I wish I might do more for you, Master Jack,' stammered Warburton, made miserable by the wistful note in his favourite's voice. There was no time for more. The coach already awaited him, and his valise had been hoisted up. As they stood together in the porch, he could only grip my lord's hand tightly and say good-bye. Then he got hurriedly into the coach, and the door was slammed behind him. My lord made his leg, and watched the heavy vehicle move forward and roll away down the street. Then with a stifled sigh he turned and walked towards the stables. His servant saw him coming, and went at once to greet him. "'The mare, sir?' "'As you say, Jim. The mare. In an hour.' He turned, and would have strolled back. "'Sir, your honour. he paused, looking over his shoulder. "'Well?' "'They're on the lookout, sir. Best be careful.' "'They always are, Jim. But thanks. Ye—ye ye wouldn't take me with ye, sir,' pleadingly. "'Take you? Faith, no. I've no mind to lead you into danger, and you serve me best by remaining to carry out my orders.' The man fell back. "'Aye, sir, but—but—' but, "'There are none, Jim. No, sir. But ye will have a care. I will be the most cautious of men.' He walked away on the word, and passed into the house. In an hour he was a very different being. Gone was the emerald ring, the foppish cane, the languid air, too, had disappeared, leaving him brisk and business-like. He was dressed for riding, with buff coat and buckskin breeches, and shining top-boots. A sober brown wig replaced the powdered creation, and a black tricorn was set rakishly atop. He stood in the deserted porch, watching Jim strap his baggage to the saddle, occasionally giving a curt direction. Presently Mr. Chadber appeared with the stirrup cup, which he drained and handed back with a word of thanks and a guinea at the bottom. Someone called lustily from within, and the landlord, bowing very low, murmured apologies and vanished. Jim cast a last glance at the saddle girths, and leaving the mare quietly standing in the road, came up to his master with gloves and whip. Carstairs took them silently, and fell to tapping his boot, his eyes thoughtfully on the man's face. "'You will hire a coach as usual,' he said at length, "'and take my baggage to—' He paused, frowning. "'Lose. You will engage a room at the White Hart, and order dinner. I shall wear apricot and—' hmm, "'Blue, sir,' ventured Jim, with an idea of being helpful. His master's eyes crinkled at the corners. "'You are a humorous salter. Apricot and cream. Cream? Yes, tis a pleasing thought. Cream. That is all. Jenny!' The mare turned her head, whinnying as he came towards her. "'Good lass!' He mounted lightly, and patted her glossy neck. Then he leaned sideways in the saddle to speak again to Salter, who stood beside him one hand on the bridle. The cloak? 
"'Behind you, sir.' "'My wig?' "'Yes, sir.' "'Pistols?' "'Ready prime, sir. I shall be in lose in time for dinner with luck.' "'Yes, sir. Ye—ye ye will have a care?' "'Anxiously. Have I not told you?' He straightened in the saddle, touched the mare with his heel, and, bestowing a quick smile and a nod on his man, trotted easily away. End of chapter 1 Recording by Tara Mendoza Phoenix, Arizona May 2011Chapter Two of the Black Moth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tara Mendoza. The Black Moth by Georgette Hare. Chapter Two My Lord at the White Heart. Sir Anthony Ferndale sat before the dressing table in his room at the White Heart idly polishing his nails. A gorgeous silk dressing-gown lay over the back of his chair, and behind him Jim was attending to his wig, at the same time hovering anxiously over the coat and waistcoat that were waiting to be donned. Carstairs left off polishing his nails, yawned, and leaned back in his chair. A slim, graceful figure in cambric shirt and apricot satin breeches. He studied his cravat for some moments in the mirror, and lifted a hand to it. Salter held his breath. With extreme deliberation, the hand moved a diamond and emerald pin in the fraction of an inch to one side, and fell to his side again. Salter drew a relieved breath, which brought his master's eyes round to himself. "'No trouble, Jim.' "'None at all, sir.' "'Neither had I. "'Twas most surprisingly easy. "'The birds had no more fight in them than sparrows. Two men in a coach.' one a bullying rascal of a merchant, the other his clerk. Gad, but I was sorry for that little man. He paused, his hand on the rouge pot. Salter looked an inquiry. Yes, nodded Carstairs. Very sorry. The fat man would appear to bully and browbeat him after the manner of his kind. He even blamed him for my advent. The greasy coward. Yes, Jim, you are right. He did not appeal to me. Say, Imfudby. So, ingeniously, I relieved him of his cash-box, and two hundred guineas, a present for the poor of Luz. Jim jerked his shoulder, frowning. "'If you give away all you get, sir, why do you rob at all?' he asked Blim. His whimsical little smile played about my lord's mouth. "'Tis an object for my life, Jim, a noble object, and I believe it amuses me to play Robin Hood. "'Take from the rich to give to the poor,' he added, for Salter's benefit. "'But to return to my victims, you would have laughed, "'had you but seen my little man come tumbling out of the coach when I opened the door. "'Tumble, sir. Why should he do that?' "'He was at pains to explain the reason. "'It seems he had been commanded to hold the door to prevent my entering. "'So when I jerked it open, sooner than loose his hold, he fell out on to the road.' Of course I apologized most abjectly, and we had some conversation. Quite a nice little man. It made me laugh to see him sprawling on the road, though. Wish I could have seen it, Your Honour. I would have liked fine to have been beside ye. He looked down at the leith form with some pride. I'd give something to see ye hold up a coach, sir. Hare's foot in hand, Jack met his admiring eyes in the glass and laughed. <laughs> I make no doubt you would. I have cultivated a superb voice, a trifle thick and beery, a little loud, perhaps. Ah, something to dream of at nights. I doubt they do, too, he added reflectively, and affixed the patch at the corner of his mouth. So, a little low, you think? But twill suffice. What's toward? Down below in the street there was a great stirring and bustling horses' hoofs, shouts from the ostlers, and the sound of wheels on the cobblestones. Jim went to the window and looked down, craning his neck to see over the balcony. "'Tis a coach arrived, sir.' "'That much I had gathered,' replied my lord, busy with the powder. "'Yes, sir.' "'Oh, Lord, sir!' He was shaken with laughter. "'What now?' "'Tis a curiousest sight, sir. Two gentlemen, one fat and t'other small. One's all shriveled, looking like a spider, while t'other, 
"'Resembles a hippopotamus, particularly in the face?' "'Well, yes, sir. He do, rather. And he be wearing purple.' "'Heavens, yes. Purple and an orange waistcoat.' Jim peered afresh. "'So it is, sir. But how did ye know?' Even as he put the question, understanding flashed into Jim's eyes. "'I rather think that I had the honour of meeting these gentlemen,' replied my lord placidly. "'My buckle, Jim. It's a prodigious great coach with wheels picked out in yellow. Ay, Yana, the gentlemen seem a bit put out, too.' "'That is quite probable. Does the smaller gentleman wear somewhat, uh, muddied garments?' "'I can't see, sir. He stands behind the fat gentleman. Mr. Bumblebee. Jim! Sir!' Jim turned quickly at the sound of a sharp voice. He found that my lord had risen, and was holding up a waistcoat, pea-green pattern on a bilious yellow ground, between a disgusted finger and thumb. Before his severe frown, Jim dropped his eyes and stood looking for all the world like a schoolboy detected in some crime. "'You put this—this this monstrosity out for me to wear?' in awful tones. Jim eyed the waistcoat gloomily and nodded. "'Yes, sir. Did I not specify cream ground?' "'Yes, sir. I thought—I thought that twas cream.' "'My good friend, it is—it is—I cannot say what it is. And pea green,' he shuddered. "'Remove it!' Jim hurried forward, and disposed of the offending garment. "'And bring me the broidered satin. Yes, that is it. It is particularly pleasing to the eye.' "'Yes, sir,' agreed the abashed Jim. "'You are excused this time.' added my lord, with a twinkle in his eye. What are our two friends doing? Salter went back to the window. They've gone into the house, sir. No, here's the spider, gentlemen. He do seem in a hurry, your honour. Ah, murmured his lordship. You may assist me into this coat. Thanks. With no little difficulty, my lord managed to enter into the fine satin garment, which went on seemed moulded to his back. So excellently did it fit. He shook out his ruffles and slipped the emerald ring on to his finger with a slight frown. "'I believe I shall remain here some few days,' he remarked presently. "'To, uh, allay suspicion.' He looked across at his man as he spoke, through his lashes. It was not in Jim's nature to inquire into his master's affairs, much less to be surprised at anything he might do or say. He was content— to receive and promptly execute his orders, and to worship Carstairs with a dog-like devotion, following blindly in his wake, happy as long as he might serve him. Carstairs had found him in France, very down upon his luck, having been discharged from the service of his late master, owing to the penniless condition of that gentleman's pocket. He had engaged him as his own personal servant, and the man had remained with him ever since, proving an invaluable acquisition to my lord John. Despite a singularly wooden countenance, he was by no means a fool, and he had helped Carstairs out of more than one tight corner during his inglorious and foolhardy career as highwayman. He probably understood his somewhat erratic master better than any one else, and he now divined what was in his mind. He returned that glance with a significant wink. "'Twas them gentlemen ye held up to-day, sir?' he asked, jerking an expressive thumb towards the window. Mm. "'Mr. Bumblebee and friend. "'It would almost appear so. "'I think I do not fully appreciate Mr. Bumblebee. "'I find his conduct rather tiresome. "'But it is just possible that he thinks the same of me. "'I will further my acquaintance with him.' "'Jim grunted scornfully, "'and an inquiring eye was cocked at him. "'You do not admire our friend. "'Pray do not judge him by his exterior. "'He may possess a beautiful mind, "'but I do not think so.' "'No, no, I really do not think so.' He chuckled a little. "'Do you know, Jim, I believe I am going to enjoy myself to-night?' "'I don't doubt it, your honour. "'To a child's play to trick the fat gentleman, probably. "'But it is not with the fat gentleman that I shall have to deal. "'Tis with all the officials of this charming town, and I mistake not. "'Do I hear the small spider returning?' Salter stepped back to the window. "'Aye, sir.' with three others. Precisely. 
be so good as to hand me my snuff-box and my cane thank you i feel the time has now come for me to put in an appearance pray bear in mind that i am new come from france and journey by easy stages to london and cultivate a stupid expression yes that will do excellently jim grinned delightedly he had assumed no expression of stupidity and was consequently much pleased with this pleasantry he swung open the door with an air and watched sir anthony mince along the passage to the stairs in the coffee-room the city merchant mr fudby by name was relating the story of his wrongs with many an impressive pause and much emphasis to the mayor town clerk and beadle of Luz. all three had been fetched by mr chilter his clerk in obedience to his orders for the bigger the audience the better pleased was mr fudby he was now enjoying himself quite considerably despite the loss of his precious cash-box so was not mr hedges the mayor he was a fussy little man who suffered from dyspepsia he was not interested in the affair and he did not see what was to be done for mr fudby further he had been hailed from his dinner and he was hungry and above all he found mr fudby very unattractive still a high road robbery was serious matter enough and some course of action must be thought out so he listened to the story with an assumption of interest looking exceedingly wise and at the proper moments uttering sounds betokening concern the more he saw and heard of mr fudby the less he liked him neither did the town clerk care for him there was that about mr fudby that did not endear him to his fellow-men especially when they chanced to be his inferiors in the social scale the beetle did not think much about anything having decided and rightly that the affair had nothing whatever to do with him he leaned back in his chair and stared stolidly up at the ceiling. The tale Mr. Fudby was telling bore surprisingly little resemblance to the truth. It was a much embellished version in which he himself had behaved with quite remarkable gallantry. It had been gradually concocted during the journey to Lewes. He was still holding forth when my lord entered the room. Carstairs raised his glass languidly to survey the assembled company, bowed slightly, and walked over to the fire. He seated himself in an armchair and took no further notice of anybody. Mr. Hedges had recognized at a glance that here was some grand seigneur, and wished that Mr. Fudby would not speak in so loud a voice. But that individual, delighted at having a new auditor, continued his tale with much relish and in a still louder tone. My lord yawned delicately and took a pinch of snuff. "'Yes, yes,' fussed Mr. Hedges. But short of sending to London for the runners, I do not see what I can do. If I send to London, it must, of course, be at your expense, sir. Mr. Fudby bristled. At my expense, sir? Do you say at my expense? I am surprised. I repeat, I am surprised. Indeed, sir, I can order the town crier out describing the horse and uh, offering a reward for the capture of any man on such an animal but he shrugged and looked across at the town clerk i do not imagine that would be of much use eh mr brand the clerk pursed his lips and spread out his hands i fear not i fear very much not i would advise mr fudby to have a proclamation posted up round the country he sat back with the air of one who has contributed his share to the work and does not intend to offer any more help ho oh, growled mr fudby he blew out his cheeks it will be a grievous expense though i suppose it must be done i cannot but feel that if it had not been for your deplorably coward conduct chilter yes cowardly conduct i say i might never have been robbed of my two hundred he snuffled a little, and eyed the flushed but silent Chilter with mingled reproach and scorn. However, my coachman assures me he could swear to the horse again, although he cannot remember much about the man himself. Chilter, how did he describe the horse? Oh, er, uh, chestnut, Mr. Fubby, chestnut, with a half moon of white on its forehead, and one white foreleg, jack perceived that it was time he took a hand in the game 
He half turned in his chair, and levelled his quizzing-glass at Mr. Chilter. "'I beg your pardon,' he drawled. Mr. Fudby's eyes brightened. The fine gentleman was roused to an expression of interest at last. He launched forth into his story once more, for my lord's benefit. Carstairs eyed him coldly, seeing which Mr. Hedges came hurriedly to the rescue. "'Er, uh, yes, Mr. Fudby, quite so. Your pardon, sir, I have not the honour of knowing your name.' "'Ferndale,' supplied Jack. "'Sir Anthony Ferndale.' "'Er, uh, yes,' Mr. Hedges bowed. "'Pray pardon my importuning you with our—' "'Not at all,' said my lord. "'No, quite so. The fact is, these uh, gentlemen have had the uh, misfortune to be waylaid on their journey here.' Sir Anthony's glass was again levelled at the group. His expression betokened mild surprise. "'All these gentlemen?' he inquired blandly. "'Oh, no, 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 sir, not all, only Mr. Uh—' "'Fudby,' said that worthy, and discovered that Sir Anthony was bowing frigidly. At once he rose, and resting his knuckles on the table before him, bent his body slowly and painfully. Sir Anthony inclined his head, whereupon, to the delight of all the rest, Mr. Fudby bowed again, with even greater stateliness than before. Mr. Hedges observed Sir Anthony's lips to twitch convulsively. He waited for Mr. Fudby to subside, and then continued, "'Yes, Mr. Fudby, and Mr.' "'My clerk,' snapped Fudby. Sir Anthony favoured Mr. Chilter with his peculiarly sweet smile, and turned again to Mr. Hedges. "'I see. A daylight robbery, you say?' "'Broad daylight,' boomed Mr. Fudby. Uh, "'Yes, yes,' interposed the mayor, fearing a fresh outbreak from that quarter. "'I wonder if you have seen anything of such an animal as Mr. Uh, Chilter describes?' "'Tis a most extraordinary thing,' said Carstairs slowly. "'But I have just bought such an one.' He glanced round with an inquiring smile, and one eyebrow lifted. "'Well!' ejaculated Mr. Fubby. "'Well!' "'Dear me, sir, what a strange coincidence! May I ask you where you bought it, and from whom? She has not been in my possession over two hours. I bought her from an out-at-elbows ruffian on my way hither. I thought, at one time, that twas strange that the man should possess such a mare, pure bred, I vow, and I wondered why he was so eager to be rid of her. He was eager, because he knew he would be recognised by her.' "'explained Mr. Fudby kindly. "'Without doubt. "'Perhaps you would like to see her. "'I will send my man.' "'Oh, no, no, no,' cried the mayor. "'We would not dream of so inconveniencing you.' "'Twere a pleasure,' bowed Jack, "'devoutly hoping that Mr. Fudby "'would not require to see Jenny, "'who he felt sure would betray him "'by her very evident affection. "'No, no, Sir Anthony, "'tis quite unnecessary, I assure you.' "'But I thank you for all that. "'Mr. Fudby, if you would describe the man himself, "'I will see to the proclamation.' "'Describe him, Chilter,' ordered Mr. Fudby, "'who was becoming rather grumpy. "'Mr. Chilter smiled suddenly. "'Certainly, sir,' he said with alacrity. "'Twas a great ruffianly fellow, monstrously tall. "'How tall?' interrupted the town clerk. Six feet.' "'Oh, quite,' lied Mr. Chilter. "'And fat!' Jack's shoulders shook. "'Fat, you say?' he asked gently. "'Very fat,' affirmed Mr. Chilter. "'And prodigious rough, swearing dreadfully in his speech. "'You could not see his face, I suppose?' Mr. Chilter hesitated. "'I could see his mouth and chin,' he said. "'And I remarked a long scar running from his underlip to the uh, bottom of his face.' Involuntarily, Carstairs' hand caressed his perfectly smooth chin. Either the little clerk was a born romancer, or for some reason or other he did not want the highwayman to be taken. "'Well, Sir Anthony,' the mayor was saying, "'does that description fit your man?' My lord frowned thoughtfully. "'Tall,' he said slowly, "'and fat.' "'You said fat, I think, Mr. Chilter. 
Rather anxiously, Mr. Chilter reiterated this statement. "'Ah, and with a long scar, yes. That is undoubtedly he. Furthermore,' he added audaciously, "'he has a squint in his left eye. "'Tis a most ill-favoured rogue and all.' "'It would appear so, Sir Anthony,' remarked the mayor dryly. He did not in the least believe the story of the squint, and imagined that the fine court gentleman was amusing himself at their expense. Nevertheless, he had no intention of remonstrating. The sooner he could withdraw from this very tiresome affair, the better. So he gravely took down all the absurd particulars, remarked that the man should be easy to find, and made ready to depart. The town clerk rose and tapped the beetle on the shoulder, whereupon that worthy, with a grunt, abandoned his pose of masterly inactivity, and followed the mare out of the room. Mr. Fudby rose. "'I doubt I shall never see my money again,' he said pettishly. "'If you, Chilter, had not been so—' "'Allow me to offer you some snuff, Mr. Chilter,' interposed my lord gently, extending his jewelled box. "'Doubtless, sir, you would wish to see my mare?' "'I know not of horses.' snorted Mr. Fubby. "'Tis my clerk who appears to have remarked all the details,' he sneered terrifically. "'Then pray, do me the honour of walking as far as the stables, Mr. Chilter. Twere as well to be certain about the mare. Mr. Uh, Fudby, your servant. "'And now, Mr. Chilter, I have a grudge against you,' said Carstairs, as they walked across the little garden. "'Me, sir?' "'Oh, uh, have you, Sir Anthony?' He looked up, and perceived that the gentleman was laughing. "'Yes, Mr. Chilter, a very serious grudge. You have described me as fat.' Chilter nearly fainted. "'You, sir!' he gasped, and stared in amazement. "'Also that I swear dreadfully in my speech, and that I have a scar running from my mouth to my chin.' Mr. Chilter stood stock still in the middle of the path. "'It was you, sir, all the time. You held us up. Were you the man who wrenched open the door? I was that infamous scoundrel. I begged leave once more to apologise for my carelessness in opening that same door. Now tell me, why did you take such pains to throw dust in their sleepy eyes?' They resumed their walk slowly. The little clerk flushed. "'I scarce know, sir, save that I—that I, that I liked you, and—and—' "'I see. "'Twas prodigious good of you, Mr. Chilter. "'I wonder if there is anything that I can do to show my gratitude?' "'Again the clerk flushed, and lifted his head proudly. "'I thank you, sir, but there is not.' "'By now they had reached the stable. "'Carstairs opened the door, and they entered. "'Then will you accept this in token of my regard, sir?' Mr. Chilter gazed at the emerald ring that glowed and winked at him from the palm of my lord's hand. He looked up into the blue eyes, and stammered a little. "'Indeed, sir, I—I—tis honestly come by,' pleadingly. "'Come, Mr. Chilter, you'll not hurt my feelings by refusing. You will keep it in remembrance of a man—a fat man, Mr. Chilter, who rudely jerked you onto the road.' The clerk took it with unsteady fingers. "'I thank you most. Nigh, I beg of you. "'Tis I thank you for aiding me so kindly. "'Come, and see my Jenny. "'Well, lass.' "'For the mare at the first sound of his voice "'had turned in her loose box, "'and was whinnying and pawing the ground eagerly. "'I do not understand, sir, anything. "'How it is that you are a highwayman, "'or why you have honoured me with your confidence. "'Why you should trust me, but thank you.' As he spoke, Mr. Chilter placed his hand in my lord's, and for the second time in his life felt the pressure of those firm, kindly fingers. "'Why, your honour, you've lost your emerald!' "'No, Jim, I gave it away.' "'Ye—ye ye gave it away, sir?' "'Mm-hmm, to the small spider. But—but—' "'And he called me fat, too.' "'Called ye fat, sir?' asked the man, bewildered. "'Yes, very fat. By the way—' "'Let me tell you that I bought Jenny at Fittering to-day "'from the naughty ruffian who waylaid Mr. Bumblebee.' "'He proceeded to give Jim a sketch of what had transpired below. "'When he had finished, the man shook his head severely. 
"'I doubt you'll never learn wisdom, sir,' he scolded. "'I? What have I done? What did you want to tell it all to the Spider-Man for, sir? "'Twas most incautious of ye. Like as not, he'll split to the fat gentleman, and we'll have the whole town at our heels.' "'Which just shows all you know of the small spider,' replied his master calmly. "'Hand me the powder.' End of chapter 2 Recording by Tara Mendoza Phoenix, Arizona, May 2011Chapter 3 of The Black Moth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tara Mendoza. The Black Moth by Georgette Hare. Chapter 3 Introducing the Honorable Richard Carstairs. Wincham, a stately old house with mullioned windows standing high on its stone terraces, half covered by creepers. A house surrounded by lawns, rolling down on the one side to a river that rippled and murmured its way along beneath overhanging trees and a blue sky, over boulders and rocks so clear and sparkling that the myriad pebbles could be seen deep down on its bed. In the other direction, the velvet lawns stretched away till they met the orchards and the quiet meadowland. On two sides the house had its terraces, very white in the sunshine, with stone steps leading down to a miniature lake, where water-lilies grew, and where the tiny fish darted to and fro unconcernedly. Flagged walks there were, running between flower-beds a riot of color, and solemn old trees that had stood there through all the years. Cool woodland lay beyond the little river, carpeted with dark moss, where in spring the primroses grew. So thick was the foliage of the trees that the sun but penetrated in uneven patches. Up the terrace walls crept roses, yellow and red, pink and white, and tossed their trailing sprays across the parapet. Over the walls of the house they climbed, mingling with purple clematis, jasmine, and sickly honeysuckle. The air was heavy with their united perfumes, while wafted from a bed below came the smoky scent of lavender. The old house seemed half asleep, basking in the sunlight. Save for a peacock preening its feathers on the terrace steps, there was no sign of life. The old place had harbored generations of car stairs. Earl had succeeded Earl and reigned supreme, and it was only now that there was no Earl living there. No one knew where he was. Scarce a month ago one died, but the eldest son was not there to take his place. For six years he had been absent, and none dared breathe his name, for he disgraced that name, and the old earl cast him off and forbid all mention of him. But the poor folk of the countryside remembered him. They would tell one another tales of his reckless courage, his sweet smile and his winning ways, his light-heartedness and his never-failing kindness and good humor. What a rider he was! to see him sit a horse. What a swordsman! Do you mind the time he fought young Mr. Welsh over yonder in the spinney with half the countryside watching? Ah, he was a one, was Master Jack. Do you mind how he knocked the sword clean out of Mr. Welsh's hand and then stood waiting for him to pick it up? And do you mind the way his eyes sparkled and how he laughed just for the sheer joy of living? Endless anecdotes would they tell, and the old gaffers would shake their heads and sigh, and long for the sight of him again, and they would jerk their thumbs towards the manor, and shrug their old shoulders significantly. Who wanted Mr. Richard for squire? Not they, at least. They knew he was a good squire, and a kindly man, but give them Master John, who would laugh and crack a joke, and never wear the glum looks that Mr. Richard affected. In the house, Richard Carstairs paced to and fro in his library, every now and again pausing to glance wretchedly up at the portrait of his brother hanging over his desk. The artist had managed to catch the expression of those blue eyes, and they smiled down at Richard in just the way that John was always wont to smile, so gaily, and withal so wistfully. Richard was twenty-nine, but already he looked twice his age. He was very thin, and there were deep lines on his good-looking countenance. His gray eyes bore a haunted, careworn look, 
and his mouth, though well-shaped, was curiously lacking in determination. He was dressed soberly, and without that touch of smartness that had characterized him six years ago. He wore black in memory of his father, and it may have been that severity, only relieved by the lace at his throat, that made his face appear so prematurely aged. There was none of his brother's boyishness about him. Even his smile seemed forced and tired, and his laughter rarely held merriment. He pulled out his chronometer, comparing it with the clock on the mantelpiece. His pacing took him to the door, and almost nervously he pulled it open, listening. No sound came to his ears. Back again, to and fro, across the room, eagerly awaiting the clanging of a bell. It did not come. But presently a footfall sounded on the passage without, and some one knocked at the door. In two strides Richard was by it, and had flung it wide. Warburton stood there. Richard caught his hand. "'Warburton, at last! I've been waiting this hour and more!' Mr. Warburton disengaged himself, bowing. "'I regret I was not able to come before, sir,' he said primly. "'I make no doubt you travelled back as quickly as possible. Come in, sir.' He led the lawyer into the room and shut the door. "'Sit down, Warburton, sit down. You—you you found my brother?' Again Warburton bowed. "'I had the felicity of seeing his lordship, sir.' "'He was well, in good spirits. You thought him changed, yes? Aged, perhaps, or—' "'His lordship was not greatly changed, sir.' Richard almost stamped in his impatience. "'Come, Warburton, come. Tell me everything. What did he say?' Will he take the revenues? Will he—' His lordship, sir, was reluctant to take anything, but upon maturer consideration, he, uh, consented to accept his elder son's portion. The revenues of the estate he begs you will make use of. Ah, but you told him that I would touch not belonging to him? I tried to persuade his lordship, sir, to no avail. He desires you to use Wencham as you will. I'll not touch his money.' Warburton gave the faintest of shrugs. "'That is as you please, sir.' Something in the suave voice made Richard, from his stand by the desk, glance sharply down at the lawyer. Suspicion flashed in his eyes. He seemed about to speak when Warburton continued. "'I believe I may set your mind at rest on one school, Mr. Carstairs. His lordship's situation is tolerably comfortable. He has ample means.' "'But—but but he lives by—' Robbery! Warburton's thin lips curled a little. Does he not? persisted Carstairs. So he would have us believe, sir. Tis true. He waylaid me. And robbed you, sir? Robbed me? He could not rob his own brother, Warburton. Your pardon, Mr. Carstairs. You are right. His lordship could not rob a brother. Yet have I known a man do such a thing. For a long minute, there was no word spoken. The suspicion that had dwelt latent in Carstairs' eyes sprang up again. Some of the colour drained from his cheeks, and twice he passed his tongue between his lips. The fingers of his hand, gripping a chair-back, opened and shut spasmodically. Rather feverishly, his eyes searched the lawyer's face, questioning. "'John told you. Told you.' He started and floundered hopelessly. "'His lordship told me nothing, sir.' He was singularly reticent, but there was nothing he could tell me that I did not already know. "'What do you mean, Warburton? Why do you look at me like that? Why do you fence with me? In plain words, what do you mean?' Warburton rose, clenching his fists. "'I know you, Master Richard, for what you are.' "'Ah!' Carstairs flung out his hand as if to ward off a blow. Another tense silence. With a great effort Warburton controlled himself and once more the mask of impassivity seemed to descend upon him. After that one tortured cry, Richard became calm again. He sat down, on his face a look almost of relief, coming after a great strain. "'You learnt the truth, from John. He will expose me?' "'No, sir. I have not learnt it from him, and he will never expose you.' Richard turned his head. His eyes filled now with a species of dull pain, looked full into Warburton's. "'Oh?' he said. "'Then you—' "'Nor I, sir. 
I have pledged my word to his lordship I would not speak all these years for your father's sake. Now it is for his. He choked. You are fond of John. Still the apathetic, weary voice. Fond of him? Good God, Master Dick, I love him. And I, said Richard very low. He received no reply, and looked up. You don't believe me. Once, sir, I was certain of it. Now— he shrugged. Yes, tis true, Warburton. I would give all in my power to undo that night's work. You cannot expect me to believe that, sir. It rests with you alone whether his name be cleared or not, and you remain silent. Warburton, I—oh, do you think it means nothing to me that John is outcast? Before the misery in those grey eyes, some of Warburton's severity fell away from him. Master Richard— I want to think the best I can of you. Master Jack would tell me nothing. Will you not? Can you not explain how it came that you allowed him to bear the blame of your cheat? Richard shuddered. There's no explanation, no excuse. I forced it on him, on Jack, my brother, because I was mad for love of Lavinia. Oh, my God, the thought of it is driving me crazed. I thought I could forget, and then, and then I meant him. The sight of him brought it all back to me. Ever since that day I've not known how to live and not shriek the truth to every one. And I never shall. I never shall. Tell me, sir, pleaded Warburton, touched in spite of himself. Richard's head sunk into his hands. The whole scene, it is a nightmare. I think I must have been mad. I scarce knew what I was about. I— Gently, sir. Remember, I know hardly anything. What induced you to mark the cards? That debt to Gundry. My father would not meet it. I had to find the money. I could not face the scandal. I tell you I was mad for Lavinia. I could think of naught else. I ceased to care for John because I thought him in love with her. I could not bear to think of the disgrace which would take her from me. Then that night at Dares I was losing— I knew I could not pay, gad, but I could see my notes of hand under Millwood's elbow growing, growing. Jack had played Millwood before me, and he had won. I remember they laughed at him, saying his luck had turned at last, for he always lost at cards. Millwood and I played with the same pack that they had used. There was another table, I think. Dare was dicing with Fitzgerald. Someone was playing faro with Jack behind me. I heard Jack say his luck was out again. I heard them laugh, and all the time I was losing. Losing. The pin of my cravat fell out on my knee. I think no one saw it. As they picked it up, the thought that I should mark the cards seemed to flash into my mind. Oh, it was despicable, I know. I held the ace of clubs in my hand. I scratched it with that pin in one corner. It was easily done. By degrees I marked all four, and three of the kings. No one noticed, but I was nervous. I dared to do no more. I replaced that pin. Soon I began to win, not very much. Then Tracy Belmanwar came across the room to watch our play. From that moment everything seemed to go awry. It was the beginning of the trouble. Tracy stood behind me watching. I could feel him there like some black moth, hovering. I don't know how long he stayed like that. It seemed hours. I could feel his eyes. I could have shrieked. I swear my hands were trembling. Suddenly he moved. I had played the ace of hearts. He said, One moment. In that soft, sinister voice of his, Millwood was surprised. I tried to tell myself that Devil had noticed nothing. The mark on that card was so faint that I could scarce see it myself. I thought it impossible that he, a mere onlooker, should discover it. He stepped forward. I remember he brushed my shoulder. I remember how light caught the diamonds he was wearing. I think my brain was numbed. I could only repeat to myself, Extravagant devil! Extravagant devil! And stare at those winking jewels. Then I thought— he is Lavinia's brother. But I do not like him. I do not like him. Little foolish things like that. And my throat was dry, parched. 
He bent over the table, stretched out his white, white hand, turned over the ace, lifted his quizzing glass, and stared down at the card. Then he dropped the glass and drew out his snuff-box. It had Aphrodite enameled on the lid. I remember it so distinctly. I heard Tracy ask Millward to examine the ace. I wanted to spring up and strangle him. I could scarce keep my hand still. Richard paused. He drew his hand across his eyes, shuddering. Millward saw the scratch. He cried out that the cards were mocked. Suddenly everyone seemed to be gathered about our table, all talking. Jack had his hand on my shoulder. He and Dare were running through the pack. But all the while I could look at no one but Tracy Andover. He seemed so sinister, so threatening in those black clothes of his. His eyes were almost shut, his face so white, and he was looking at me. He seemed to be reading my very soul. For an instant I thought he knew. I wanted to shout out that he was wrong. I wanted to shriek to him to take his eyes away. Heaven knows what I should have done, but he looked away at Jack, with that sneering smile on his damned mask of a face. I could have killed him for that smile. I think Jack understood it. He dropped the cards, staring at Tracy. Everyone was watching them. No one looked at me. If they had, they must surely have learnt the truth. But they were hanging on Andover's lips, looking from him to Jack and back again. I remember Fitzgerald dropped his handkerchief. I was absurdly interested in that. I was wondering why he did not pick it up, when Andover spoke again. And Carstairs' luck turned. Like that, Warburton, with just that faint questioning in his voice. Before Jack could speak, there was an outcry. Dare cried, Shame! to Andover. They laughed at him as well they might. But I saw them exchanging glances. They were wondering. It was suspicious that Jack should have had that run of luck, and that he should lose as soon as he left that table. Millward, poor silly Millward, gaped at Tracy and stuttered that surely t'was another pack we had used. I could hardly breathe. Then Andover corrected him. How did he know? No one else remembered, or thought of noticing. Only he. I can see Jack now, standing there so stiffly with his head thrown up, and those blue eyes of his flashing. Do I understand you to accuse me, Belmanmoir? he said. Oh, but he was furious. Tracy never said a word. Only his eyes just flickered to my face and away again. Jack's hand was gripping my shoulder hard. I could feel his anger. Dare called out that the suggestion was preposterous, that John should cheat. Tracy asked him if the cards were his. Gad, I can hear his soft, mocking voice now. Dare went purple. You know his way, Warburton. Opened in your presence on this table, he cried. By Carstairs, smiled Tracy. It was true. But why should Tracy remember it, and none other? They stared at him, amazed. Dare turned to Jack for cooperation. He nodded. I think he never looked haughtier. You know how fond of Jack Dare was. He tried to bluster it off, tried to get control over the affair. It was to no avail. We were puppets, worked by that devil Belmanoir. One man managing that ghastly scene. He pointed out that only three of us had used that pack. Jack, Millward, and I. Jack laughed. Next you will accuse Dick, he snapped scornfully. One of you certainly, smiled Andover. Or Millward. Then everyone realized that one of us three must have marked the cards. Millward was upset, but no one suspected him. It was Jack or me. As long as I live, I shall never forget the horror of those moments. If I were exposed, it meant the end of everything between Lavinia and I. I tell you, Warburton, I would have committed any sin at that moment. Nothing would have been too black. I could not bear to lose her. You don't know what she meant to me. I can guess, sir, 
said the lawyer gravely. No, no, no one could imagine the depths of my love for her. I think not even Jack. I felt his hand leave my shoulder. The truth had dawned on him. I heard the way the breath hissed between his teeth as he realized. Somehow I got to my feet, clutching at the table, facing him. I don't excuse myself. I know my conduct was beyond words dastardly. I looked across at him, just said his name, as though I could scarce believe my ears. So all those watching thought. But Jack knew better. He knew I was imploring him to save me. He understood all that I was trying to convey to him. For an instant he stared at me. I thought, I thought, God forgive me. I prayed that he might take the blame on himself. Then he smiled. Coward though I was, when I saw that hurt, wistful little smile on his lips, I nearly blurted out the whole truth. Not quite. I suppose I was too mean-spirited for that. Jack bowed to the room, and again to Dare. He said, I owe you an apology, sir. Dare sprang forward, catching him by the shoulder, crying out that it could not be true. When Jack laughed, he fell away from him as from a, the plague, and all of them. My God, to see them drawing away, not looking at Jack, and Jack's face growing paler and harder every moment, all his friends turning their backs to him. Davenant, even Jim Davenant, walked away to the fireplace with Evans. I could not look at Jack. I dared not. I could not go to him, stand by him. I had not the right. I had to leave him there, in the middle of the room, alone. The awful hurt in his eyes made me writhe. The room was whirling round. I felt sick. I know I fell back into my chair, hiding my face. I hardly cared whether they suspected me or not, but they did not. They knew how great was the love between us, and they were not surprised that I broke down. I heard Andover's soft voice. He was telling some tale to dare. Oh, they were well-bred, those men. They skimmed over the unpleasant little episode, ignored Jack. Jack spoke again. I could guess how bravely he was keeping a proud front. I know word for word what he said. Mr. Dare, your grace, gentlemen, my apologies for being the cause of so unpleasant an incident. Pray give me leave. They paid no heed. I heard him walk to the door, heard him open it. I could not look at him. He, he paused, and said just one word. Dick, quite softly. Heaven knows how I got to him. I know I overturned my chair. That drew Dare's attention. He said, you are not going, Dick. I shouted, yes, at him. And then Jack took my arm, leading me out, and all. All he said was, poor old Dick. He, he had no word of blame for me. He would not allow me to go back and tell the truth as I would have done. I, Warburton, when Jack called me to him, I could have cried it aloud. But he would not have it. He said, for Lavinia's sake. Warburton blew his nose violently. His fingers were trembling. You know what happened afterwards. You know how my father turned Jack out penniless. You know how his friends shunned him. You know my poor mother's grief, and you know that he went away. That we could not find him when my mother died. His last words to me were, Make Lavinia happy, and try to forget all this. Forget it. Heavens try as I might. I could hear nothing further of him until two months ago, when he waylaid me. Then I was half dazed at the suddenness of it. He, he grasped my hand and laughed. It was so dark I could scarce see him. I only had time to demand his address, and then he was off, galloping away over the heath. I think he, even then he bore no malice. He does not now, said Warburton sharply. But, Master Dick, if all this is true, why do you not even now clear him? Surely. Richard turned his head slowly. Now I may not drag my wife's name through the mud. 
By clearing him, I ruin her. Warburton could find nothing to say. Only after some time did he clear his throat and say that he was honoured by Carstairs' confidence. You are... You dwell on the part played by his grace on that evening. Surely your, shall we say, overwrought imagination magnified it? Richard was disinterested. I suppose so. Maybe twas his extraordinary personality dominating me. He cannot have pulled the wires as I thought he did. Not even Bellman War could make me act as I did. But, but at the time, I felt that he was pushing pushing, compelling me to accuse Jack. Oh, doubtless I was mad. Warburton eyed the dejected figure compassionately. Then he seemed to harden himself and to regain some of his lost primness of manner. You are... You are determined not to accept the revenue, sir. I have not yet sunk so low, Mr. Warburton. His lordship leaves Wincham and all appertaining to it at your disposal. He would be grieved at your refusal. I will not touch it. The lawyer nodded. I confess, Mr. Carstairs, I am relieved to hear you say that. It will not be necessary again to communicate with his lordship. I think he does not desire any intercourse with his family. He finds it too painful. But he wished to be remembered to you, sir, also to her ladyship. Thank you. You could ascertain nothing of his situation. He did not confide in you. He was very reticent, sir. I think he is not unhappy. And not embittered. Certainly not that, sir. Mr. Warburton rose, plainly anxious to be gone. Reluctantly, Richard followed his example. You have nothing further to tell me of him? I regret, sir. Nothing. Richard went slowly to the door and opened it. "'You must allow me to thank you, sir, for your goodness in undertaking what I know must have been a painful task. I am very grateful.' Mr. Warburton bowed low. "'I beg you will not mention it, sir. Nothing I might do for the Carstairs could be aught but a pleasure.' Again he bowed, and the next instant was gone. End of chapter 3 Recording by Tara Mendoza, Phoenix, Arizona, July 2011. Chapter 4 of The Black Moth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tara Mendoza, The Black Moth. By Georgette Hare. Chapter 4 Introducing the Lady Lavinia Carstairs. Richard went slowly back to his chair. After a moment he sat down, staring blankly out of the window, his hands loosely clasped on the desk before him. So he remained for a long while immobile. At last, with the faintest of sighs, he moved and picked up a quill. He dipped it in the ink, and with his other hand, drew towards him a sheaf of papers. Presently he was writing steadily. For perhaps twenty minutes the quill travelled to and fro across the pages. Then it paused, and Richard looked up towards the door. It opened to admit Lady Lavinia. She came rustling into the room with her embroidery in her hand. She dropped her husband a mock curtsy, and went over to a high-backed armchair, stretching out a dimpled hand to draw it forward. But, even as her fingers touched it, she had changed her mind, and fluttered over to the couch, there to seat herself with much swirling of brocades and arrangement of skirts. She then proceeded to occupy herself with her work, plying her needle hurriedly and jerkily. Richard watched her in silence, following each turn of the pretty hand and each movement of her fair head. The silence was evidently not to my lady's taste, for she presently began to beat an impatient tattoo on the floor with one slender foot. Still he said nothing, and she raised her pure china-blue eyes to his face. "'Why so glum, Dick? Why do you not talk to me?' Her voice was rather high-pitched and childish. 
and she had a curious way of ending each sentence with an upward lilt and a long, drawn-out accent, very fascinating to listen to. Richard smiled with an obvious effort. "'Am I, dear? I crave your pardon. Warburton has just been.' Her face clouded over instantly, and the full-lipped mouth drooped petulantly. "'He has seen him.' "'Oh!' She made the word twice its length and filled it with disinterest. "'Yes. Jack will have none of it. He asks me to be his steward, and to use Wincham as I will. He is very generous.' "'Yes. Oh, yes, Richard. And you will, Richard?' He ignored the question. "'He, Warburton, says he's not much changed.' "'Oh?' again the long-drawn monosyllable accompanied by a tiny yawn. "'He says he does not think Jack bears me ill-will.' He paused, as if expecting her to speak, but she was absorbed in arranging two flowers, culled from a bowl at her side, at her breast, and took no notice. Carstairs turned his head away wearily. "'If it were not for you, my dear, I would tell the truth. I believe I shall go crazed, and I do not.' "'Dick!' She dropped the flowers on the floor, and thought no more about them. Dick! Oh, you need have no fear. I do not suppose, bitterly, that I have the courage to face them all now, after six years. Lavinia moved restlessly, brushing her hand along the couch. You will not do it, Richard. Promise. You will not. I could not bear the disgrace of it. "'Promise me you will never do it.' "'No,' he said slowly, not looking at her. "'No, I cannot promise that.' She sprang to her feet, flinging her embroidery from her carelessly, and waved fierce, agitated little hands. "'That means you will do it. You want to disgrace me. You do not care how you hurt me by holding this threat over my head so cruelly. You—' "'Lavinia, for heaven's sake!' he implored, pushing back his chair. "'Calm yourself.' He knew she was about to fly into one of her sudden passions, and frowned with acute vexation. "'I will not.' "'Oh, yes, yes. You think me a shrew. I know. I know. But you need not frown on me, sir, for you are worse. No, I will not. Hush. I am a horrid woman, yes.' "'But you are a cheat. A cheat. A cheat!' Carstairs strode over to her. "'Lavinia!' "'No! No! Leave me alone! You make me miserable. You refuse me everything that I want most, and then you threaten to disgrace me.' "'That is untrue,' cried Richard, goaded into replying. "'I will not promise, that is all. What have I refused you?' that was within my means to give you. God knows you try your best to ruin me. There, there, tis I who am to blame. Pray, did you not induce my lord to leave his money to John when you knew he would have willed it all to you, and you had kept silent? You took no thought to me. For heaven's sake, Lavinia, be still. You do not know what you are saying. She pressed her hands to her hot cheeks. No. I am unreasonable. I know it. But don't tell me so, for I cannot bear it. And don't look reproach at me, Richard. You drive me mad, I tell you. She was sweeping up and down the room like some caged animal, lashing herself to a worse fury. Say something, Richard. Do something. Don't stand there so quietly. Oh, you should have never married me. I displease you. And you make me worse, and you do not see how tis that I cannot live without pleasure and money. I am despicable. Yes, yes, but what are you? Oh, why did you tell me you cheated after you had wedded me? Angry sobs escaped her. Her handkerchief was in shreds upon the floor. Carstairs turned his back to her, that she might not see how she had contrived to hurt him, and the moment drove her to fresh fury. Don't do that! Don't! Don't! You make me worse by your dreadful silence. Oh, if you really loved me! You cannot doubt that, he cried, wheeling suddenly round. 
"'You know how I love you, don't you?' He gripped her by the shoulders and swung her to face him. She trembled and gave a sobbing little laugh. As suddenly as it had come, her anger left her. <laughs> "'Oh, yes, yes, you do love me, Dicky. She twined her arms about his neck and shrank closer. "'God help me, yes!' he groaned, thrusting her away. "'And you, you care for no one save yourself.' "'No, no!' she cried, pressing up to him again. "'Do not say that, Dick. Indeed, I love you, but I cannot live without gaiety. You know I cannot. Oh, I do not doubt but what I am very selfish. But tis the way I am fashioned, and I cannot change my nature. And now I have hurt you, and I did not mean to. I did not mean to. My dear, I know you did not. But try to be less a child, I beg of you. You are so uncontrolled, so— I knew you would say that she answered in a dead voice. "'You do not understand me. You expect me to be good, and patient, and forbearing. And I tell you, tis not in my nature.' "'But, Lavinia, you can control your passions,' he said gently. "'No, I cannot. We, Bellman was as God made us, so we are. And he made us spendthrift and pleasure-loving and mad.' She walked slowly to the door. But you do not understand, and you try to make me staid and thoughtful and a good mother, when I am dying for life and excitement, and care not that for housewifery. She opened the door slowly. And now my head aches, and you look grave and say tis my wicked temper, when I want you to be sorry and to be ready to do anything to comfort me. Why can you not take me to London? when you know how I long to be there, instead of this gloomy house with naught to do, save my child and my needle. I am so tired of it all, so very tired of it all. She would have left the room then, but he detained her. Wait, Lavinia, you say you are unhappy. She released the door handle and fluttered her hands expressively. Unhappy? No, I am dull, I am ill-tempered. I am discontented. I am all you please, so do not be sad, Richard. I cannot bear you to be solemn. Oh, why do we quarrel? With one of her impulsive movements, she was again at his side, with her beautiful face upturned. Love me, Richard. Take me to London and never mind, and I do squander your money. Say you do not care. Say that nothing matters so long as I am happy. Why do you not say it? Does anything matter? Don't be prudent, Dicky. Be wild. Be reckless. Be anything rather than grave and old. Her arms crept up to his coaxingly. Take me to London. Carstairs smoothed the soft hair back from her forehead, very tenderly. But his eyes were worried. My dear, I will take you. But not just yet. There is so much to be done here. If you will wait a little longer... Ah, oh, if I will wait, if I will be patient and good, but I cannot. Oh, you don't understand, Dicky. you don't understand. I am sorry, dear. I promise I will take you as soon as possible, and you will stay as long as you please. Her arms fell away. I want to go now. Dear. Very well, very well. We will go presently. Only don't reason with me. He looked at her concernedly. You are overwrought, my love, and tired. Yes, she agreed listlessly. Oh, yes. I will go now and rest. Forgive me, Dick. She kissed her fingertips and extended them to him. I will be good one day. She turned and hurried out of the room and up the stairs, leaving the door open behind her. Richard stayed for a moment, looking round at the signs of her late presence. Mechanically, he stooped to pick up her embroidery and the piece of her handkerchief. The two flowers were broken off short, and he threw them away. Then he left the room, and went out onto the sunny terrace, gazing across the beautiful gardens into the blue distance. 
Across the lawn came a child of four or five, waving a grimy hand. Father! Richard looked down at him and smiled. Well, John. The boy climbed up the terrace steps, calling his news all the way. "'Tis Uncle Andrew, sir. He has rid over to see you, and is coming through the garden to find you. Is he? Has he left his horse at the stables? Aye, sir. So I came to tell you. Quite right. Will you come with me to meet him? The little rosy face lighted up with pleasure. Oh, may I? He cried and slipped his hand into Richard's. Together they descended the steps and made their way across the lawn. "'I have run away from Betty,' announced John with some pride. "'There's Uncle Andrew, sir.' He bounded away, towards the approaching figure. Lord Andrew Belmanoir was Richard's brother-in-law, brother to the present Duke. He came up with John in his arms and tumbled him to the ground. "'Good day, Dick. Tis a spoilt child you have here.' "'Aye. He is but now escaped from his nurse.' "'Splendid! Come, John, you shall walk with us, and we'll confound fat Betty.' He slipped his arm through Richard's as he spoke. "'Come, Dick, there's a deal I have to say to you.' He grimaced ruefully. The child ran on ahead towards the wood, a great bull's mastiff at his heels. "'What's to do now?' asked Richard, looking round into the mobile, dissipated countenance. "'The devil's in it this time, and no mistake.' answered his lordship with a rueful shake of his head. Deaths? Lord, yes. I was at Delaby's last night, and the stakes were high, although I've lost about three thousand counting what I owe Carew, and devil take me and I know where's to come from. His Tracy turns saint and swears he'll see me damned before he hands me another penny. I doubt he means it, too. Tracy was the duke. Richard smiled a little cynically. He had already had to lend his grace a thousand guineas to pay off some trifling debt. "'He means it right enough. I believe it would puzzle him to find it.' "'Do you say so? Why, tis impossible, man. Tracy was in town scarce a fortnight since, and he had a run of the devil's own luck. I tell you, Dick, I saw him walk off with a cool five thousand one night, and then he denies me a paltry three. Lord, what a brother! And all with the air of an angel, as if he had never lost at dice.' and a homily thrown in. Any one would think I had cheated instead of— Ahem. <clears throat> Dick, I'm confoundedly sorry. Damn thoughtless of me. Never thought that— About jo— About what I was saying. I'm a fool. For Richard had winced. You cannot help that, he said, forcing a laugh. Have done with your apologies and continue. They had come to the stream by now, and crossed the little bridge into the wood. Oh, there's not much more. "'Tis only that something must be done, for Carew won't wait, and stop me if I'd ask him, the lean-faced scarecrow. So I came to you, Dick. He let go Richard's arm and flung himself down on a fallen tree trunk, regardless of velvet and laces. "'You're a good fellow, and you don't lecture a man as Tracy does. Devil take him. And you play high yourself, or you did, though tis an age since I saw you win or lose enough to wink at. And after all, you're Lavy's husband, and— "'Oh, damn it, old Dick, tis monstrous hard to ask you.' Carstairs, leaning against a tree, surveyed the youthful rake amusedly. "'Tosh, Andrew,' he reassured him. "'You're welcome to ask. But the Lord knows where I'm to find it. God, what a life! Here's Lavinia keeps buying silks, and I don't know what all, and—' "'She was ever a spendthrift jade,' said Andrew with a mighty frown. Richard laughed at him. "'You're a thrifty fellow yourself, of course.' Andrew looked round for something to throw at him, and finding nothing, relapsed once more, into deepest despondency. "'You're in the right of it. We're a worthless lot. Tis the old man's blood in us, I doubt not, with a smattering of her grace. You never knew my mother, did you, Richard? She was French. Lavy's the spit of her. This Tracy stabbed me. But Tracy's the very devil. Have you ever seen a face like his?' "'No, I'll swear you've not. "'What with his sneering mouth and his green eyes, "'oh, tis enough to make a fellow go to the dogs "'to have a brother like it. "'Pone my soul it is. "'Ay, you can laugh, but I tell you, tis serious. "'Ay, go on. "'Well, next there's Bob. "'Damn it all, but I'm sorry for Bob. "'Tis a beggarly pittance they give one in the army, "'and he was never one to pension scrape. "'Well, as I say, there's Bob, and I never see him. "'But what's it?' 
though what it's lend me a hundred andy or the like and all to buy his mistress some gewgaw that's what sickens me why bob's forever in some scrape with a petticoat and as for tracy gad how they can then there's lavinia but i should think you know her by now and lastly there's your humble servant and i tell you dick what with the racing and the cards and the bottle i shall be a ruined man before you can turn around and the parlour is i'll never be any different tis in the blood so where's the use in trying he made a rueful grimace and rose come on young rip we're going back john engaged in the task of hunting for tadpoles in the water some yards distant nodded and ran on i fear my lady is indisposed said richard hesitantly you wish to see her andrew winked knowingly dantrums eh oh no i know her no i do not care and i do not see her tis little enough she cares for me though she's as thick as thieves with tracy oh i i'll be done they walked slowly back to the house andrew silent for once twirling his gold-mounted cane you shall have the money of course when do you want it said richard presently pone honour you're a devilish good fellow dick but if tis like to put you at any nonsense when do you need it i should pay carew as soon as may be markham can wait over if no no wednesday twill do excellently well dick you're a oh pshaw tis not i want your opinion on a bay mare i bought last week you'll maybe think her a trifle long in the leg but she's a fine animal john had run indoors and the two men proceeded to the stables alone andrew discouraging all the way recounting for his brother-in-law's benefit the choice morsels of scandal that were circulating town at the moment that his auditor but attended with half an ear affected him not at all he never paused for an answer and in any case was far too good-natured to care if he received none by the time they had duly inspected the mare and walked back to the house it was nearly four o'clock and not altogether to carstairs surprise lavinia was awaiting them on the terrace clad in a totally different gown and with her hair freshly arranged and curled twould appear that lavinia has recovered remarked andrew as they mounted the steps she was ever thus not two minutes the same well lavvy well andrew she gave him a careless hand to kiss but smiled sweetly up at her husband my headache is much better she told him and they said that andrew was come to see you so i came downstairs she turned eagerly to her brother tell me andrew is tracy at home lord yes he arrived yesterday devil take him do you want him oh yes she nodded i want to see him again i've not set eyes on him for an age i want you to take me back with you surely my dear tis a trifle late in the day for such a drive demurred richard trying to conceal his annoyance can you not wait until to-morrow faith you'll have to lavvy for i'll not take you to-day that's certain i'm riding to fletcher's when i leave here tracy can visit you to-morrow when he chooses will he she asked doubtfully andrew clapped his hand to his vest pocket if i had not forgot he exclaimed i've a letter from him for you he intends waiting on you to-morrow in any case lord what it is to have a scatterbrain like mine he pulled a handful of papers from his pocket and selected one sealed and addressed in a sloping italian handwriting lavinia pounced upon it joyfully and tore it open andrew restored the rest of the documents to his pocket with yet another rueful laugh duns richard duns give them to me answered the other holding out his hand oh no but many thanks dick these are quite unimportant why not pay them all and start afresh urged carstairs lord no why i should be so damned elated that before the day was out there'd be a score of fresh debts staring me in the face let me lend you a thousand to begin on could you not keep out of debt i keep out of debt impossible don't look so solemn dick i told you twas in the blood we never have a penny to bless ourselves with but what's the odds i shall have a run of luck soon a man can't always lose then i shall be able to pay you but of course i shan't it'll all go at the next table i know he spoke so ingenuously that richard could not be angry with him 
There was a certain frankness about him that pleased, and though he might be spendthrift and heedless, and colossally selfish, Richard felt a genuine affection for him. He would have liked to argue the point further, but Lavinia came forward, refolding her letter. "'Tracy is coming to-morrow afternoon,' she told her husband. "'Twill be prodigiously agreeable, will it not?' He assented, but with a lack of warmth that did not fail to strike her ears. "'And he will stay to dine with us?' she cried challengingly. "'Certainly, my love.' "'Look pleased, Dicky. Look pleased. Why don't you like Tracy? He is my brother. You must like him.' "'Of course I like him, Lavinia. Pray, do not be foolish.' "'No, I am not. Don't be cross, Dicky, dear.' "'Well, if you like him, I'm surprised,' broke in Andrew. "'I can't bear him. I flash your eyes at me, Lavvy. I don't mind.' Lavinia opened her mouth to retaliate, but Richard hastily interposed. Their bickering was more than he could bear, and he never understood how Lavinia could stoop to quarrel with the boisterous youth who tried so palpably to rouse her. He bore them back off to the house, feeling much like a nursemaid, with two recalcitrant children. End of chapter 4 Recording by Tara Mendoza Phoenix, Arizona, July 2011「Five of the Black Moth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tara Mendoza. The Black Moth by Georgette Hare. Chapter 5. His Grace of Andover. Lady Lavinia dressed herself with even more than her usual care next afternoon and well-nigh drove her maid distracted by her flashes of temper and impatient, contradictory orders. So lengthy was the toilette that she was only just in her boudoir when His Grace of Andover was announced. She had no time to tell the footman that she would receive His Grace, for almost before the words were out of James's mouth he stood bowing in the doorway, sure of his welcome. He was curiously like his sister, this man, and at the same time curiously unlike— Hers were the high cheekbones and pinched aristocratic nostrils, but the mouth with its thin lips and the heavy-lidded green eyes were totally different. His grace's brows slanted up at the corners, and his eyes, though piercing and bright, were constantly veiled by the black-lashed lids. He wore his own black hair unpowdered, and that, together with the black and silver garments that he always affected, greatly enhanced the natural pallor of his countenance. Altogether it was a very striking figure that stood just before the closed white door and bowed to my lady. Lavinia took an eager step towards him, swinging her pearl-gray brocades. "'Oh, Tracy!' she cooed, holding out both hands. His grace advanced into the room and bent low over them. "'I rejoice to find you within, Lavinia,' he said, a faint tinge of sarcasm running through his smooth tones. "'As you perceive, I rode over.' He made a gesture towards his high boots with their wicked-looking spurs. "'No doubt Andrew forgot to give you my letter?' "'No,' she said, slipping her hand in his arm. "'He remembered in time. And, oh, Tracy, I was so vastly delighted to have it.' "'I am indeed honoured,' he replied. "'I am come on a sufficiently important matter.' "'Oh?' She pulled her hand away disappointedly. "'Money?' "'You are really wonderful, my dear, as you so crudely remark. Money. Will you not be seated?' She sank down on the couch dejectedly, and watched him take a chair opposite her. "'Your most noble lord and master, let me a trifling sum the other day, but very trifling. I am, as usual, hard-pressed, and that young fool Andrew must needs fall into debt.' Milady opened wide her eyes in surprise. "'Do you tell me you need money from Richard to pay Andrew's debts?' she asked frankly, incredulous. "'I do not. Is it likely?' The remark was purely by the way. "'Well, in any case, Andrew borrowed three thousand from Paul Dick only yesterday. I know, because I heard him speak of it.' His grace raised his black brows in patient exasperation. "'How unnecessary of Andrew, and how typical!' "'So poor Dick has been squeezed already?' 
"'Don't speak like that, Tracy,' she cried. "'Dicky is good to me.' She meant his piercing look unflinchingly. "'Now this becomes interesting,' drawled the Duke. "'Since when have you come to that conclusion? And why this sudden loyalty?' "'I have always been loyal to him, Tracy. You know I have. I worry him, and indeed he is very forbearing.' "'But how charming of him!' "'No, do not sneer, Tracy. He has promised to take me to London for the whole winter.' His grace leant back in his chair again. "'Now I understand,' he said placidly. "'I was at a loss before.' "'Tis not that, Tracy. Indeed I realize how kind he is to me. And we have quarrelled again. We are always quarrelling, and I know it is all my fault.' "'What a comfortable conviction, my dear.' "'No, no, tis not comfortable, Tracy, for somehow I cannot change my disposition, though I mean to be patient and sweet. Tracy, I hate Wincham.' "'You hate Wincham? There was a time—' "'I know, I know. But I never meant to live here always like this. I want to go to London.' "'I thought you said you were going.' "'Yes, I am.' "'But I want to go with someone who is gay, not—not—' "'In fact, you want distraction, and not with the amiable Richard. "'Well, I can conceive that life with him might prove uninspiring. "'Safe, my dear, but not exciting.' "'I knew you would understand. "'You see, he does not like me to play at cards, because I cannot stop, "'and he cannot see how it is that I care not for what he calls home life.' when there are routs in the play in real life, he, he is so, so, so staid, Tracy, and careful. A good trait in a husband, Lavinia, replied his grace cynically. Tis because I do not possess it that I am single now. His lips curled scornfully at this, for well she knew her brother. No, Tracy, that is not so. It is because you are the devil. "'No woman would marry you.' "'That is most interesting, my dear,' purred his grace. "'But pray, strive to be a little more original. "'Continue your analysis of Richard's sterling character.' "'Tis only that we are so different.' "'She sighed. "'I always desire to do things quickly. "'If I think of something, I want it at once. "'At once, you know, Tracy. "'And he likes to wait and think on it. "'And, oh, tis so tiresome. "'and it puts me in a bad humour, and I behave like a hysterical bourgeois.' "'She got up swiftly, clasping her nervous little hands. "'When he speaks to me in that gentle, reasoning way, I could scream, Tracy. "'Do you think I am mad?' "'She laughed unmusically. "'No,' he replied. "'But the next thing to it, a bel manoir. "'Perhaps it was a pity you ever married, Richard. "'But there is always the money.' "'There is not.' she cried out sharply. Not? What mean you? Tracy, tis of this that I wanted to speak. You think my lord left his money to Dick? Certainly. He should be stupendously wealthy. He is not. But, my good girl, the revenue must be enormous. He has the land, surely. No, no, he is not the land. Oh, but I am angry whenever I think on it. He induced my lord to leave it to John. He has but his younger son's portion. I still fail to understand. You inform me that the Earl left all to Richard. He changed his will, Tracy. He changed his will? Then, my dear, you must have played your cards very badly. Twas not my fault, Tracy. Indeed, twas not. I knew not until the will was read. Richard never spoke a word to me about it. And now— "'We are comparatively poor.' Her voice trembled with indignation, but his grace only whistled beneath his breath. "'I always knew, of course, that Dick was a fool. But I never guessed how much so till now.' At that she flared up. "'He is not a fool. He is an honest man, and his we—we, I tell you, who are mean and despicable and mercenary.' "'Undoubtedly, Lavinia.' "'But pray, do not excite yourself so over it. "'I suppose he is still devoted to that young hothead?' "'Yes. "'Yes, tis all Jack, Jack, Jack. 
until I am sick to death at the sound of his name. And—' She broke off, biting her lip. "'And what?' "'Oh, not. But tis all so disagreeable, Tracy.' She stamped angrily. "'Oh, where's the good in being flippant?' "'My dear Lavinia, where's the good in being anything else? The situation strikes me as rather amusing. To think of the worthy Richard so neatly overturning all my plans. "'If it had not been for you, I might never have married him. Why did you throw them both in my way? Why did I ever set my eyes on either of them?' "'It should have been a good match, my dear. And if I remember rightly, no one was more alive to that fact than yourself.' She pouted angrily and turned her shoulder to him. Still, he continued reflectively, I admit that for the smart lot we are, we do seem rather to have bungled the affair. Lavinia swept round upon him. Oh, do you care no more than that? How can you be so casual? Does it affect you not at all? He wrinkled his thin nose expressively. I shall not weep over it, Lavinia, but tis a plaguy nuisance. But we must see what can be done, and that brings me back to the original subject. Despite these upsetting revelations, I still require that money. Oh, dear! How much must you have, Tracy? Five hundred might suffice. Tracy, do not the estates bring in anything? She asked petulantly. And Andrew told us you had a run of marvellous luck not a fortnight since. Since then, my dear, I have had three runs of marvellous ill luck. As to the estates, they are mortgaged up to the hilt, as you very well know. What little there is, is between three, and Robert is extravagant. I hate Robert! I am not partial to him myself, but it makes no odds. I wish he might die. Oh, no, no! Now I am become ill-natured again. I don't wish it, only I am so tired of everything. You shall have that money as soon as possible, but be careful, Tracy, please be careful. It is not easy to get money from Dick. No, I should imagine not. However, we have managed rather well up to the present. Take it all in all. Up to the present he has had all the money he wanted. My lord denied him not. Well, tis unfortunate, as I said before, but it must be endured. Where is Dick? I know not. You will stay to dinner, Tracy. Thank you. I shall be charmed. Yes, yes. Oh, how prodigiously pleasant it is to see you again. Soon I shall come to Andover. Will you let me stay a few days? The question is, will Richard allow you to stay so long in my contaminating presence? Richard would never keep me away, Tracy, she replied proudly. He could not. Oh, why is it that I don't love him more? Why do I not care for him as much as I care for you, even? My dear Lavinia, like all Bellman was, you care first for yourself and secondly for the man who masters you. That, alas, Richard, has not yet succeeded in doing. But I do love Richard. I do. I do, yet— Exactly. Yet. The grand passion has not yet touched you, my dear, and you are quite self-absorbed. Self-absorbed? Those are hard words. But not too hard for the case. You think solely of yourself, your own pleasure, your own character, your own feelings. If you could cast yourself into the background a little, you would be less excitable and considerably less discontented. How dare you, Tracy? Pray, what of you? Are you so selfless? Not at all. I am precisely the same. I was merely suggesting that you might be happier, and you could depose self. You had best do the same yourself. My dear Lavinia, when I feel the need of greater happiness, I most undoubtedly shall. At present I am quite content. You are unkind, she protested, and you sneer at me. Pray accept my heartfelt apologies. You shall come to Andover if the worthy Richard permits. Her face cleared as by magic. Oh, Tracy! Oh, I'm so desirous to be gay once more. I cannot even receive now on account of this morning. But when I am at Andover, oh, we will not worry over anything, and I can be bad-tempered without feeling that someone is being hurt by me. Oh, come to Dickie at once, at once. He rose leisurely. 
"'I can imagine that you try Richard's patience somewhat,' he remarked. "'Happily, your impetuosity in no way disturbs me. "'We will go in search of Richard.' "'Halfway down the great staircase, she perceived her husband, and flew to meet him. "'Richard, I was coming in search of you. "'Tracy has invited me to Andover for a week. "'He purposes to ask several people to stay, and there will be parties and entertainment. "'You will let me go. Say yes, Dick.' "'Say yes quickly.' Carstairs bowed to his grace, who stood watching them from the stairs. The bow was returned with exaggerated flourish. Carstairs looked down at his wife. "'So soon, Lavinia,' he remonstrated in indicating her mourning. She shook off his hand impatiently. "'Oh, Dicky, does it matter? What can it signify? I do not ask you to come.' "'No,' he said half sadly, half amusedly. "'I notice that, my dear.' "'No, no, I did not mean to be unkind. "'You must not think that. "'You don't think it, do you, Dick?' "'Oh, no,' he sighed. "'Good, Dicky.' "'She patted his cheek coaxingly. "'Then you will allow me to go. "'Ah, oh, but, yes, yes, you must listen. "'You know how dull I am, and how silly. "'Tis because I need a change. "'And I want to go to Andover. "'I want to go.' "'Yes, dear, I know. "'But my father is not yet dead six weeks, "'and I cannot think it seemly. "'Please, Dick, please, please do not say no. "'Twill make me so unhappy. "'Oh, you will not be so unkind. "'You will not forbid me to go.' "'I ask you not to, Lavinia. "'If you need a change, I will take you quietly to Bath, "'or where you will. "'Do not pain me by going to Andover just now.' "'Bath! Bath! What do I want with Bath at this time of year? Oh, tis kind in you to offer, but I want to go to Andover. I want to see all the old friends again, and I want to get away from everything, here. Tis all so gloomy after—after my lord's death.' "'Dearest, of course you shall go away. But if only you would remember that you are in mourning.' "'But tis what I wish to forget. Oh, Dicky, don't, don't, don't be unkind.' "'Very well, dear.' If you must go, go. She clapped her hands joyfully. Oh, thank you, Dicky. You are not angry with me. No, dear, of course not. Ah, oh, now I am happy. Tis sweet of you, Dicky, but confess, you are secretly thankful to be rid of me for a week. Now are you not? She spread out her fan in the highest good humour and coquetted behind it. Richard was induced to smile. "'I fear I shall miss you too sadly, dear.' "'Oh,' she dropped the fan, "'but think how you will look forward to seeing me again, and I you. "'Why, I shall be so thankful to be back after a week away "'that I shall be good for months.' "'His face lightened, and he caught her hands in his. "'Darling, if I thought you would miss me.' "'But of course I shall miss you, Dick. "'Oh, pray, mind my frock. "'Shall I not miss him, Tracy?' Richard suddenly remembered his brother-in-law's presence. He turned and went to the foot of the stairs. "'So you are determined to wrest my wife from me?' he smiled. Tracy descended leisurely, opening his snuff-box. "'Yes, I require a hostess,' he said. "'And I have,' he paused, induced her to honour Andover with her presence. "'Shall we have the felicity of seeing you at any time?' "'I thank you, no. I am not, you will understand.' in the mood for the gaiety for which my poor Lavinia craves. The Duke bowed slightly, and they all three went out on to the terrace, Lavinia laughing and talking as Richard had not heard her laugh or talk for days. She was the life and soul of the little dinner party, flirting prettily with her husband, and exerting herself to please him in every way. She had won her point. Therefore she was in excellent spirits with all the world, and not even the spilling of some wine on her new silk served to discompose her. End of chapter 5 Recording by Tara Mendoza Phoenix, Arizona, July 2011
Chapter Six. Bath, Twenty Nine Queen Square. The autumn and the winter passed smoothly, and April found the Carstairs installed at Bath, whither Lady Lavinia had teased her husband into going, despite his desire to return to Wincham and John. She herself did not care to be with the child, and was perfectly content that Richard should journey occasionally to Wincham to see that all was well with him. On the whole, she had enjoyed the winter, for she had induced Richard to open Wincham House, Mayfair, the Earl's town residence, where she had been able to hold several entirely successful routs, and many select little card parties. Admirers she had a many, and nothing so pleased her vain little heart as masculine adulation. Carstairs never entered his home without stumbling against some fresh flame of hers, but as they mostly consisted of what he rudely termed the lapdog type, he was conscious of no jealous qualms, and patiently submitted to their inundation of his house. He was satisfied that Lavinia was happy, and, as he assured himself at times, when he was most tried, nothing else signified. The only flaw to Lavinia's content was the need of money, not that she was stented or ever refused anything that he could in reason give her, but her wants were never reasonable. She would demand a new town chariot, upholstered in pale blue, not because her own was worn out or shabby, but because she was tired of its crimson cushions, or she would suddenly take a fancy to some new and usually fabulously expensive toy, and having acquired it, weary of it in a week. Without a murmur, Richard gave her lap-dogs of the real kind, black pages, jewels, and innumerable kickshaws, for which she rewarded him with her brightest smiles and tenderest caresses. But, when she required him to refurnish Wincham House in the style of the French court, throwing away all the present Queen Anne furniture, the tapestries, and the countless old trappings that were one and all so beautiful and so valuable, he put his foot down with a firmness that surprised her. Not for any whim of hers was Jack's house to be spoiled. Neither her coaxing nor her tears had any effect upon Richard, and when she reverted to sulks, he scolded her so harshly that she was frightened, and, in consequence, silenced. For a week she thought and dreamt of nothing but gilded French chairs, and then abruptly, as all else, the fancy left her, and she forgot all about it. Her mantua-maker's bills were enormous, and caused Richard many a sleepless night, but she was always so charmingly penitent that he could not find it in his heart to be angry, and after all, he reflected, he would rather have his money squandered on her adornment than on that of her brother's. She was by turns passionate and cold to him, one day rapturing him by some pretty blandishment, the next snapping peevishly when he spoke to her. At the beginning of the season he dutifully conducted her to routs and balls masques, but soon she began to go always with either Andrew or Robert, both of whom were in town, and whose casual chaperonage she much preferred to Richard's solicitous care. Tracy was rarely in London for more than a few days at a time, and the Carstairs, greatly to Richard's relief, saw but little of him. Carstairs disliked Colonel Lord Robert Belmanoir, but the Duke he detested, not only for his habitual sneer towards him, but for the influence that he undoubtedly held over Lavinia. Richard was intensely jealous of this, and could sometimes hardly bring himself to be civil when his grace visited my lady. Whether justly or not, he inwardly blamed Tracy for all Lavinia's crazy whims and periodical fits of ill-temper. It did not take his astute grace long to discover this, and with amused devilry he played upon it, encouraging Lavinia in her extravagance, and making a point of calling on her whenever he was in town. Carstairs never knew when not to expect to find him there. He came and went to and from London with no warning whatsoever. No one ever knew where he was for more than a day at a time, and no one was in the least surprised if he happened to be seen in London when he should, according to all accounts, have been in Paris. They merely shrugged their shoulders and exchanged glances, murmuring, "'Devil Belmanoir!' and wondering what fresh intrigue he was in. So altogether Richard was not sorry when my lady grew suddenly sick of town and was seized with a longing for Bath. He had secretly hoped that she might return to Wincham, but when she expressed no such wish, he stifled his own longing for home, shut up the London house, 
and took her and all her baggage to Bath, installing her in Queen Square, in one of the most elegantly furnished houses in the place. Lady Lavinia was at first charmed to be there again, delighted with the house, and transported over the excellencies of the new French milliner she had discovered. But the milliner's bills proved monstrous, and the drawing-room of her house not large enough for the routes she contemplated giving. The air was too relaxing for her, and she was subject to constant attacks of the vapours that were as distressing to her household as they were to herself. The late hours made her head ache, as it never ached in London, and the damp gave her a cold. Furthermore, the advent of an attractive and exceedingly wealthy little widow caused her many a bitter hour, to the considerable detriment of her good temper. She was lying on a couch in her white and gilt drawing-room one afternoon. Alas! The craze for French furniture was o'er, smelling bottle in hand, and a bona fide ache in her head, when the door opened and Tracy walked into the room. "'Good heavens!' she said faintly, and uncorked her salts. It was his grace's first appearance since she had come to Bath, and the fact that he had politely declined an invitation that she had sent to him still rankled in her mind. He bowed over the limp hand that she extended, and looked her up and down. "'I regret to find you thus indisposed, my dear sister,' he said smoothly. "'Tis not. Only one of my stupid headaches. I am never well here, and this house is stuffy.' she answered fretfully. "'You should take to the waters,' he said, scrutinizing through his eyeglass, the chair to which she had waved him. "'It has an unstable appearance, my dear. I believe I prefer the couch.' He moved to a small sofa and sat down. "'Pray, how long have you been in Bath?' she demanded. "'I arrived last Tuesday week.' Lady Lavinia started up. "'Last Tuesday week?' "'Then you have been here ten days, and not visited me until now.' He appeared to be examining the whiteness of his hands through the folds of black lace that drooped over them. "'I believe I had other things to do,' he said coolly. A book of sermons that she had been trying to peruse slid to the ground as Lavinia jerked a cushion into place. "'And you come to me when it suits you. How could you be so unkind as to refuse my invitation?' There was a rising, cordless note in her voice, which gave warning of anger. "'My dear Lavinia, if you exhibit your deplorable temper to me, I shall leave you. So have a care. I thought you would understand that your good husband's society, improving though it may be, would be altogether too oppressive for my taste. In fact, I was surprised at your letter.' "'You might have come for my sake,' she answered peevishly, sinking back again. "'I suppose you have been dancing in attendance on the Mosley women. Lord, but I think you men have gone crazy.' Understanding came to his grace, and he smiled provokingly. "'Is that what upsets you? I wondered.' "'No, tis not,' she flashed. "'And I do not see why you should think so. For my part, I cannot see that she is even tolerable.' and the way the men rave about her is disgusting. Disgusting! But it is always the same when a woman is unattached and wealthy. Well, well, why do you not say something? Do you find her so lovely? To tell you the truth, my dear, I have barely set eyes on the lady. I have been otherwise engaged, and I have done with all women for the time, save one. So, I have heard you say before, do you contemplate marriage? Lud, but I pity the girl. She gave a jeering little laugh, but it was evident that she was interested. His grace was not in the least degree ruffled. I do not contemplate marriage, Lavinia, so your sympathies are wasted. I have meant a girl, a mere child, for sure, and I will not rest until I have her. Lord, another farmer's chit! No, my dear sister, not another farmer's chit. A lady. God help her! Who is she? Where does she live? She lives in Sussex. Her name I shall not tell you. Her ladyship kicked an offending cushion onto the floor and snapped at him. Oh, as you please. I shall not die of curiosity. Ah, 
the cynical lips curled annoyingly, and Lady Lavinia was seized with a mad desire to hurl her smelling-bottle at him. But she knew it that it was worse than useless to be angry with Tracy. So she yawned ostentatiously, and hoped that she irritated him. If she did, she got no satisfaction from it, for he continued quite imperturbably. "'She is the daintiest piece ever a man saw, and I'll swear there's blood and fire beneath the ice.' "'Is it possible the girl will have none of your grace?' wondered Lavinia in mock amazement, and had the pleasure of seeing him frown. The thin brows met over his arched nose, and the eyes glinted a little, while she caught a glimpse of cruel white teeth closing on a sensual underlip. She watched his hand clench on his snuff-box, and exulted silently at having roused him. It was a very brief joy, however, for the next moment the frown had disappeared, the hand unclenched, and he was smiling again. "'At present she is cold,' he admitted. "'But I hope that in time she will become more plastic. I think, Lavinia, I have some experience with your charming, if capricious, sex.' "'I don't doubt you have. Where did you meet this perverse beauty?' "'In the pump-room.' "'Lord!' "'Pray describe her.' "'I shall be delighted. "'She is taller than yourself, and dark. "'Her hair is like a dusty cloud of black, "'and it ripples off her brow and over her little ears "'in a most damnably alluring fashion. "'Her eyes are brown, "'but there are lights in them that are purest amber, "'and yet they are dark and velvety. "'My lady had recourse to the smelling-bottle. "'But I perceive I weary you. "'A man in love, my dear Lavinia. "'She was up again at that. "'In love? You? "'Nonsense, nonsense, nonsense. "'You do not know what the word means. "'You are like a, like a fish, "'with no more of love in you than a fish, "'and no more heart than a fish, and... "'Spare me the rest, I beg. "'I am very clammy. "'I make no doubt. "'But... "'You will at least accord me more brain than a fish.' "'Oh, you have brain enough,' she raged. "'Brain for evil. I grant you that.' "'It is really very kind of you. "'The passion you feel now is not love. "'It is—it is—' it is "'Your pardon, my dear. "'But at the present moment I am singularly devoid of all strenuous emotions. "'So your remark is, "'Oh, Tracy!' "'Tracy, I am even quarrelling with you,' she cried wretchedly. "'Oh, why, why?' "'You are entirely mistaken, my dear. "'This is but the interchange of compliments. "'Pray, do not let me hinder you in the contribution of your share.' "'Her lip trembled. "'Go on, Tracy, go on.' "'Very well. "'I have described her eyes, I think. "'Very tediously.' I will strive to be brief. Her lips are the most kissable that I have ever seen. And, as you remarked, you have experience, she murmured. He bowed ironically. Altogether, she's as spirited a filly as you could wish for. All she needs is bringing to heel. Does one bring a filly to heel? I rather thought— As usual, my dear Lavinia, you are right. One does not. One breaks in a filly. I beg leave to thank you for correcting my mixed metaphor. Oh, pray, do not mention it. I will cease to do so. She needs breaking in. It should be amusing to tame her. Should it? She looked curiously at him. Vastly. I am persuaded it can be done. I will have her. But what if she'll none of you? Suddenly the heavy lids were raised. And she will have no choice. Lady Lavinia shivered and sat up. "'La, Tracy! Will you have no sense of decency?' she cried. "'I suppose,' she sneered, "'you think to kidnap the girl?' "'Exactly,' he nodded. She gasped at the effrontery of it. "'Heavens, are you mad? Kidnap a lady! This is no peasant girl, remember. Tracy! Tracy, pray do not be foolish!' "'How can you kidnap her?' "'That, my dear, is a point which I have not yet decided. 
but I do not anticipate much trouble. But goodness gracious me, has the child no protectors, no brothers, no father? There is a father, said Tracy slowly. He was here, at the beginning of their stay. He does not signify, and, which is important, he is of those that truckle. Were I to make myself known to him, I believe I might marry the girl within an hour. But I do not want that. At least, not yet. Good God, Tracy! Do you think you are living in the dark ages? One cannot do these things now, I tell you. Will you not at least remember that you represent our house? Twill be a pretty thing, and there is a scandal. She broke off hopelessly and watched him flick a remnant of snuff from his cravat. Oh, Tracy, tis indeed a dangerous game you play. Pray consider. Really, Lavinia, you are most entertaining. I trust I am capable of caring for myself in mine own honour. Oh, don't sneer, don't sneer, she cried. Sometimes I think I quite hate you. You would be the more amusing, my dear. She swept the back of her hand across her eyes in a characteristic movement. How cross I am, she said, and laughed waveringly. You must bear with me, Tracy. Indeed, I am not well. You should take the waters, he repeated. Oh, I do, I do. And that reminds me that I must look for your beauty. She is not like to be there, he answered. Tis only very seldom that she appears. What? Is she then religious? Religious? Why, in heaven's name? But not to walk in the rooms. She is staying here with her aunt, who has been ill. They do not mix much in society. How very dreadful! Yet she is to walk in the rooms, for you meant her there? Yes, he admitted coolly. Tis for that reason that she now avoids them. "'Oh, Tracy, the poor child!' exclaimed his sister in a sudden fit of pity. "'How can you persecute her if she dislikes you?' "'She does not.' "'Not? Then rather she fears me. But she is intrigued for all that. I persecute her, as you call it, for her own and my ultimate good. But they quit Bath in a few days, and then... "'Nous verons,' he rose." "'What of honest Dick?' "'Don't call him by that odious name. I will not have it.' "'Odious, my dear. Odious? You would have reason, and I called him dishonest Dick.' "'Don't! Don't!' she cried, covering her ears. His grace laughed softly. "'No, oh, Lavinia, you must get the better of these megrims of yours, for there is naught that sickens a man sooner, believe me.' "'Oh, go away!' "'Go away!' she implored. "'You tease me and tease me until I cannot bear it, "'and indeed I do not mean to be shrewish. "'Please go.' "'I am on the point of doing so, my dear. "'I trust you will have in a measure recovered when next I see you. "'Pray, bear my respects to on, to the Honourable Richard.' "'She stretched out her hand. "'Come again soon,' she begged. "'I shall be better to-morrow.' "'Tis only to-day that my head aches, "'till I could shriek with the worry and the pain of it. "'Come again.' "'Unfortunately, I anticipate leaving Bath within a day or two, "'but nothing would have given me greater pleasure "'than to comply with your wishes.' "'He kissed her hand punctiliously, and took his leave. "'At the door he paused and looked back mockingly. "'By the way, her name is Diana.' "'He bowed again and swept out.' as Lavinia buried her face in the cushions and burst into tears. It was thus that Richard found her twenty minutes later, and his concern was so great that it in part restored her spirits, and she spent a quiet and, for him, blissful evening playing at piquet. In the middle of a game she suddenly flung down her hand and caught at his wrist. "'Dicky, Dicky, I will go home.' "'Go home? What do you mean?' Not. Yes, yes, Wincham. Why not? My dear, do you mean it? His voice quivered with joyful surprise, and the cards slipped from his hands. 
"'Yes, I mean it. But take me quickly before I change my mind. I can sleep at Wincham, and here I lie awake all night, and my head aches. Take me home, and I will try to be a better wife. Oh, Dicky, have I been tiresome and exacting? I did not mean to be. Why do you let me?' She came quickly round the table and knelt at his side, giving no heed to the crumpling of her billowing silks. "'I have been a wicked, selfish woman,' she said vehemently. "'But, indeed, I will be better. You must not let me be bad. You must not, I tell you.' He flung his arm about her plump shoulders and drew her tightly to him. "'When I get you home, at Wincham, I promise you, I will finally hector you, sweetheart, he said, laughing, to conceal his deeper feelings. I shall make you into a capital housewife. And I will learn to make butter, she nodded. Then I must wear a dimity gown with a muslin apron and cap. Oh, yes, yes, a dimity gown. She sprang up and danced to the middle of the room. Shall I not be charming, Richard? Very charming, Lavinia. Of course. Oh, we will go home at once, at once. But first I must procure some new gowns for Marguerite. To make butter in, my dear? He protested. She was not attending. A dimity gown, or shall it be a Tiffany with a quilted petticoat, or both? She chanted. Dicky, I shall set a fashion in country toilettes. Dicky sighed. End of chapter 6 Recording by Tara Mendoza Phoenix, Arizona, July 2011Chapter 7 of The Black Moth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tara Mendoza. The Black Moth by Georgette Hare. Chapter 7 Introducing Sundry New Characters. Not twenty minutes' walk from Lady Lavinia's house in Queen Square resided a certain Madame Thompson, a widow, who had lived in Bath for nearly fifteen years. With her was staying Miss Elizabeth Bullet and her niece Diana. Madame Thompson had been at a seminary with Miss Elizabeth when both were girls, and they had ever afterwards kept up their friendship, occasionally visiting one another, but more often contenting themselves with the writings of lengthy epistles full of unimportant scraps of news and much gossip, amusing only on Miss Elizabeth's side, and on the widow's uninteresting and rambling. It was a great joy to Madame Thompson when she received a letter from Miss Bullet, begging that she and her niece might be allowed to pay a visit to her house in Bath, and to stay at least three weeks. The good lady was delighted at having her standing invitation at last accepted, and straightway wrote back a glad assent. She prepared her very best bedchamber for Miss Bullet, who, she understood, was coming to Bath principally for a change of air and scene after a long and rather trying illness. In due course the two ladies arrived, the elder very small and thin and bird-like in her movements, the younger moderately tall and graceful as a willow tree, with great candid brown eyes that looked fearlessly out on to the world, and a tragic mouth that belied a usually cheerful disposition and hinted at a tendency to look on the gloomy side of life. Madame Thompson, whose first meeting with Diana this was, remarked on the sad mouth to Miss Elizabeth, or Betty, as she was more often called, as they sat over the fire on the first night, Diana herself having retired to her room. Miss Betty shook her head darkly, and prophesied that her precious Di would one day love some man, as no man, in her opinion, deserved to be loved. "'And she'll have love badly,' she said, clicking her knitting needles energetically. "'I know these temperamental children.' "'She looks so melancholy,' ventured the widow. "'Well, there you are wrong,' replied Miss Betty. "'Tis the sunniest-tempered child, and the sweetest natured in the whole wide world, bless her. But I don't deny that she can be miserable far from it. Why, I've known her weep her pretty eyes out over a dead puppy, even. But usually she is gay enough. 
"'I fear this house will be dull and stupid for her,' said Madame Thompson regretfully. "'If only my dear son George were at home to entertain her.' "'My love, pray do not put yourself out. I assure you Diana will not at all object to a little quiet after the life she has been leading in town this winter with her friend's family.' Whatever Diana thought of the quiet, she at least made no complaint, and adapted herself to her surroundings quite contentedly. In the morning they would all walk as far as the assembly rooms, and Miss Betty would drink the waters in the old pump-room, pacing sedately up and down with her friend on one side and her niece on the other. Madame Thompson had very few acquaintances in Bath, and the people she did know were all of her own age and habits rarely venturing as far as the crowded fashionable quarter. So Diana had to be content with the society of the two old ladies, who gossiped happily enough together, but whose conversation she could not but find singularly uninteresting. She watched the monde with concealed wistfulness, seeing Beau Nash strut about among the ladies, bowing with his extreme gallantry, always impeccably garbed and in spite of his rapidly increasing age and bulk, still absolute monarch of Bath. She saw fine-painted madams, in enormous hoops, and with their hair so extravagantly curled and powdered that it appeared quite grotesque, mincing along with their various cavaliers, elderly beaux with coats padded to hide their shrunken shoulders, and paint to fill the wrinkles on their faces, young rakes, stout dowagers with their demure daughters, old ladies who had come to Bath for their health's sake, titled folk of fashion, and plain gentry from the country, all parading before her eyes. One or two young bucks tried to ogle her, and received such indignant glances from those clear eyes that they never dared annoy her again. But, for the most part, no one paid any heed to the unknown and plainly clad girl. Then came his grace of Andover upon the stage. He drew Diana's attention from the first moment that he entered the pump-room a black moth amongst the gaily-hued butterflies. He had swept a comprehensive glance round the scene, and at once perceived Diana. Somehow, exactly how she could never afterwards remember, he had introduced himself to her aunt, and won that lady's good will, by his smoothness of manner and polished air. Madame Thompson, who left to herself, never visited the assembly rooms, could not be expected to recognize Devil Belmanoir, in the simple Mr. Everard, who presented himself. As he had told his sister, Diana was cold. There was something about his grace that repelled her, even while his mesmeric personality fascinated. He was right when he said that she feared him. She was nervous, and the element of fear gave birth to curiosity. She was intrigued, and began to look forward to his daily appearance in the pump-room with mingled excitement and apprehension. She liked his flattering attention, and his grand air. Often she would watch him stroll across the floor, bowing to right and left with that touch of insolence that characterized him, and rejoiced in the knowledge that he was coming straight to her, and that the painted beauties who so palpably ogled and invited him to their sides could not alter his course. She felt her power with a thrill of delight, and smiled upon Mr. Everard, giving him her hand to kiss, and graciously permitting him to sit with her beside her aunt. He would point out all the celebrities of town and Bath for her edification, recalling carefully chosen and still more carefully censored anecdotes of each one. She discovered that Mr. Everard was an entertaining and harmless enough companion, and even expanded a little, allowing him a glimpse of her whimsical nature with its laughter and its hints of tears. His Grace of Andover saw enough to guess at the unsounded depths of her soul, and he became lover-like. Diana recoiled instinctively, throwing up a barrier of reserve between them. It was not what he said that alarmed her, but it was the way in which he said it, and the vague something in the purring, faintly sinister voice that she could not quite define, that made her heart beat unpleasantly fast, and the blood rush to her temples. She began first to dread the morning promenade, and then to avoid it. One day she had a headache, the next her foot was sore, another time she wanted to work at her fancy stitchery, until her aunt, who knew how she disliked her needle, and how singularly free from headaches and all petty ailments she was wont to be, openly taxed her with no longer wishing to walk abroad. 
They were in the girl's bedroom at the time. Diana seated before her dressing-table, brushing out her hair for the night. When her aunt put the abrupt question, she hesitated, caught a long strand in her comb, and pretended to be absorbed in its disentanglement. The clouds of rippling hair half hid her face, but Miss Betty observed how her fingers trembled, and repeated her question. Then came the confession. Mr. Everard was unbearable. His attentions were odious, his continued presence revolting to Mistress Di. She was afraid of him, afraid of his dreadful green eyes, and his soft voice. She wished they had never come to Bath, and still more that they had not met him. He looked at her as if, as if, oh, in short, he was hateful. Miss Betty was horrified. "'You cannot mean it, dear. Dear, dear, here was I thinking what a pleasant gentleman he was, and all the time he was persecuting my poor Di, the wretch. I know the type, my love, and I feel inclined to give him a good piece of my mind.' "'Oh, no, no,' implored Diana. "'Indeed, you must do no such thing, Auntie.' He has said not that I could possibly be offended at. Tis but his manner, and the, and the way he looked at me. Indeed, indeed, you must not. Tut, child, of course I shall say not. But it makes me so monstrous angry to think of my poor lamb being tormented by such as he, that I declare I could tear his eyes out. Yes, my dear, I could. Thank goodness we are leaving Bath next week. Yes, sighed Diana. I cannot help being glad, though Madame Thompson is very amiable. Tis so very different when there is no man with one. You are quite right, my love. We should have insisted on your father staying with us instead of allowing him to fly back to his fusty, musty old volumes. I shall not be so foolish another time, I can assure you. But we need not go to the assembly rooms again. I need not go, corrected Diana gently. Of course, you and Madame Thompson will continue to. To tell you the truth, my love, confessed Miss Betty, I shall not be sorry for an excuse to stay away. Tis doubtless most ill-natured of me, but I cannot but think that Hester has altered sadly since last I saw her. She is always talking of sermons and good works. Diana twisted her luxuriant hair into a long plait and gave a gurgling little laugh. <laughs> oh, Auntie! Is it not depressing? I wondered how you could tolerate it. She is so vastly solemn, poor dear thing. Well, said Miss Betty charitably, she has seen trouble, has Hester Thompson, and I have my doubts about this George of hers, a worthless young man, I fear, from all accounts. But unkind though it may be, I shall be glad to find myself at home again, and that's the truth. She rose and picked up her candle. In fact, I find Bath not half so amusing as I was told t'would be. Diana walked with her to the door. "'Tis not amusing at all when one has no friends. But last year, when my cousins were with us, and Papa took a house for the season on the North Parade, t'was most enjoyable. I wish you had been there, instead of with that disagreeable Aunt Jennifer." She kissed her relative most affectionately and lighted her across the landing to her room. Then she returned to her own and shut the door, giving a tired little yawn. It was at about that moment that His Grace of Andover was ushered into the already crowded card-room of my Lord Avon's house in Catherine Place, and was greeted with ribald cries of, "'Oh, Belmanoir! Where's the lady, devil?' He walked coolly forward into the full light of a great pendant chandelier, standing directly beneath it, the diamond order on his breast burning and winking like a living thing the diamonds in his cravat and on his fingers glittered every time he moved, until he seemed to be carelessly powdered with iridescent gems. As usual, he was clad in black, but it would have been difficult to find any other dress in the room more sumptuous or more magnificent than his sable satin, with its heavy silver lacing and shimmering waistcoat. Silver lace adorned his throat and fell in deep ruffles over his hands, and in defiance of fashion, which decreed that black alone should be worn to tie the hair, he displayed long silver ribbands, very striking against his unpowdered head. He raised his quizzing-glass and looked round the room with an air of surprised hauteur. Lord Avon, leaning back in his chair at one of the tables, shook a reproving finger at him. "'Belmanoir!' 
Belmanoir, we have seen her, and we protest she is too charming for you. In truth, we think we should be allowed a share in the ladyeth smileth, lisped one from behind him, and his grace turned to face dainty, effeminate little Viscount Fotheringham, who stood at his elbow, resplendent in salmon pink satin and primrose velvet, with skirts so full and stiffly whaleboned that they stood out from his person and heels so high that instead of walking he could only mince. Tracy made a low leg. "'Surely shall you have a share in her smiles, and she wills it so,' he purred, and a general laugh went up, which caused the fop to flush to the ears as he speedily effaced himself. He had been one of those who had tried to accost Diana, and gossip-loving Will Stapley with him at the time, had related the story of his discomfiture to at least half a dozen men, who immediately told it to others, vastly amused at the pertinacious Viscount's rebuff. "'What was it?' Selwyn said, drawled Sir Gregory Markham, shuffling cards at Lord Avon's table. Davenant looked across at him inquiringly. "'George? Of Belmanoir? When? Oh, at White's one night, I forget. Jack Chomonley was there. He would know, and Hoary Warpole. Twas of devil in his light of loves, quite apt on the whole. Chomonley looked up. "'Did I hear my name?' "'Aye.' "'What was it that George said of Belmanoir at White's, "'the night Gilly made that absurd bet with Folliette? "'When Gilly, oh, yes, I remember. "'Twas but an old hexameter tag, playing on his name. "'Es bellim, belli, bellim, belli, puelli. "'He seemed to think it a fitting motto for a ducal house. "'There was another general laugh at this. "'Markham broke in on it. "'Who is she, Tracy?' his grace turned. "'Who is who?' he asked languidly. Lord Avon burst out laughing. "'Oh, come now, Belmanoir. That won't do. It really will not. Who is she, indeed?' "'Aye, Belmanoir. Who is the black-haired beauty, and where did you find her?' cried Tom Wilding, pressing forward with a glass in one hand and a bottle of port in the other. "'I thought you were captivated by Cynthia Evans.' Tracy looked bewildered for the moment, and then a light dawned on him. "'Evans, ah, yes, the saucy widow who lived in Kensington, was it not? I remember.' "'He had forgotten!' cried Avon, and went off into another of the noisy laughs that had more than once caused Mr. Nash to shudder and to close his august eyes. "'You'll be the death of me, devil! Gad, but you will!' "'Oh, I trust not. Thank you, Wilding.' He accepted the glass that Tom offered and sipped delicately. "'But you've not answered,' reminded Fortescue from another table. He dealt the cards round expertly. "'It is hands off, perhaps?' "'Certainly,' replied his grace. "'It generally is, Frank, as you know.' "'To my cost,' was the laughing rejoinder, and Fortescue rubbed his sword-arm as if in memory of some hurt. "'You pinked me finely, Tracy.' "'Clumsily, Frank, clumsily. It might have been quicker done.' The Viscount, who had been a second at the meeting, tittered amiably. "'Neater thing I ever thaw, pon my honour. All over, in less than a minute, Avon. Give you my word.' "'Never knew you had fought, devil, Frank. What possessed you?' "'I was more mad than usual, I suppose,' replied Fortescue in his low, rather dreamy voice. "'And I interfered between Tracy and his French singer.' He objected most politely, and we fought it out in Hyde Park. "'Gad, yes!' exclaimed his partner, Lord Falmouth. "'Why, I was devil's second. But it was ages ago.' Two years,' nodded Fortescue. "'But I have not forgotten, you see.' "'Lord, I had. And twas the funniest fight I ever saw, with you as furious as could be and devil cool as a cucumber. You were never much of a swordsman, Frank.' but that morning you thrust so wildly that stap me if I didn't think devil would run you through. Stead of that he pinks you neatly through the sword-arm, and damn if you didn't burst out laughing fit to split. And then we all walked off to breakfast with you, Frank, as jolly as sandboys. Heavens, yes, that was a fight. It was amusing, admitted Tracy at Fortescue's elbow. Don't play, Frank. Fortescue flung his cards face downwards on the table. Curse you, Tracy, you've brought bad luck he said entirely without rancour. I had quite tolerable hands before you came. Berminois, I will take my chestnut mare against your new grey. 
lisped the Viscount, coming up to the table, dice-box in hand. "'Stop me, but that is too bad,' cried Wilding. "'Don't take him, devil. Have you seen the brute?' The four players had finished their card-playing, and were quite ready for the dice. "'Trust in your luck, Belmanoir, and take him,' advised Pritchard, who loved hazarding other men's possessions, but kept a tight hold on his own. "'I take him,' echoed Falmouth. "'Don't.' said Fortescue. "'Of course I shall take him,' answered his grace tranquilly. "'My grey against your chestnut and the best of three. Will you throw?' The Viscount rattled his box with a flourish. Two threes and one turned up. With a hand on Fortescue's shoulder and one foot on the rung of his chair, Tracy leaned forward and cast his own dice on to the table. He had beaten the Viscount's throw by five. The next toss, Fotheringham won, but the last fell to his grace. "'Damn Nathan!' said the Viscount cheerfully. "'Will you take your grey against my terror?' "'Thunder and turf, Fotheringham, you'll lose him!' cried Nettleford warningly. "'Don't stake you the terror!' "'Nonthenth. Do you take me, Belmanoir?' "'Certainly,' said the Duke, and threw. "'Oh, and you are in a gaming mood. I will play for the right to try my hand with the dark beauty.' called Markham across the room. "'Against what?' asked Fortescue. "'Oh, what he wills!' The Viscount had cast and lost, and his grace won the second throw. "'It appears my luck is in,' he remarked. "'I will stake my beauty against your estates, Markham.' Sir Gregory shook his head, laughing. "'No, no, keep the lady.' "'I intend to, my dear fellow. She is not your style.' I begin to wonder whether she altogether suits my palate. He drew out his snuff-box and offered it to his host, and the other men, finding that he was proof against their railing, allowed the subject to drop. In the course of the evening, his grace won three thousand guineas, two at ombre and one at dice, lost his coveted grey hunter, and won him back again from Wilding, to whom he had fallen. He came away at three o'clock in the company, with Fortescue, both perfectly cool-headed, although his grace, for his part, had imbibed a considerable quantity of burgundy, and more punch than any ordinary man can take, without afterwards feeling very much the worse for wear. As my lord Avon's door closed behind them, Tracy turned to his friend. "'Shall we walk, Frank?' "'Since our ways lie together, yes,' replied Fortescue, linking his arm in the Duke's. "'Down Brock Street and across the Circus is our quickest way.' They strolled down the road for a few moments in silence, passing a linkman on the way. Fortescue bade him a cheery good-night, which was answered in a very beery voice, but the Duke said nothing. Frank looked into his dark-browed face thoughtfully. "'You've had the luck to-night, Tracy?' "'Moderately. I hoped entirely to repair last week's losses.' "'You are in debt, I suppose?' "'I believe so.' "'To what extent, Tracy?' "'My dear fellow,' I neither have nor wish to have the vaguest notion. Pray do not treat me to a sermon. I shall not. I said all I have to say on the subject. Many times. Yes, many times. And it has had no more effect upon you than if I had not spoken. Less. I dare say. I wish it were not so, for there's good in you somewhere, Tracy. By what strange process of reasoning do you arrive at that? Well, said Fortescue, laughing, there's nearly always some good in very worst of men. I count on that and your kindness to me. I should be interested to know when I have been kind to you, beyond the time when I was compelled to teach you to leave me and my affairs alone. I was not referring to that occasion, was the dry answer. I had not seen your act in that light. I met well over the episode. You could not damn yourself more effectually than by saying that said his grace calmly. But we wander from the point. When have I done you an act of kindness? You know very well. When you extricated me from that cursed sponging-house. I remember now. Yes, that was good of me. I wonder why I did it. Tis what I want to know. I suppose I must have had some sort of an affection for you. I would certainly never have done such a thing for any one else. Not even for your own brother? said Frank sharply. They had crossed the circus and were walking down Gay Street now. "'Least of all for them,' came the placid response. 
You are thinking of Andrew's tragic act. Most entertaining, was it not? You evidently found it so. I did. I wanted to prolong the sensation. But my esteemed brother-in-law came to the young fool's rescue. Would you have assisted him? In the end, I fear I should have had to. I believe there must be a kink in your brain, cried Fortescue. I cannot else account for your extraordinary conduct. We Belmanoirs are all half mad, replied Tracy sweetly. But I think that in my case it is merely concentrated evil. I will not believe it. You have shown that you can behave differently. You do not try to strip me of all I possess. Why, all those unfortunate youths you play with. You see, you possess so little. The Duke excused himself. Neither do you sneer at me in your loathsome fashion. Why? Because I have hardly ever any desire to. I like you. Terra nuns. You must like someone else in the world besides me. I can think of no one, and I do not exactly worship the ground you tread on. The contemplation of my brothers appalls me. I've loved various women, and shall no doubt love many more. No, Tracy, interposed Fortescue, you have never loved a woman in your life. Tis that that might save you. I do not allude to the lustful passion you indulge in, but real love. For God's sake, Belmanoir, live clean. Pray do not distress yourself, Frank. I am not worth it. I choose to think that you are. I cannot but feel that if you had been loved as a boy, your mother— Did you ever see my mother? inquired his grace lazily. No, but— Have you ever seen my sister? Er, uh, yes. In a rage. Really, I— Because if you have, you have seen my mother. Only she was ten times more violent— in fact, we were a pleasant party when we were all at home. I understand. Good God! I believe you are sorry for me, cried Tracy scornfully. I am. Is it a presumption on my part? My dear Frank, when I am sorry for myself, you may be sorry too. Until then. When that day comes, I shall no longer pity you. Very deep, Frank. You think I shall be on the road to recovery? A pretty conceit. Luckily, the happy moment has not yet come, and I do not think it is like to. We appear to have arrived. They were standing outside one of the tall houses where Fortescue lodged. He turned and grasped his friend's shoulders. Tracy, give up this mad life you lead. Give up the women and the drink and the excessive gaming for one day. Believe me, you will overstep yourself and be ruined. The Duke disengaged himself. I very much object to being manhandled in the street, he complained. I suppose you still mean well. You should strive to conquer the tendency. I wonder if you know how insolent is your tone, Belmanoir, asked Fortescue steadily. Naturally. I should not have attained such perfection in the art of else. But pray accept my thanks for your good advice. You will forgive me, and I do not avail myself of it, I am sure. I prefer the crooked path. Evidently, sighed the other. If you will not try the straight and narrow way, I can only hope that you will fall very deeply and very honestly in love, and that the lady will save you from yourself. I will inform you of it when it comes to pass, promised his grace. And now, good night. Good night. Frank returned the low bow with a curt nod. I shall see you tomorrow, that is, this morning. At the baths. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof, was the smiling rejoinder. Sleep soundly, Frank. He waved an ironic farewell and crossed the road to his own lodgings, which stood almost directly opposite. And I suppose you will sleep as soundly as if you had not a stain on your conscience, and had not tried your uttermost to alienate the regard of the only friend you possess, remarked Frank bitterly to the darkness. Damn you, Tracy! for the villain you are. He walked up the steps to his own front door and turned the key in the lock. He looked over his shoulder as a door slammed across the street. Poor devil, he said. Oh, you poor devil. End of chapter 7 Recording by Tara Mendoza Phoenix, Arizona, August 2011
Chapter Eight of the Black Moth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tara Mendoza. The Black Moth by Georgette Hare. Chapter Eight. The Biter Bit. With John Carstairs, the winter had passed quite uneventfully. He continued his highway robbery, but he made two bad blunders, not from the point of view of a thief, but from that of the gentleman in him. The first was when he stopped an opulent-looking chariot which he found to contain two ladies, their maid and their jewels, and the second when the occupant of a large travelling coach chanced to be an old gentleman who possessed far greater courage than physical strength. On the first occasion my lord's dismay had been ludicrous, and he had hastily retired after tendering a naive apology. The old gentleman in the second episode had defied him so gallantly that he had impulsively offered him the butt-end of one of his pistols. The old man was so surprised that he allowed the weapon to fall to the ground, where it exploded quite harmlessly, sending up a cloud of dust and smoke. Carstairs then begged his pardon most humbly, assisted him back into his coach, and rode off before the astonished Mr. Dunbar had time to collect his wits. The robbing was not carried out in a very scientific manner, for as has been seen, Carstairs could not bring himself to terrorize women or old men, and there only remained the young and the middle-aged gentleman, one of whom Jack offered to fight for the possession of his jewels. His challenge was promptly accepted by the man, who happened to possess a strong sense of humor, and probably saw a chance of saving his belongings in the offer. He had been speedily worsted, but Carstairs was so pleased with a particularly neat thrust, which he had executed, that he forwent half the booty, and the pair of them divided the contents of the jewel-box by the roadside. The sporting gentleman, keeping his most valued belongings, and giving Jack the surplus. They parted on the very best of terms, and all Carstairs got out of the episode was a little sword practice and a few trinkets. When day came he was patrolling the west side of Sussex, beyond Midhurst, not because he thought it a profitable part, but because he knew and loved the country. One late afternoon, towards the end of the month, he rode gaily into one of the small villages that nestle amongst the downs, and made his way down the quaint main street to the George Inn, where he drew rein and dismounted. At his call an aged ostler hobbled out of the side door, chewing an inevitable straw, and after eyeing the newcomer and his steed for an appreciable length of time, evidently decided that they were worthy of his attention, for he came forward, remarking that it had been a pleasant day. Carstairs agreed with him and volunteered the information that it would be another fine day tomorrow, if the sunset were to be trusted. To this the ostler replied that he, for one, never trusted to no red sunsets, and added darkly that there weren't nothing so deceitful to his manner of thinking. He'd known it to be such a red sunset as never was, and yet be a pourin' with the rain all next day. Should he take the mare? Carstairs shook his head. No, I thank you. I remain here, but for a few moments. I doubt she's thirsty, though. Eh, Jenny? Water, sir. For her, yes. For myself, I fancy a tankard of your home-brewed ale. Stand, Jenny. He turned away and walked up the steps to the inn door. "'Be ye goin' to leave her there, sir, a standin' all by herself? inquired the man, surprised. "'Why, yes. She's docile enough.' "'Well, seems to me a risky thing to leave a hoss, and a skittish hoss at that, a standin' loose in the road. You won't be tying her to a postmaster.' Carstairs leaned his arms on the balustrade and looked down at them. "'I will not. She'd be very hurt at such treatment, wouldn't you, lass?' Jenny tossed her head playfully as if in agreement, and the ostler scratched his head, looking from her to my lord. Emma seems as if she understands what you be saying to her, sir. Of course she understands. Don't I tell you tis a clever little lady? If I call her now, she'll come up these steps to me, and not all the ostlers in Christendom could stop her. Don't you go for doing it, sir, urged the old man, backing. She must be uncommon fond of ye. She'd be a deal fonder if you'd fetch her a drink, hinted Jack broadly. Ay, sir, I'd be a goin' this wary instant. And with many an anxious glance over his shoulder at the perfectly quiet mare, 
he disappeared through an open doorway into the yard. When Carstairs tankered of ale in hand, he emerged from the inn and sat himself down on one of the benches that stood against the wall, the mare was drinking thirstily from a bucket which the ancient one held for her. "'Tis a wonderful fine mare, sir,' he remarked at length, after a careful inspection of her points. Carstairs nodded pleasantly, and surveyed Jenny through half-shut eyes. "'I think so every time I look at her,' he said. "'I should think she could get a paid a pace on her, sir. Maybe you've tried her racing. No, she wasn't brought up to that. But she's fast enough. Ay, sir, no vices? Lord, no. Don't kick neither. Not with me. Ah, they allus know who'll stand it and who won't. Jack drained his tankard, and setting it down on the bench beside him, rose to his feet. She'd not dream of kicking a friend. Jenny. The ostler watched her pick her way towards her master coquetting with her head and sidling round him in the most playful manner possible. A slow smile dawned on the man's face. "'Ah, oh, it'd be a birdie sight to watch her, so it be,' he said, and received a guinea from Jack, who never tired of listening to praise of his beloved Jenny. Carstairs remounted, nodded farewell to the ostler, and rode leisurely on down the street, soon branching off to the right into a typical Sussex lane, where he trotted between uneven hedges, sweet with blossom and with may, and placid fields rolling away on either side, upwards until they merged into the undulating hills, barely discernible in the gloom. That of the downs, it was a wonderfully calm evening, with only a gentle west wind blowing, and the moon already shining faintly in the dark sky. There was nothing beyond the sound of the mare's hoofs to break the beautiful stillness of it all. He rode for some way, without meeting a soul, and when at the end of an hour someone did chance along the road, it was only a labourer returning home to his supper after a long day in the fields. John bade him a cheery good evening, and watched him pass on down the road humming. After that he met no one. He rode easily along for miles, into the fast gathering darkness. He was frowning as he rode, thinking. Curiously enough, it was on his penniless days in France that his mind dwelt this evening. He had resolutely thrust that dark time behind him, determined to forget it. But there were still days when, try as he might, he could not prevent his thoughts flying back to it. With clenched teeth he recalled the days when he, the son of an earl, had taught fencing in Paris for a living. Suddenly he laughed harshly, and at the unusual sound the mare pricked up her ears and sidled uneasily across the road. For once no notice was taken of her, and she quickened her pace with a flighty toss of her head. He thought how he, the extravagant John, had pinched and scraped and saved rather than go under, how he had lived in one of the poorer courtiers of the city, alone without friends, nameless. Then cynically now he reviewed the time when he had taken to drinking, heavily and systematically, and had succeeded in pulling himself up at the very brink of the pit he saw yawning before him. Next the news of his mother's death, John passed over that quickly. Even now the thought of it had the power of rousing in him all the old misery and impotent resentment. His mind sped on to his Italian days. On his savings he had travelled to Florence, and from there he went gradually south, picking up all the latest arts and subtleties of fence on the way. The change of scene and of people did much to restore his spirits. His devil-may-care ways peeped out again, he started to gamble on the little money he had left. For once fortune proved kind. He doubled and trebled and quadrupled the contents of his purse. Then it was that he met Jim Salter, whom he engaged as his servant. This was the first friend since he had left England. Together they travelled about Europe, John gambling his way, Jim keeping a relentless hand on the exchequer. It was entirely owing to his watchfulness and care that John was not ruined, for his luck did not always hold good, and there were days when he lost with distressing steadiness. But Jim guarded the winnings jealously, and there was always something to fall back on. At last the longing for England and English people grew so acute that John made up his mind to return, but he found that things in England were very different from what they had been abroad. Here he was made to feel acutely that he was outcast. It was impossible to live in town under an assumed name, as he would like to have done, for far too many people knew Jack Carstairs and would remember him. 
he saw that he must either live secluded, or the idea of becoming a highwayman occurred to him. A hermit's existence he knew to be totally unsuited to a man of his temperament. But the free, adventurous spirit of the road appealed to him. The findings of his mare, J, the third as he laughingly dubbed her, decided the point. He forthwith took on himself the role of quixotic highwayman, roaming his beloved south country happier than he had been since he first left England, bit by bit regaining his youth and spirits, which last not all the trouble he had been through had succeeded in extinguishing. Clip-clap, clip-clap. With a jerk he came back to earth and reined in his mare, the better to listen. Along the road came the unmistakable sound of horses' hoofs, and the scrunch-scrunch of swiftly revolving wheels on the sandy surface. By now the moon was right out, but owing to the fact that she was playing at hide-and-seek in and out of the clouds, it was fairly dark. Nevertheless, Jack fastened his mask over his face with quick, deft fingers, and pulled his hat well over his eyes. His ears told him that the vehicle, whatever it was, was coming towards him. So he drew into the side of the road, and taking a pistol from its holster, sat waiting, his eyes on the bend in the road. Nearer and nearer came the horses, until the leader swung round the corner. Carstairs saw that it was an ordinary travelling chariot, and levelled his pistol. Halt, or I fire! He had to repeat the command before it was heard, and to ride out from the shadow of the hedge. The chariot drew up, and the coachman leaned over the side to see who it was bidding them to stop in so peremptory a manner. "'What do ye want? What do ye? Is there all to miss?' he cried testily, and found himself staring at a long-nosed pistol. "'Throw down your arms.' "'I ain't got none, blast ye.' "'On your honour, Jack dismounted. "'I wish I had, and I'd see ye damned afore I'd throw em down.' At this moment the door of the coach opened and a gentleman leapt lightly down on to the road. He was big and loose-limbed as far as Carstairs could see, and carried himself with an easy grace. My lord presented his pistol. Stand! he ordered gruffly. The moon peeped coyly out from behind a cloud, and shed her light upon the little group as if to see what all the fuss was about. The big man's face was in the shadow, but Jack's pistol was not. Into its muzzle the gentleman gazed, one hand deep in the pocket of his heavy cloak, the other holding a small pistol. "'Me very dear friend,' he said in a rich brogue, "'perhaps ye are not aware that that same pistol ye are pointing at me is unloaded. Don't move, I have ye covered.' Jack's arm fell to his side, and the pistol he held clattered to the ground, but it was not surprise at Jim's defection that caused him that violent start. It was something far more overwhelming." for the voice that proceeded from the tall gentleman belonged to one whom six years ago he had counted, next to Richard, his greatest friend on earth. The man moved a little, and the moonlight shone full on his face, clearly outlining the large nose and good-humoured mouth, and above the sleepy eyes, Miles! Miles O'Hara! For once Jack could find nothing amusing in the situation. It was too inconceivably hideous that he should meet his friend in this guise, and further be unable to reveal himself. A great longing to tear off his mask and to grasp Miles' hand assailed him. With an effort he choked it down and listened to what O'Hara was saying. "'If you would be so kind as to give me your word of honour, you'll not be after trying to escape. I should be greatly obliged. But I tell ye that if ye attempt to move, I shall shoot.' Jack made a hopeless gesture with his hand. He felt dazed. The whole thing was ridiculous. How Miles would laugh afterwards! He went cold. There would be no afterwards. Miles would never know. He would have given over to the authorities, and Miles would never know that he had helped Jack Carstairs to the scaffold. Perhaps, too, he would not mind so very much, now that he, Jack, was so disgraced. One could never tell, even if he risked everything now and told his true identity. Miles might turn away from him in disgust. Miles, who could never stoop to a dishonourable act. Carstairs felt that he would bear anything sooner than face this man's scorn. "'Never tell me tis a dumb man ye are, for I heard ye shout meself. Do ye give me your word of honour, or must I have ye bound?' Carstairs pulled himself together and set his teeth as he faced the inevitable. Escape was impossible. Miles would shoot, he felt sure, and then his disguise would be torn away, and his friend would see that Jack Carstairs was nothing but a common highwayman. Whatever happened, that must not be, 
for the sake of the name and Richard. So he quietly held out his hands. I, I give my word, but you can bind me if you choose. It was his highwayman's voice, ruckus and totally unlike his own. But O'Hara's eyes were fixed on the slender white hands held out to him. In his usual haphazard fashion, Jack had quite forgotten to grime his hands. They were shapely and white and carefully manicured. Miles took either wrist in his large hand and turned them palm upwards in the moonlight. Singularly white hands ye have, for one in your profession. He drawled and tightened his hold as Jack tried to draw them away. No, ye do not. Now be so good as to step within me, friend. Jack held back an instant. My mare? he asked and O'Hara noted the anxiety in his voice. "'Ye need not be after worrying about her,' he said. "'George!' the footman sprang forward. "'Yes, sir. I want you to ride her home. Can you do it? Yes, sir.' "'I doubt it,' murmured Jack. So did Jenny. She refused Point Blake to allow this stranger to mount her. Her master had left her in one spot, and there she would stand until he chose to bid her move. In vain did the groom coax and coerce. She ran round him and seemed a transformed creature. She laid her ears flat and gnashed at the bit, ready to lash out furiously at the first opportunity. Jack watched the man's futile struggles with the ghost of a smile about his lips. "'Jenny,' he said quietly, and O'Hara looked round at him sharply, frowning. Unconsciously, he had spoken naturally, and the voice was faintly familiar. Jenny twitched the bridle from the perspiring groom and minced up to the prisoner. "'Would ye allow me to have a hand free, sir?' he asked. "'Maybe I can manage her.' Without a word, Miles released him, and he caught the bridle murmuring something unintelligible to the now quiet animal. O'Hara watched the beautiful hand stroke her muzzle reassuringly and frowned again. "'No ordinary highwayman, this. Mount her now, will ye?' Jack flung at the groom, and kept a warning hand on the rein as the man obeyed. With a final pat, he turned away. "'She'll do now, sir,' O'Hara nodded. "'You've trained her well. Get in, please.' Jack obeyed, and in a minute or two O'Hara jumped in after him, and the coach began to move forward. For a while there was silence. Carstairs keeping himself well under control, it was almost unbearable to think that after this brief drive he would never set eyes on his friend again, and he wanted so badly to turn and grasp that strong hand. Miles turned in his seat, and tried to see that masked face in the darkness. "'Ye are a gentleman?' he asked, going straight to the point. Jack was prepared for this. "'Me, sir? Lord, no, sir. I do not believe ye. Don't be forgetting I've seen your hands.' "'Hands, sir?' in innocent bewilderment. "'Sure. You don't think I'd be believing ye are an ordinary rogue with hands like that?' "'I don't rightly understand ye, sir.' Be jibbers, then. You'll be understanding me tomorrow. Tomorrow, sir? Certainly. You may as well tell me now as then. I'm not such a daft fool as I look, and I know a gentleman when I see one, even when he does growl at me as you do, he chuckled. And I did not feel I knew ye when you spoke to the mare. I'd be loath to send a friend to the gallows. How well Jack knew that soft, persuasive voice. His hands clenched as he forced himself to answer. "'I don't think I've ever seen you before, sir.' "'Maybe you have not. We shall see to-morrow.' "'What do you mean by to-morrow, sir?' ventured Carstairs uneasily. "'Sure. You will have the honour of appearing before me, my friend.' "'Before you, sir.' "'Why not? I'm a justice of the peace. Heaven save the mark.' There was a breathless pause, and then at last the funny side of it struck Jack, and his shoulders shook with suppressed laughter. The exquisite irony of it was almost too much for him. He, the Earl of Wincham, was to be formally questioned by his friend St. Michael's O'Hara, J.P. "'What ails ye now, man? You find it amusing?' asked Miles, surprised. "'Oh, Lord, yes!' gasped Jack, and collapsed into his corner. End of chapter 8 Recording by Tara Mendoza Phoenix, Arizona August 2011
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tara Mendoza. The Black Moth by Georgette Hare. Chapter 9. Lady O'Hara Intervenes. Lady O'Hara found that her big indolent husband was unusually silent next morning at breakfast. She had not been married long enough to consent to being practically ignored, no matter what the time of day, but she had been married quite long enough to know that before she took any direct action against him, she must first allow him to assuage his appetite. Accordingly, she plied him with coffee and eggs, and with a satisfied and slightly motherly air watched him attack a sirloin of beef. She was a pretty bird-like little lady, with big eyes and soft brown curls escaping from under a demure but very becoming mob-cap. She measured five foot nothing in her stockings, and was sometimes referred to by her large husband as the midget. Needless to say, this flippant appellation was in no wise encouraged by the lady. She decided that Miles had come to the end of his repast, and planting two dimpled elbows on the table, she rested her small chin in her hands, and looked across at him with something of the air of an inquisitive kitten. Miles! O'Hara leaned back in his chair, and at the sight of her fresh prettiness his brow cleared, and he smiled. Well, Astor! A reproachful finger was raised, and a pair of red lips pouted adorably. Now, Miles, confess you've been vastly disagreeable this morning. Twice have I spoken to you and you've not troubled to answer me. No, I let me finish. And once you growled at me like a nasty bear, yes, sir, you did. Did I now, Molly? Tis a surly brute you're after thinking me, then. Troth, I've been sore perplexed, me dear. Lady O'Hara got up and sidled round to him. Have you so, Miles? He flung an arm about her and drew her on to his knee. Sure, yes, Molly. Well, then, Miles— had you not better tell me what it is that troubles you? She coaxed, laying a persuasive hand on his shoulder. He smiled up at her. "'Tis just an inquisitive puss you are. Again the pout. And ye should not pout your pretty lips at me if you were not wanting me to kiss them. He added, suiting the action to the word. "'But of course I do,' cried my lady, returning the kiss with fervour. "'Nay, Miles, tell me.' I see you mean to have the whole tale out of me. So, to be sure I do, she nodded. He laid a warning finger on her lips and summoned up a mighty frown. Now, will you be done interrupting, me lady? Not a whit abashed, she bit the finger, pushed it away, and folding her hands in her lap, cast her eyes meekly heavenwards. With the twinkle in his own eyes, the Irishman continued. Well, Alana. You must know that yesterday evening I was at Kilroy's on a matter of business, and that reminds me. Molly, we had a hand or two, or Pharaoh, and the like before I left, and I had very distressing luck. On a sudden, my lady's demure air vanished. Is that so, Miles? I make no doubt the stakes were prodigious high. Pray, how much have you lost? Wished, darling. Tis a mere trifle, I assure you. Well, as I was saying, on me way home, what should happen— but that we be hailed up by one of these high women. Milady's eyes widened in horror, and two little hands clutched at his coat. Oh, Miles! His arm tightened round her waist. Sure, Astor, I'm still alive to tell the tale, though tis not far I'll be getting with you interrupting it every moment. But, Miles, how terrible! You might have been killed, and you never told me. Twas monstrous wicked of you, darling. Faith, Molly, how should I be telling you, when twas yourself that was fast asleep? Now will you wished? She nodded obediently and dimpled. Well, as I was saying, here was this man a-standing in the road, pointing his pistol at me. But will ye believe me, me love, when I tell you that that same pistol was as empty as me own? Here he was a-shaking with laughter. Lord, Molly, twas the drollest thing. I had me pistol in me hand no and twas unloaded, and wondering what the devil, saving your presence, was to do next, when the idea struck me that I should try to bluff me fine sir. So I cried out that his pistol was unloaded and completely took him by surprise. Sure he hadn't taken time to ask himself how the devil I should be a knowing that. He dropped it on the road after. Miles, you're becoming very Irish. Never say so, Alana. After that. "'Twas simple enough, and me lord gave in. 
He held out his hands for me to bind, and here's where tis puzzling, Molly. I saw that they were a prodigious sight too white, and fine for an ordinary highwayman, so I taxed him with it. "'Twas a gentleman in disguise. How splendid, Miles! Will ye hold your tongue, Astor, and not be spoiling me story on me? Oh, indeed, I am sorry. I will be good. And he started and seemed monstrous put out. What's more, me dear, I heard him speak to his mare in an ordinary gentleman's voice. Molly, you never saw the like of that same mare. The sweetest. Pray never mind the mare, dear. I am all agog to hear about the gentleman highwayman. Very well, me love, though twas a prodigious fine mare. When I heard him speak, it flashed across me brain that I knew him. No, you don't, Molly. His hand was over her mouth as he spoke, and her eyes danced madly. But I could not for the life of me think where I had heard that voice. Twas but the word I heard him speak, ye understand. And when I held his wrist, I felt that twas no stranger. And yet tis impossible, when I got him within the coach. How imprudent he might have wished now. When I got him within the coach, I tried to worm his identity out of him, but twas to no avail. But when I told him he would have to appear before me to-day, he went off into a fit of laughing, and not another word could I get out of him after beyond, yes, sir, and no, sir. Still I felt twas the gentleman all the same, so I— He was enveloped in a rapturous embrace. You dear Miles, you let him escape. Sure, Alonna, is it meself that we be doing the like, and me a justice of the peace withal? I told them not to handcuff me, lord. Oh, I do so wish you would let him escape. But if tis really a gentleman, you will. I will not, then, Astor. I'll be sending him to await the assises. You are very cruel, then. But, me darling, and I wish to get off your knee. He drew her close. I'll see what can be done for your protege, Molly. But don't be forgetting he tried to kill the only husband you have. He watched the effect of this with that humorous twinkle in his eye, but my lady was not to be put off. "'With an empty pistol! Fie on you, Miles! And may I hide behind the screen while you question him?' "'You may not. But I wish so much to see him.' O'Hara shook his head with an air of finality. She knew full well. However easy-going and good-natured her husband might be, there were times when he was impervious to all blandishments. So after darkly hinting that she would be nearer than he imagined, she gave up the contest to go and visit young Master David in his nursery. For some time in lock-up Carstairs had cudgelled his brain to think out a possible mode of escape next day, but try as he might he could light on nothing. If only Miles were not to question him, it was hardly likely that he would be allowed to retain his mask, yet therein lay his only chance of preserving his incognito. He prayed that by some merciful providence O'Hara would either fail to recognize him, or would at least pretend that he did not. Having decided that there was nothing further to be done in the matter, he lay down on his extreme hard pallet, and went to sleep as if he had not a care in the world. Next morning, after a long and wordy argument with the head Gaylor on the subject of masks, he was hailed in triumph to the house. As the little cavalcade was about to ascend the steps that led to the front door, my lady O'Hara came gaily forth, carrying a basket and a pair of scissors, and singing a snatch of song. At the sight of the highwayman the song broke off, and her red lips formed a long-drawn, Oh! She stood quite still on the top step, gazing down at my lord. The two gaylors stood aside to allow her to come down, just as a greyhound darted up the steps and flung itself against her, in an exuberance of joy. Milady, none too securely balanced, reeled. The basket fell from her arm, her foot missed the next step, and she tumbled headlong down. But in the flash of an eyelid, Carstairs had sprung forward and received her in his arms. He lowered her gently to the ground. "'I trust you are not hurt, madame,' he asked, and retrieved her basket, handing it to her. Molly took it with a smile. "'I thank you, sir, not at all.' though I fear I should have injured myself quite considerably had you not been so swift in catching me. T'was most kind of you, I am sure. She extended her small hand, and her eyes devoured him. For a moment my lord hesitated, and then sweeping off his hat, he bowed low over the hand. "'Twas less than nothing, madame,' he said in his own cultivated voice. 
I beg you will dismiss it from your mind. He straightened himself as the Gaylors came forward and put his hat on again. Lady O'Hara stepped aside and watched them disappear into the house. Her cheeks were rather flushed, and her eyes suspiciously bright. Suddenly she nodded her head decisively, and throwing away her luckless basket, hurried across the lawn, and entered the house through a long window. My lord was conducted to the library where O'Hara sat awaiting him, and slouched forward with his hands thrust deep into his pockets and his hat still on his head. The head Gaylor eyed him gloomily, and looked pained when Carstairs, with studied boorishness, leaned carelessly against a fine carved table. "'We have refrained from handcuffing prisoners, sir, your orders,' he said, in a tone that warned O'Hara that should harm come of it, on his head be the blame. Miles nodded, he said pleasantly, and glanced at the cloak and masked figure before him with more suspicion than ever. But. "'I regret to have to report very obstinate behaviour on part of prisoner, sir,' added the Gaylor impressively. "'Indeed,' said Miles gravely. "'How so?' Jack controlled an insane desire to laugh, and listened to the Gaylor's complaint. "'You see, the prisoner, sir, with that great mask on his face, afore we set out to come here, I told him to take it off, and he refused. Sir, seeing as how you gave no orders, I did not force him to obey.' "'Ah! Your name, please?' "'John Smith, sir,' answered Carstairs promptly and hoarsely. O'Hara wrote it down with a sceptical smile on his lips that Jack did not quite like. "'Perhaps you will have the goodness to unmask.' There was a momentary silence. "'Why, sir? I thought you might allow me to keep it on.' "'Did you now? I will not be allowing any such thing.' "'But, sir, tis impossible.' "'Off with it. "'Sir, if you don't take it off, "'I shall ask these men to assist ye,' warned Miles. "'May I not speak with ye alone, sir?' pleaded Jack. "'By now O'Hara was greatly intrigued. "'Ye may not. Unmask. "'He was leaning half across the table, "'his eyes fixed on Jack's face. "'With a quaint little laugh that made O'Hara's brows contract swiftly, "'my lord shrugged his shoulders, French fashion.' and obeyed. The mask and hat were tossed lightly on to the table, and Miles found himself gazing into a pair of blue eyes that met his half defiantly, half imploringly. He drew in his breath sharply, and the thin ivory rule he held snapped suddenly between his fingers, and at that crucial moment a door behind him that had stood ajar was pushed open, and my lady O'Hara came tripping into the room. The two Gaylors and her husband turned at once to see who it was, while Jack, who had recognized her, but had not the least idea who she was, fell to testing his boots with his handkerchief. O'Hara rose, and for once looked severe. "'What?' he began, and stopped, for without so much as a glance at him, my lady ran towards the prisoner, crying, "'Harry! Oh, Harry!' Jack gathered that he was the person addressed, and instantly made her an elaborate leg. The next moment she was tugging at the lapels of his coat with her face upturned to his. "'Harry, you wicked boy!' she cried, and added beneath her breath, "'My name is Molly.' A laugh sprang to my lord's eyes, and his beautiful smile appeared. In a stupefied fashion O'Hara watched him steal an arm about her waist and place a hand beneath her chin. The next instant a kiss was planted full on the little lady's lips, and he heard Jack Carstairs' voice exclaim, "'Fie on you, Molly!' "'For a spoil sport. Here had I fooled Miles to the top of my bent and pone rep. He scarce knows me yet.' My lady had disengaged herself, blushing. "'Oh, Miles, you do know Harry, my cousin Harry.' O'Hara collected his scattered wits and rose nobly to the occasion. "'Of course I do, my dear. Though at first he gave me such a shock, I was near dumbfounded. You are a mad scatterbrained fellow, to play such a trick upon us, devil ye take ye.' He laid his hands on Jack's shoulders. "'Pray, pray, what did you do it for, boy?' Jack's brain worked swiftly. "'Why, Miles, never tell me you forgot our wager. Did I not swear I'd have you at a disadvantage to be even with you for that night at Jasper's? But what must you do but see my pistol was unloaded and make me lose my wager? Still, t'was worth that in a nightingale to see your face when I unmasked.' Harry shook him slightly, laughing, and turned to the two amazed Gaylors. The senior Gaylor met his humorous glance with a cold and indignant stare, and gave a prodigious sniff. <laughs> "'Me good fellows,' drawled Miles, 
I'm mighty sorry you've been worried over me young cousin here. He's fooled us all, it appears, but now there's not to be done in the matter, though I've a mind to send him to await the next sessions. He slipped a guinea into each curiously ready palm, and replied to the head Gaylor's haughty bow with a pleasant nod. In silence he watched them leave the room, shaking their heads over the incomprehensible ways of the gentry. Then he turned and looked across at Carstairs. End of chapter 9 Recording by Tara Mendoza Phoenix, Arizona August 2011Chapter Ten of the Black Moth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tara Mendoza. The Black Moth by Georgette Hare. Chapter Ten. Lady O'Hara retires. For a long minute, silence reigned all three actors in the little comedy listening to the heavy footsteps retreating down the passage carstairs with one arm still around the lady's waist and a rather strained look on his face molly instinctively felt that something beyond her kin was in the air and glanced fearfully up at the white face above her the expression in the blue eyes fixed on her husband made her turn sharply to look at him she found that he was staring at my lord as though he saw a ghost she wanted to speak to relieve the tension but all words stuck in her throat, and she could only watch the denouement breathlessly. At last O'Hara moved, coming slowly towards them, reading John's countenance. Some of the wonder went out of his face, and as if he sensed the other's agony of mind, he smiled suddenly, and laid his hands once more on the straight, stiff shoulders. "'Jack, ye rascal! What do ye mean? By hugging and kissing me wife under me very eyes!' Molly all at once remembered the position of her cousin Harry's arm, and gave a little gasp, whisking herself away. My lord put out his hands and strove to thrust his friend off. "'Miles, don't forget. Don't forget what I am.' The words were forced out, but his head was held high. "'There are nouns, man, and it is meself that'll be caring what ye may or may not be. Oh, Jack, Jack, I'm so pleased to see ye that I could scarce realise tis yourself I am looking at. When did you come to England? And what a plague are you doing in this costume? He jerked his head to where John's mask lay, and wrung the hand he held as though he would never stop. I've been in England a year. As to the mask, he shrugged and laughed. Lady O'Hara pushed him between them. But please, I do not understand, she said plaintively. Carstairs bowed over her hand. "'May I be permitted to thank you for your kindly intervention, my lady, and to congratulate Miles on his marriage?' She dimpled charmingly and curtsied. Her husband caught her round the waist. "'Ay, the saucy minx! Oh, me cousin Harry, forsooth! If it had been any one but Jack, I should be angry with ye, Astor, for twas a wicked trick to play entirely.' She patted his hand and smiled across at Jack. "'Of course!' I would never have done such a forward thing, had I not known that he was indeed a gentleman, and had he not saved me from sudden death, she added as an afterthought. Miles looked sharply round at her, then at Carstairs. What's this? My lady exaggerates, smiled my lord. Tis merely that I had the honour to catch her as she fell down the steps this morning. O'Hara looked relieved. You're not hurt, Alana. Gracious, no. But I had to do something to show my gratitude. "'And I was sure that you would never expose my fraud, so I—' "'But as a sudden thought struck her, "'you seem to know my highwayman. "'Sure, and I do, Molly. "'Tis none other than Jack Carstairs, of whom you've heard me often speak.' "'She turned round eyes of wondering upon my lord. "'Can it be? "'Is it possible that you are my husband's dearest friend, Lord John?' "'Jack flushed and bowed. "'I was once, madam,' he said stiffly. "'Once?' she scoffed oh if you could but hear him speak of you but i'll let you hear him speak to you which perhaps you'll enjoy more i know you've a prodigious great deal to say to one another so i shall run away and leave you alone she smiled graciously upon him blew an airy kiss to her husband and went quickly out of the room carstairs closed the door behind her and came back to o'hara who had flung himself back into his chair trying manlike to conceal the excitement he was feeling Come. "'Sit ye down, Jack, and let me have the whole story.' My lord divested himself of his long cloak, and shook out his hitherto tucked-up ruffles. 
From the pocket of his elegant scarlet riding-coat he drew a snuff-box, which he opened languidly, with his eyes resting quizzically on O'Hara's face. He took a delicate pinch of snuff and minced across the room. Miles laughed. "'What's this?' "'This, my dear friend, is Sir Anthony Ferndale Bart.' He bowed with great flourish. "'Ye look it. But come over here, Sir Anthony Ferndale Bart, and tell me everything.' Jack perched on the edge of the desk and swung his leg. "'Well, really, I do not think there is much to tell that you do not already know, Miles. "'You know all about Dare's card-party, for instance, precisely six years ago.' "'Tis just exactly what I do not know,' retorted O'Hara. "'You surprise me. I thought the tale was rife. "'Now, Jack, will you have done drawling at me? "'Don't be forgetting I'm your friend. "'But are you? "'If you know the truth about me, do you feel inclined to call me friend?' There never was a time when I would not have been proud to call you friend, as ye would very well have known, had ye been aught for a damned young hothead. I heard that crazy tale about the car party, but do you think I'd be believing it? It was the obvious thing to do. Maybe. But I fancy I know ye just a little too well to believe in a cock and bull story I'm told about ye. And if I had been fool enough to have believed it, do you think I'd be going back on ye? Sure, tis a poor friend I'd be. Jack stared down at the toe of his right boot in silence. "'I know something more than we guessed happened at that same party, and I have me suspicions, but tis your affair, and whatever you do, you had your reasons for. But, Jack, why in the name of wonder must you fly off to the devil or no one knows where, without so much as a good-bye to any one?' Carstairs never raised his eyes from the contemplation of that boot. He spoke with difficulty. "'Miles, in my place—' "'Would you not have done the same?' "'Well, you know you would. "'Was it likely that I should inflict myself on you at such a time? "'What would you have thought of me had I done so?' "'O'Hara brought his hand down smartly on the other's knee. "'I'd have thought ye less of a young fool. "'I would have gone away with ye, and nothing would have stopped me.' "'Jack looked up and met his eyes. "'I know,' he said. "'Twas the thought of that, and—and and I could not be sure.' How should I know whether you would even receive me? Last night, last night I was horribly afraid. The hand on his knee tightened. You foolish boy. You foolish boy. Bit by bit he drew the story of the past six years out of Carstairs, and though it was a very modified version, Miles understood his friend well enough to read between the lines. And now, said Jack, when the recital was over, tell me about yourself. When did you marry the attractive lady whom I have just been kissing? "'Ye rogue! I married Molly three years ago. "'Tis a real darling she is, isn't she? "'And upstairs there's a little chap, your godson. "'You lucky fellow, my godson, you say. "'Could you not find any one more worthy for that? "'I want to see him.' "'So you shall, presently. "'Have you seen Richard?' "'A year ago I held up his coach. "'Twas dark, and I could scarce see him. "'But I thought he seemed aged.' "'Aged?' You wouldn't be after knowing him. Tis an old man he is, though I swear tis no wonder with that hussy about the house. Lord Jack, you were all out of that affair with her ladyship. Carstairs nursed his foot reflectively. Lavinia, what ails her? Not that I know of, save it be her shrewish temper. Tis a dog's life she leads poor Dick. Do you mean to say she does not love Dick? I cannot say. Sometimes she is as affectionate as you please. But at others she treats him to a fine exhibition of rage and the money she spends. Of course, she married him for what she should get. There was never anything else to count with her. Jack sat very still. And any one but a young fool like yourself would have seen that. A gleam of amusement shot into the wistful blue eyes. Probably. Yourself, for instance. O'Hara chuckled. Oh, I, I knew. T'was the money she was after all along. And now there's not so much, it seems, as Dick won't touch a penny that belongs to you. Hm. Warburton told me. Foolish of him. A grunt was the sole response. Jack's eyes narrowed a little as he gazed out of the window. So Lavinia never cared. Lord, what a mix-up. And Dick? I'm afraid he still does. Poor old Dick. Devil take the woman. Does she bully him? I know what he is. Always ready to give in. I am not so sure. Yet I'll swear if twere not for John his life would be a misery, 
He misses you, Jack. Who is John? Did not Warburton tell you? John is the hope of the house. He's four and a half and as spoilt a little rascal as you could wish for. Dick's child? Good Lord! Aye, Dick's child, and your nephew. He broke off and looked into the other's face. Jack, cannot this mystery be cleared up? Couldn't you go back? He was clasping Jack's hand, but it was withdrawn, and the eyes looked down into his, were suddenly bored and a little cold. "'I know of no mystery,' said Carstairs. "'Jack, old man, will you be after shutting me out of your confidence?' A faint, sweet smile curved the fine lips. "'Let us talk of the weather, Miles, or my mare. Anything rather than this painful subject.' With an impatient movement, O'Hara flung back his chair and strode over to the window with his back to my lord. Jack's eyes followed him seriously. "'If ye cannot trust me, sure of no more to say to then, flashed O'Hara. "'It seems ye do not value your friends too highly.' My lord said never a word, but the hand that rested on the desk clenched suddenly. O'Hara wheeled about and came back to his side. "'Sure, Jack, I've never meant that. Forgive me bad temper.' Carstairs slipped off the table and straightened himself, linking his arm in the Irishman's. "'Waste, Miles, as you'd say yourself,' he laughed. "'I know that. Tis not that I don't trust you, but—' "'I understand. I'll not ask you any more about it at all. Instead, answer me this. What made you come out with unloaded pistols?' The laugh died out of Carstairs' face. "'Oh, just carelessness,' he answered shortly. And he thought of the absent Jim with a tightening of the lips. "'Twas that very same reason for meself, then?' Jack stared at him. "'Miles, don't tell me yours were unloaded, too. "'Deed, and they were. E God, Jack! "'Tis the best joke I've heard for a twelve-month.' They both started to laugh. "'Sure, to was bluff on my part, Jack, when I told ye yours were unloaded, "'and me lady was determined to set ye free from the moment I told her all about it this morning. "'We were sure ye were no ordinary highwayman.' though I was a fool not to have known you right away, but now I have found you out. You'll stay with us, Cousin Harry. I cannot thank you enough, Miles, but I will not do that. I must get back to Jim. And who the devil is Jim? My servant. They have been worried nigh to death over me. No, I do not press me. I could not stay here, Miles. You must see for yourself it is impossible. Jack Carstairs does not exist. Only Anthony Ferndale is left. "'Jack, dear man, can I not? "'No, Miles, you can do nothing. "'Though tis like you want to help, and I do thank you. "'But, oh, well, what about my mare? "'Plague take me if I'd not forgotten. "'Jack, that scoundrel of mine let her strain her fetlock. "'I'm damn sorry. "'Poor Jenny. "'I swear she gave him an exciting ride, though. "'I'll be trying to buy her off ye, Jack, if I see much of her. "'Tis a little beauty she is. "'I'm not selling, though I intended to ask you to keep her, if—' A quick pressure on his arm arrested him. That will do. I'm too heavy for her anyway. So was that devil of a groom you put on her. I am a fool. I always knew that. Wished now, Jack. You'll have to take one of my nags while she heals, if you won't stay with us. Can you trust her to me for a week, do you suppose? I don't know. It seems as though I must. Oh, I retract. I retract. You are altogether too large. The day is too hot, and my cravat too nicely tied. Egad, Miles, I wish I—I I wish we were boys again, and— Yes, when may I see your son and heir? Sure, you may come now and find Molly, who will be aching for the sight of you. After you, Sir Anthony Ferndale Bart. End of chapter 10 Recording by Tara Mendoza Phoenix, Arizona, August 2011《ハッピーのブラックモーツ》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tara Mendoza.《ハッピーのブラックモーツ》by George Edhair.《My Lord Turns Rescuer and Comes Nigh Ending His Life》Late that afternoon, Carstairs left Thur's house on one of his friend's horses. He waved a very regretful farewell to O'Hara and his lady, promising to let them know his whereabouts and to visit them again soon. 
O'Hara had extracted a solemn promise that if ever he got into difficulties he would let him know. "'For I'm not letting ye drift gaily out of me life again, and that's flat.' Jack had assented gladly enough. To have a friend once more was such bliss, and had given Miles the name of the inn and the village where he would find him, for O'Hara had insisted on bringing the mare over himself. So Carstairs rode off to Trencham and to Jim, with the memory of a very hearty handshake in his mind. He smiled a little as he thought of his friend's words when he had shown himself reluctant to give the required promise. "'Ye obstinate young devil! You'll do as I say and no nonsense, or you don't leave this house!' For six years no one had ordered him to obey. It had been he who had done all the ordering. Somehow it was very pleasant to be told what to do, especially by Miles. He turned down a lane and wondered what Jim was thinking. That he was waiting at the green man, he was certain, for those had been his orders. He was annoyed with the man over the incident of the pistols, for he had inspected them and discovered that they were indeed unloaded. Had his captor been other than O'Hara, on whom he could not fire, such carelessness might have proved his undoing. Apart from that, culpable negligence always roused his wrath. A rather warm twenty minutes was in store for Salter. For quite an hour Carstairs proceeded on his way with no mishaps, nor adventures, and then suddenly as he rounded a corner of a deserted road, little more than a cart-track, an extraordinary sight met his eyes. In the middle of the road stood a coach, and by it, covering the men on the box with two large pistols, was a seedy-looking ruffian, while two others were engaged in what appeared to be a life-and-death struggle at the coach door. Jack reined in his horse and rose in his stirrups to obtain a better view. Then his eyes flashed, and he whistled softly to himself, for the cause of all the turmoil was a slight, graceful girl of not more than nineteen or twenty. She was frenziedly resisting the efforts of her captors to drag her to another coach, further up the road. Jack could see that she was dark and very lovely. Another elderly lady was most valiantly impeding operations by clawing and striking at one of the men's arms, scolding and imploring all in one breath. Jack's gaze went from her to a still silent figure at the side of the road in the shadow of the hedge, evidently the stage manager. "'It seems I must take a hand in this,' he told himself, and laughed joyously as he fixed on his mask and dismounted. He tethered his mount to a young sapling, took a pistol from its holster, and ran softly and swiftly under the lee of the hedge up to the scene of disaster, just as the man who covered the unruly and vociferous pair on the box made ready to fire. Jack's bullet took him neatly in the neck, and without a sound he crumpled up, one of his pistols exploding harmlessly as it fell to earth. With an oath, the silent onlooker wheeled round to face the point of my lord's gleaming blade. Carstairs drew in his breath sharply in surprise as he saw the white face of his grace of Andover. "'Damn you!' said Tracy calmly, and sprang back, whipping out his own rapier. "'Certainly,' agreed Jack pleasantly. "'On God, im le du. Tracy's lips curled back in a snarl. His eyes were almost shut. Over his shoulder he ordered curtly, "'Keep watch over the girl. I will attend to this young jackanapes.' On the word the blades clashed. Jack's eyes danced with the sheer joy of battle, and his point snicked in and out wickedly. He knew Tracy of old for an expert swordsman, and he began wearily. The girl's persecutors retained a firm hold on either arm, but all their thoughts were centred on the duel. The men on the box got out their blunderbuss, ready to fire should the need arise, and the girl herself watched breathlessly, red lips parted, and eyes aglow with fright indignation, and excitement. As for the old lady, she positively bobbed up and down, shrieking encouragement to Carstairs. The blades hissed continuously against one another, for time after time the duke thrust viciously and ever his point was skilfully parried. He was absolutely calm, and his lips sneered. Who it was that he was fighting, he had not the faintest idea. He only knew that his opponent had recognized him, and must be speedily silenced. Therefore he fought with deadly grimness and purpose. Carstairs, on the other hand, had no intention of killing his grace. He had never liked him in the old days, but he was far too good-natured to contemplate any serious bloodshed. He was so used to Tracy's little affairs that he had not been filled with surprise when he discovered who the silent figure was. He did not like interfering with Belmanoir, but on the other hand 
he could no more stand by and see a woman assaulted than he could fly. So he fought on with the idea of disarming his grace, so as to have him at a disadvantage, and to be able to command his withdrawal from the scene. Once he fainted cleverly and lunged, and a little blood trickled down over the duke's hand. No sign made Belmanoir, except that his eyelids flickered a moment, and his play became more careful. Once the duke thrust in fierce, and Jack's sword-arm wavered an instant, and a splash of crimson appeared on his sleeve. He, for the most part, remained on the defensive, waiting for the duke to tire. Soon his grace's breath began to come unevenly and fast, and beads of moisture started on his forehead. Yet never did the sneer fade, nor his temper go. He had himself well in hand, and although his face was livid and his brain on fire with fury, no trace of it showed itself in his sword-play. Then Carstairs changed his tactics, and began to put into practice all the arts and subtleties of fence that he had learned abroad. He seemed made of steel and set on wire, so agile and untirable was he. Time after time he leapt nimbly aside, evading some wicked thrust, and all the while he was driving his grace back and back. He was not panting, and now and again he laughed softly and happily. The blood from the wound on his arm was dripping steadily on to the ground, Yet it seemed to Tracy to affect him not at all, but Jack himself knew that he was losing strength rapidly, and must make an end. Suddenly he fainted and fell back. Tracy saw his advantage and pressed forward within the wavering sword point. The next instant his sword was whirled from his grasp, and he lay on the ground unhurt but helpless, gazing up at the masked face and at the shortened rapier. How he had been thrown he did not know but that his opponent was a past master in the art of fence he was perfectly sure. My lord gave a little chuckle, and twisted a handkerchief about his wounded arm. "'I am aware, monsieur, that this is most unusual, and in duels forbidden. But I am sure that my lord will agree that these circumstances are also most unusual, and the odds almost overwhelming.' He turned his head to the two men of one, whom released his hold on the girl's arm and started forward. "'Oh, no!' drawled my lord, shaking his head. "'Another step, and I spit your master where he lies.' "'Stand,' said his grace calmly. "'Bien. Throw your arms down, here at my feet, and, uh, release mademoiselle.' They made no move to obey, and my lord shrugged deprecatingly lowering his point to Tracy's throat. "'Eh bien!' They still hesitated, casting anxious glances at their master. "'Obey!' ordered the Duke. Each man threw down a pistol, eyeing Jack furtively, while the girl ran to her aunt, who began to soothe and fuss over her. Jack stifled a yawn. Ah, "'It is not my intention to remain here all night. Neither am I a child or a fool.' Dépêches. Belmanoir saw that the coachman had his blunderbuss ready and was only too eager to fire it, and he knew that the game was up. He turned his head towards the reluctant bullies who looked to him for orders. "'Throw down everything,' he advised. Two more pistols and two daggers joined their comrades. "'A thousand thanks,' bowed my lord, running a quick eye over the men. "'In le duc, I play be still. Now you with the lash nose. Yes, mon ami, you. Go pick up the pistol our defunct friend dropped. The man indicated slouched over to the dead body and flung another pistol onto the heap. My lord shook his head impatiently. Mais non, have I not said that I am not entirely a fool? The unexploded pistol, please. You will place it here, do ces men? Very good. His eye travelled to the men on the box. The coachman touched his hat and cried, "'I'm ready, sir.' "'It is very well. Be so good as to keep these gentlemen covered, but do not fire until I give the order. And now, M. le Duc, have I your parole that you will return swiftly from whence you came, leaving this lady unmolested, and I permit you to rise?' Tracy moved his head impatiently. I have no choice. Monsieur, that is not an answer. Ever your peril. 
"'Yes, curse you.' "'But certainly,' said Jack politely. "'Play, rise.' He rested his sword-point on the ground and watched Tracy struggle to his feet. For an instant the Duke stood staring at him with face slightly outthrust. "'I almost think I know you,' he said softly, caressingly. Jack's French accent became a shade more pronounced. "'It is possible.' I at least have the misfortune to know Monsieur by sight. Tracy ignored the insult and continued very, very silkily. One thing is certain. I shall know you again if I meet you. Even as the words left his mouth, Jack saw the pistol in his hand and sprang quickly to one side, just in time to escape a shot that would have gone straight through his head. As it was, it caught him in his left shoulder. Do not fire! He called sharply to the coachman and bowed to his grace. "'As I was saying, monsieur, do not let me detain you, I beg.' The duke's green eyes flashed venom for a minute, and then the heavy lids descended over them again, and he returned the bow, exaggeratedly. "'Au revoir, monsieur.' He smiled and bent to pick up his sword. "'It will not be necessary for monsieur to take his sword,' said Jack. I have a desire to keep it as a souvenir, yes? As you will, monsieur, replied Tracy carelessly, and walked away to his coach, his men following close on his heels. My lord stood leaning heavily on his sword, watching them go, and not until the coach had swung out of sight did he give way to the weakness that was overwhelming him. Then he reeled and would have fallen had it not been for two cool hands that caught his steadying him. A tremulous, husky voice sounded in his ears. "'You are hurt. Ah, oh, sir, you are hurt for my sake.' With a great effort, Jack controlled the inclination to swoon, and lifted the girl's hand shakily to his lips. "'It is a pleasure, mademoiselle,' he managed to gasp. Diana slipped an arm under his shoulder and cast an anxious glance at the footman, hurrying towards them. "'Quick!' she commanded. "'Sir, you are faint.' "'You must allow my servant to assist you to the coach.' Jack forced a smile. "'It is nothing. I assure you. Pray do not. I—' And he fainted comfortably away into stout Thomas's arms. "'Carry him into the coach, Thomas,' ordered the girl. "'Mind his arm. And, oh, his poor shoulder. And have you something to bind his wounds with?' Miss Betty hurried forward. "'My darling child, what an escape!' The dear, brave gentleman. Do have a care, Thomas. Yes, lay him on the seat. My lord was lowered gently on to the cushions, and Miss Betty fluttered over to him like a distracted hen. Then Diana told Thomas to take charge of my lord's horse, that they could see, quietly nibbling the grass further down the road, stooped and picked up his grace of Andover's sword, with its curiously wrought hilt, and jumped into the coach to help Miss Betty to attend to Jack's wounds. The slash on the arm was not serious, but where the pistol had taken him was very ugly-looking. While she saw to that, Miss Betty loosened the cravat and removed my lord's mask. "'Die! See what a handsome boy tis! The poor brave gentleman! What a lucky thing he came up! If only this bleeding would stop!' So she ran on, hunting wildly for her salts. Diana looked up as her aunt finished and steadied the pale face lying against the dark cushions. She noted the firm, beautifully curved mouth, the aristocratic nose, and delicately penciled eyebrows, with a little thrill. The duel had set her every nerve tingling. She was filled with admiration for her preserver, and the sight of his sensitive, handsome countenance did nothing to dispel that admiration. She held the salts to his nostrils, and watched eagerly for some sign of life, but none was forthcoming and she had to be content with placing cushions beneath his injured shoulder and guarding him as best she might from the jolts caused by the uneven surface of the road. Miss Betty bustled about and did all she could to staunch the bleeding, and when they had comfortably settled my lord, she sat down upon the seat opposite and nodded decisively. "'We can do no more, my dear. But, yes, certainly bathe his forehead with your lavender water. Dear me, what an escape!' I must say I would never have thought it of Mr. Everard. One would say we were living in the Stone Age. The wretch! Diana shuddered. I knew he was dreadful, but never knew how dreadful. How can he have found out when we were to leave Bath? And why did he waylay us so near home? 
Oh, I shall never be safe again. Nonsense, my dear. Fiddlesticks. You saw how easily he was vanquished. Depend upon it, he will realise that he has made a bad mistake to try to abduct you, and we shall not be worried with him again. With this comfortable assurance, she nodded again, and leant back against the cushions, watching her niece's ministrations with a professional and slightly amused air. End of chapter 11 Recording by Tara Mendoza Phoenix, Arizona, August 2011「Twelve of the Black Moth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tara Mendoza. The Black Moth by Georgette Hare. Chapter 12. My Lord Dictates a Letter and Receives a Visitor. My Lord came sighing back to life. He opened his eyes wearily and turned his head. A faint feeling of surprise stole over him. He was in a room he had never been in before, and by the window, busy with some needlework, sat a little old lady, who was somehow vaguely familiar. "'Who are you?' he asked, and was annoyed to find his voice so weak. The little lady jumped and came across to him. "'Praise be to God!' she ejaculated. "'Likewise, bless the boy. The fever is past.' She laid a thin hand on his brow, and smiled down into his wondering eyes. "'As cool as a cucumber, dear boy. What a mercy!' It was a long time since any one had called Jack dear, or boy. He returned the smile feebly and closed his eyes. "'I do not understand anything,' he murmured drowsily. "'Never trouble your head, then.' just go to sleep. He considered this gravely for a moment. It seemed sensible enough, and he was so very, very tired. He shut his eyes with a little sigh. When he awoke again, it was morning of the next day, and the sun streamed in the window, making him blink. Someone rustled forward, and he saw it was the lady who had called him dear and bidden him go to sleep. He smiled, and a very thin hand came out of the bedclothes. "'But who are you?' he demanded a little querulously. Miss Betty patted his hand gently. "'Still worrying your poor head over that. I am Di's Aunt Betty, though, to be sure, you don't know who Di is. Remembrance was coming back to my lord. Why, why, you are the lady in the coach. Tracy, I, I remember. Well, I know not of Tracy.' "'But I'm the lady in the coach. "'And the other? "'That was Diana Beaulieu, my niece, the pet. "'You will see her when you are better. "'But but where am I, madame? "'Now don't get excited, dear boy. "'I'm dirty, protested Jack with a wicked twinkle. "'I should not have thought it, "'but thirty's a boy to me in any case.' retorted Miss Betty, making him laugh. "'You are in Mr. Beaulieu's house, Di's father, and my brother, and here you will stay until you are quite recovered.' Jack raised himself on his elbow, grimacing at the pain the movement caused him. "'Egad, madame, have I been here long?' he demanded. Very firmly was he pushed back on to his pillows. "'Will you be still?' A nice thing twould be if you were to aggravate that wound of yours. You will have been here a week to-morrow. Bless my heart, what ails the boy? For Jack's face took on an expression of incredulous horror. A week, madame? Never say so. Tis as true as I stand here. And a nice fright you have given us. What with nearly dying and raving about your dicks and jims. My lord glanced up sharply. "'Oh, so I talked?' "'Talk? Well, yes, if you can call all that mixture of foreign jargon talking. Now you must be still and wait till the doctor comes again.' For a while Carstairs lay in silence. He thought of Jim and smiled a little. "'I could not have thought of a better punishment had I tried,' 
he told himself, and then frowned. "'Poor fellow! He'll be off his head with fright over me. Miss, er, uh, Betty?' "'Well, and aren't you not asleep yet?' "'Asleep, madame? Certainly not,' he said with dignity. "'I must write a letter.' "'Deed, and you shall not.' "'But I must. Tis monstrous important, madame.' She shook her head resolutely. "'Not until Mr. Jameson gives permission,' she said firmly. Jack struggled up, biting his lip. "'Then I shall get up,' he threatened. In an instant she was by his side. "'No, no! Lie down now and be good. I will not lie down and be good. Then I shan't let you touch a pen for weeks.' Jack became very masterful and frowned direfully upon her. "'Madame, I insist on being allowed to write that letter. "'Sir, I insist on your lying down.' He controlled a twitching lip. "'Woe betide you unless you bring me pen and paper, Miss Betty.' "'But, dear boy, reflect you could not use your arm.' "'I will use it,' replied Jack indomitably. But he sank back on to the pillows with his eyes closed, and a tiny furrow of pain between his straight brows. "'I told you so,' scolded Miss Betty, not without a note of triumph in her voice, and proceeded to rearrange the disorderly coverlet. The blue eyes opened wide, pleadingly. "'Madame, indeed, tis very important.' She could not withstand that look. "'Well,' she compromised, "'I'll not let you write yourself, that's certain.' "'But could you not dictate to me?' Jack brightened and caught her hand to his lips. "'Miss Betty, you are an angel,' he told her. "'Ah, oh, now, get along with you.' She hurried away to fetch paper and ink. When she turned, she found him plucking impatiently at the sheet and frowning. "'I am ready,' she said. "'Thank you, madame. Tis very kind in you.' "'Nonsense,' he laughed weakly. I want you to write to my servant, to bid him bring my baggage to the nearest inn. That will I not. I shall tell him to bring it here. But, Miss Betty, I cannot possibly trespass upon— Will you have done? Trespass, indeed. I perceive I shall be much put upon, sighed Jack, and watched her lightning smile. You, boy, will you dictate? Very well, ma'am. "'No, I have changed my mind. "'I'll have it writ to a friend, please. "'Dear Miles, true to my promise, "'I write to you, in case you should be worried "'over my disappearance. "'Be it known that I am at— "'Pray, madame, where am I? "'Horton Manor, Little Dean,' she replied, writing it down. Thank you. I had the misfortune to injure my shoulder in a— An arm, put in the scribe inexorably. And arm, um, in a fight, and a certain very kind lady. I refuse to write that rubbish. One of the ladies whom I rescued— Good heavens, madame! You've not put that! cried Jack, horrified. She smiled reassuringly. I have not. I put, my nurse is writing this for me. Madame, you are of a teasing disposition, reproved Jack. Hmm, yes. When you take Jenny over to Trencham, will you please tell Jim to bring my baggage? Here at once. Have you that, Miss Betty? Yes. Remember me to Lady Molly. I beg, and accept my apologies, and thanks. He paused. Will you sign it, J.C., please, and address it to Sir Miles O'Hara, Thurs House, Maltby? Sir Miles O'Hara is your friend, Mr. Mr. I do not know your name. Car, began Jack, and stopped, biting his lips. Carr, he continued imperturbably. John Carr. Do you know O'Hara, Miss Betty? 
Me? No. Will he come to see you, do you think? If you let him in, madame. Gracious! Well, well, I'll tell Thomas to ride over with this at once. Miss Betty, you are marvellously good. I vow I can never thank— Bless the boy, and what about yourself, pray? I shudder to think of what might have happened to die if you had not come up. "'Tis we can never thank you enough." Jack reddened, boyishly and uncomfortably. "'Indeed, you exaggerate. Tut, tut. Well, go to sleep, and never worry about anything till I return. And you won't try and get up?' He shook with laughter. "'I swear I will not. Even in you and never return. I will lie here wasting away.' but he spoke to space, for with a delighted laugh she had left the room. It was not until late that afternoon that O'Hara arrived, and he was conducted, after a brief conversation with Diana and her father, to my lord's room, where Miss Betty received him with her cheery smile and jerky curtsy. "'You'll not excite, Mr. Carr,' she said, but was interrupted by my lord's voice from within, weak but very gay. "'Come in, Miles, and never listen to Miss Betty.' She is a tyrant, and denies me my wig." O'Hara laughed in answer to Miss Betty's quizzical smile, and strode over to the bed. He gripped my lord's thin hand, and frowned down at him with an assumption of anger. "'Young good for naught! Could ye find naught better to do than smash yourself up and well nigh drive your man crazy with fright?' "'Oh, pshaw! Did ye find Jim?' O'Hara looked round, and saw that Miss Betty had discreetly vanished. He sat gingerly down on the edge of the bed. Ay, I took the mare over as soon as I had your letter, and a fine scare you gave me, Jack. I can tell you. She recognized him, and I accosted him. I'll swear you did not get much satisfaction from Jim, said my lord. Did he look very foolish? To tell you the truth, I, I thought the man was half daft, and wondered whether I'd been after making a mistake. But in the end I got him to believe what I was trying to tell him, and he has taken the mare and we'll bring your baggage along this evening. By the way, Jack, I told him of our little meeting, and of your pistols being unloaded. He said twas his fault, and you never saw aught to touch his face. Put out was not the word for it. I suppose so. Look here, Miles, this is a damned funny affair. What happened to you, exactly? Tis what I am about to tell you. After I had left you, I rode on quite quietly for about an hour— and then came upon Miss Bullet's coach, stopped by three blackguards who were trying to drag her to another coach belonging to the gentleman who conducted the affair. So, of course, I dismounted and went to see what was to be done. You would be after poking your nose into what didn't concern ye. Four men and ye had the audacity to tackle them all. Tis mad ye are entirely. Of course, if you had been in my place, you would have ridden off in another direction, or aided the scoundrels was the scathing reply. O'Hara chuckled. "'Well, go on, Jack. I'm not saying I don't wish I had been with ye. "'Twould have been superb. I suppose Miss Bullet has told you most of the tale, but there is one thing that she could not have told you, for she did not know it. The man I fought with was Belman Waugh. "'Thunder and turf! Not the Duke!' "'Yes, Tracy. Zounds! Did he know ye?' I cannot be certain. I was masked, of course, but he said he thought he did. Twas at that moment he fired his pistol at me. The dirty scoundrel! Mm, yes. Tis that which makes me think he did not know me. Damn it all, Miles, even Tracy would not do a thing like that. Would he not? If you ask me, I say that Tracy is game enough for any kind of devilry. But, my dear fellow, that is too black. He could not try to kill in cold blood a man he had hunted with and fenced with, and, and no man could. O'Hara looked extremely sceptical. "'Because ye could not yourself is not to say that a miserable spalpeen like Bellemanois could not.' "'I don't believe it of him. We were always quite friendly. If it had been Robert, now. But I am not going to believe it. And don't say anything to these people, O'Hara, because they do not know devil.' I gather from what Miss Betty says that he calls himself Everard. He meant the girl, Diana, at Bath. You know his way. She'd none of him, hence the abduction. 
Heavens! But tis a foul mind the man's got. Where women are concerned, yes. Otherwise, tis not such a bad fellow, Miles. I've no use for that kind of dirt myself, Jack. Oh, I don't know. I dare say we are none of us exactly saints. He changed the subject abruptly. How is Jinny? Rather off a feed missing you, I expect. I left her with your man. He should be arriving soon, I should think. I don't fancy he'll waste much time. Neither do I. Poor fellow. He must have worried terribly over this worthless master. Sure, his face was as white as your own when I told him you were wounded. Carstairs turned his head quickly. What's this about my face? Just be so kind as to hand me that mere, Miles. O'Hara laughed and obeyed, watching my lord's close scrutiny of his countenance with some surprise. Interesting pallor, my dear friend, interesting pallor. Nevertheless, I am glad that Jim is on his way. He meant O'Hara's eyes as he looked up, and his lips quivered irrepressibly. You think me vain, Miles? It is a pose of yours, John. Is it Sir Anthony Ferndale Bart? No, I believe it is myself. You see, when one is but one's self to live for and think of, one makes the most of oneself, hence my vanity. Take the mirror away, please. The sight of my countenance offends me. Sure, ye are free with your orders, me lord, said O'Hara, putting the glass down on the table. And while I think of it, what might your name be now? John Carr. A slip of the tongue on my part, stopped in time. I hear my mentor returning. And Miles, well, come again. Come again. My dear boy, you'll be sick of the sight of me soon. I'll be here every day. Thanks. It will take a good deal to sicken me, I think. He bit his lip, turning his head away as Miss Betty came into the room. I'm afraid you ought to leave my patient now, Sir Miles, she said. He has had enough excitement for one day, and should sleep. She glanced at the averted head inquiringly. I doubt he is tired. Jack turned and smiled at her. No, Miss Betty. I'm not, but I know you will refuse to believe me. My dear boy, do you know you have black lines beneath your eyes? More remarks about my face, he sighed, and glanced at O'Hara, who had risen. You are quite right, Miss Billet. I must go. May I come again tomorrow? Surely, she beamed, we shall be delighted to welcome you. O'Hara bent over the bed. Then au revoir, Jack. My lady sent her love to her cousin Harry, the saucy puss. Did she? How prodigious kind of her, Miles. And you'll give her mind, and kiss her. Yes, said O'Hara with dangerous calm. I'll kiss her what? Her hand for me, ended Costas bubbling over. <laughs> Goodbye, and thank you. That will suffice, said Miles, cutting him short. He bowed to Miss Betty and left the room. The business-like little lady fluttered over to the bedside and rearranged the pillows. Well, and are you satisfied? Most extraordinarily so. I thank you. I shall be getting up soon. Hmm. Was all she vouchsafed, and left him to his meditations. As she had foreseen, he dozed a little, but his shoulder would not allow him to sleep. He lay in a semi-comatose condition, his eyes shut, and a deep furrowed telling of pain between his brows. The sound of a shutting door made him open his eyes. He turned his head slightly and saw that Jim Salter was standing in the middle of the room, looking at him anxiously. My lord returned his gaze crossly, and Jim waited for the storm to break. Carstairs' heart melted, and he managed to smile. "'I'm monstrous glad to see you, Jim,' he said. "'You—you you can't mean that, sir. "'Twas I left your pistols unloaded.' "'I know. Damned careless of you. "'But it's the sort of thing I should do myself, after all.' "'Jim advanced to the bedside. "'Do you mean you forgive me, sir?' "'Why, of course. "'I could not have fired on my best friend in any case. "'No, sir. But that don't make it any better.' "'It doesn't, of course. "'And I was rather annoyed at the time. "'Oh, devil take you, Jim. Don't look at me like that. "'I'm not dead yet. "'If—' "'If you had been killed, sir, t'would have been my fault. "'Rubbish. I'd a sword, hadn't I? "'For heaven's sake, don't worry about it any more. "'Have you brought all my luggage?' 
"'Yes, sir. It shan't occur again, sir.' "'Certainly not. Jenny is well?' "'Splendid, sir. Will you still trust me with your pistol, sir?' Carstairs groaned. "'Will you have done? "'Twas an accident, and I have forgotten it. "'Here's my hand on it.' He grasped Jim as he spoke, and seemed to brush the whole subject aside. "'Have you disposed of that horrible coat you tried to make me wear the other day?' "'I gave it to the landlord, sir. "'I should have burned it, but perhaps he liked it.' "'He did, sir. "'Will you try to go to sleep now?' "'If you had a shoulder on fire and aching as mine does, "'you wouldn't ask such a ridiculous question,' answered Jack snappishly. "'I'm sorry, sir. "'Is there aught I can do?' "'You can change the bandages, if you like. "'These are prodigious hot and uncomfortable.' Without another word, Salter set about easing his master, and he was so painstaking and so careful not to hurt the ugly wound, and his face expressed so much concern, that Carstairs controlled a desire to swear when he happened to touch a particularly tender spot, and at the end rewarded him with a smile and a sigh of content. "'Ah, that is much better,' he said. "'You have such a light touch, Jim.' The man's face reddened with pleasure, but he said nothing, and walked away to the window to draw the curtains. End of chapter 12 Recorded by Tara Mendoza, Phoenix, Arizona, August 2011Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tara Mendoza. The Black Moth by Georgette Hare. Chapter 13. My Lord Makes His Bow. After Jim's arrival, my lord recovered quickly, each day making great progress, much to the doctor's satisfaction, who never tired of telling Mr. Bullet and Miss Betty that it was entirely owing to his treatment that the patient had recovered at all. As his idea of treatment mainly consisted of copiously bleeding John, which process Miss Betty very soon put an end to, he and she had many arguments on the subject, in which he was completely routed. She held that Mr. Carr was well on the strength of her own nursing, and his own constitution. And very probably she was right. In any case, hardly a fortnight after O'Hara's first visit, my lord was standing before his mirror, surveying himself with his head speculatively on one side and a worried look in his eyes. Salter watched him anxiously, knowing this to be a critical moment. His master was somewhat of an enigma to him. The important things in life never appeared to affect him, but over a question of two cravats, as opposed to each other, or some equally trivial matter, he would become quite harassed. After contemplating his appearance for several moments, Carstairs frowned and looked over his shoulder. I have changed my mind, Jim. I will wear blue, after all. Salter sighed despairingly. Ye look very well in what ye have on, sir, he grunted. Jack sat down obstinately. I have conceived a dislike, nigh, a veritable hatred for puce. I will wear blue. Now, sir, do have done changing your clothes. You'll be tired out before ever you get downstairs, and you know what the doctor said. My lord consigned the doctor and his words of wisdom to a place of great heat. "'Aye, sir, but—' "'The doctor. The doctor is a worthy individual, Jim, but he knows even less of the art of dressing than you do. He does not understand the sole agony of a man who makes his first appearance in puce. But the blue coat laced with gold. Sir, I order it. I insist. The blue coat or not. "'Very well, sir.' Resignedly, Jim walked to the cupboard. When at length his lordship was dressed to his entire satisfaction, it was midway through the hot June afternoon, and Miss Betty was tapping at the door, wishing to know whether Mr. Carr was coming down, or whether he was not. Carstairs shifted his sling, and taking up his hat, moved just a little shakily to the door. Salter opened it, and cast a triumphant glance at Miss Betty, as though he were showing off all my lord's graces. He proffered an arm. "'Shall I help you, sir?' Miss Betty curtsied low. "'La, Mr. Carr!' John bowed profoundly. "'Give you good den, madam,' 
he said, I am just about to descend. Thank you, Jim. He leaned heavily on the man's arm. Miss Betty walked around him admiringly. Lord, tis mighty elegant, I vow. But I protest I am shy. Egad, Miss Betty, and why? You are not so young as I imagined, she replied candidly. Bear in mind, madame, that I never sought to deceive you. I am an aged man. Thirty, she scoffed and went on. Come, child, and mind the first step. At the bottom of the staircase stood Mr. Bullet, a man of medium height, thin-lipped and grey-eyed. He came forward with one hand outstretched. "'I am delighted to see you so much better, sir. I trust your shoulder no longer pains you.' My lord pushed Jim gently to one side and placed his hand in Mr. Bullet's. "'I thank you, sir. It is almost well. But for Miss Betty, who I fear has the makings of a true tyrant, I should not wear this obnoxious sling.' Mr. Bullet smiled a little. "'Ah, oh, yes. She keeps us all in order, does Betty. Pray, will you not walk a little in the garden? There are chairs on the lawn, and here is my daughter.' He waved to the door, and Carstairs, turning, beheld Diana. She stood framed by the dark wood, gowned in amber silk, with old lace falling from her elbows and over the bosom of her dress. Her hair was dark as night, with little tendrils curling over her broad white brow. One rolling curl fell over her shoulder. The rest were gathered up under a small lace cap, which was secured by means of a riband passed beneath her chin. Jack gazed and gazed again, and in her turn Diana studied him with wide brown eyes of almost childlike innocence. Then her lids fluttered and curling lashes veiled the glorious depths as the slow blush mounted to her cheeks. My lord recovered his manners and made his most approved leg as her father presented him. "'My love, this is Mr. Carr.' Diana sank into a curtsy. "'And Mr. Carr, this is my daughter, Diana.' "'I am delighted to make Miss Bullet's acquaintance,' said John, and raised her hand to his lips. The delicate, tapering fingers trembled a little in his hold, and tremulous lips parted in the shyest and most adorable smile that he had ever seen. "'Indeed, sir, we are already acquainted.' I'm not like to forget my rescuer. I am happy to think that I was able to be of some service to you, mademoiselle. Believe me, it was an honour to fight in your cause. His eyes were on the fascinating dimple that played about her mouth. "'Tis very kind of you to say so, sir. I fear we greatly incommoded you, and—' She made a gesture towards his sling. "'That, mademoiselle, is less than nothing. All the obligation is on my side.' Miss Betty bustled forward. "'Now that will do. I never heard such a foolish set of compliments. You are looking tired, Mr. Carr. Come into the garden and rest.' Salter stepped forward, but Diana stayed him with uplifted finger. "'If Mr. Carr will accept my arm,' she hazarded. Jack flushed. "'Indeed, no, Miss Bullet, I can—' "'Oh, tut, tut!' cried Miss Betty. "'Have done dilly-dallying. Take him out, Di.' Mr. Bullet had already disappeared. His world lay in his library, and he was never far from it for any length of time. Now he had seized the moment when his sister was not looking to withdraw quietly, and when she turned around she was only in time to see the library door close softly. "'Your papa has gone again,' she remarked to her niece. "'What a trying man he is, to be sure.' She followed the pair out on to the lawn, and helped to make Carstairs seat himself in a long chair under a great elm. A cushion was placed under his wounded shoulder, and another at his back. "'And are you sure that you are quite comfortable?' inquired Miss Betty anxiously, bending over him. Jack laughed up at her. <laughs> "'Quite sure, thank you, madame. But where will you sit? I shall sit in this chair, and I will sit on a cushion. Throwing one down. At my feet. Just so. I see that you are ruled with a rod of iron, mademoiselle he said, and watched the dimple tremble into being. "'Indeed, yes, sir. Tis very sad.' Miss Betty chuckled and unrolled a packet of silks which she threw into her niece's lap. "'Will you have the goodness to sort those for me, love?' she asked, taking out her embroidery. "'Pray, allow me to assist,' pleaded John. Diana rose and planted her cushion down beside his chair. 
She then knelt down upon it and emptied the multicoloured strands on to his knee. "'Very well. You must be very careful to separate the different pinks, though. See, we will have the rose here, the salmon here, the deeper rose here, the pale pink over there, and the reds. There is no more room. We will put the reds in this paper.' "'Certainly,' agreed Carstairs. "'Are we to leave the other colours until the pinks are sorted?' She nodded and bent her head over the silks. "'Is Sir Miles coming this afternoon, Mr. Carr?' "'Why, yes, Miss Betty. Now you mention it. I remember that he is. Miss Bulay, I defy you to put that one on the rose-pile. Tis a shade too deep.' "'I am sure tis not. Where is one to compare with it?' Carstairs produced a long thread and held it next to hers. The two heads were bent close over it. Diana sighed. "'You are right. I can just see the difference, but tis very slight.' Miss Betty peeped over their shoulders. "'Gracious! What an eye you must have! I can detect no difference.' Her eye ran along the row of silks laid out on my lord's white satin leg. "'Mr. Carr,' said Diana suddenly, "'I want to ask you something, something that has been puzzling me.' "'Faith, what is it, Miss Bulay? "'Just this. Why did you call Mr. Everard M. Le Duc? There was a tiny pause. My lord looked down into the gold-flecked eyes and frowned a little. "'Did I call him that?' "'Yes. I remember it distinctly. Was it just a manner of speaking?' "'Just a manner of speaking. You may call it that, mademoiselle. Do you not think that he rather looks ducal?' "'I tried not to think of him at all. I hate him.' "'Almost I begin to pity Mr. Everard,' quoth Jack. The dimple peeped out. "'Then... "'Tis most ungallant of you, sir,' she reproved. "'Do you know Mr. Everard?' "'I have certainly seen him before, madame.' Diana sat back on her heels and eyed him wonderingly. "'I believe you do not wish to answer me,' she said slowly. "'Tell me, is Everard that man's real name?' My lord twisted the ring on his finger uneasily. He did not feel himself at liberty to expose Belmanoir, and if he should reveal his true identity, it was quite possible that Mr. Bullet might seek him out, in which case he himself might be recognised. He looked up. "'Pardon me, mademoiselle, but whence this cross-examination?' Diana nodded placidly. "'I thought you would refuse, but I have discovered something that will confound you, sir.' She rose to her feet. "'I will go and get it.' She walked gracefully away towards the house, and my lord watched her go. "'Now I am going to ask a question,' broke in Miss Betty's voice. He threw out an imploring hand. "'Madame, I beg you will consider my feeble condition. Am I fit to bear the strain, think you?' "'I do. Is it usual for gentlemen to ride masked as you were?' At that he laughed. "'No, madame. But for the gentlemen of the high Toby, it is de regret. She paused with her needle held in mid-air. "'Now what mean you by that?' "'Just that I am a common highwayman, Miss Betty.' She stared at him for a moment, and then resumed her work. "'You look it.' John cast a startled glance down his slim person. "'Is that so, madame? And I rather flattered myself I did not.' "'I was only laughing at you. You do not expect me to believe that fabrication, surely?' "'I fear I do,' he sighed. "'Tis very true, alack.' "'Oh, indeed. Also a friend of Sir Miles O'Hara, J.P., and of Mr. Everard. "'At least the last named is not an acquaintance to be proud of,' he retorted. "'Perhaps not. My die says he is some great gentleman. I perceive that your die is by nature suspicious. Why does she think that?' "'You will see. Die, love.' "'Here is Mr. Carr trying to make me believe that he is a highwayman.' Diana came up to them, smiling. "'I fear he teases you, Aunt. Do you remember this, sir?' Into Jack's hands she put his grace of Andover's sword. Carstairs took it, surprised, and glanced casually at the hilt. Then he started up. "'Why, tis his sword, and I thought twas left on the roadside. Can it be—did you bring it, mademoiselle?' 
She dropped him a curtsy and laughed. "'You are surprised, sir. You demanded the soul, so I naturally supposed that you required it. Therefore I brought it home.' "'Twas monstrous thoughtful of you, then. I dared not hope that it had not been forgotten. I am very grateful. Then pray show your gratitude by sitting down again, advised the elder Miss Bullet. Remember that this is your first day up, and have a care. John subsided obediently, turning the sword over in his hands. Diana pointed to the wrought gold hilt with an accusing finger. And I mistake not, sir, that is a coronet. My lord's eyes followed the pink-tipped finger, and rested wrathfully upon the arms of Andover. It was like Tracy to flaunt them on his sword-hilt, he reflected. "'It certainly has that appearance,' he admitted cautiously. "'Also, those are not paste, but real diamonds, and that is a ruby.' "'I do not dispute it, madame,' he answered meekly. "'And I believe that that big stone is an emerald?' I am very much afraid that it is. An expensive toy, she said, and looked sharply at him. Ornate, I agree, but as true a piece of steel as ever I saw, replied my lord blandly, balancing the rapier on one finger. A very expensive toy, she repeated sternly. John sighed. True, madame, true. Then with a brightened air, Perhaps Mr. Everard has expensive tastes? It is very possible, and I think that Mr. Everard must have been more than a simple country gentleman to indulge those tastes. Carstairs bit his lip to hide a smile at the thought of Tracy in the light of a simple country gentleman, and shook his head sadly. Do you infer that he came by this sword dishonestly, madame? The dimple quivered and was gone. Sir, I believe that you are playing with me, she said with great dignity. "'Madame, I am abashed. I am very glad to hear it, then. I infer that Mr. Everard was something more than he pretended to be.' "'In truth, a sorry rogue to deceive a lady. And I want to know if I am right. Is he, perhaps, some grand gentleman?' "'I can assure you, madame, that there is very little of the gentleman about Mr. Everard.' Miss Betty began to laugh. "'Have done, my dear. "'Tis of no avail, and tis impolite to press Mr. Carr too hard.' Diana pouted. "'He is monstrous provoking, I think,' she said, and eyed him reproachfully. "'I am desolated,' mourned Jack, but his eyes danced. "'And now you are laughing. "'But then, mademoiselle, so are you.' She shook her head, resolutely repressing the dimple. "'Then I am inconsolable.' The brown eyes sparkled, and her lips parted in spite of her efforts to keep them in a stern line. "'Oh, but you are ridiculous!' she cried, and sprang to her feet. "'And here is Sir Miles.' O'Hara came across the lawn towards them, bowed to the ladies, and glanced inquiringly from one to the other. "'Is it a joke you have?' he asked. Diana answered him, "'Indeed, no, sir. Tis Mr. Carr who is provoking.' "'Provoking, is it?' "'And what has he been doing?' "'I'll tell you the whole truth, Miles,' interposed the maligned one. "'Tis Mistress Diana who is so inquisitive.' "'Oh!' Diana blushed furiously. "'I protest you are unkind, sir.' "'Sure, tis no gentleman he is at all. "'Twas on the subject of gentlemen that we quarrelled," supplied her aunt. "'Disagreed,' amended his lordship. "'Disagreed,' nodded Diana. I asked him whether Mr. Everard was not some grand gentleman, and he evaded the point. "'I vow tis slander,' cried Jack. "'I merely said that Everard was no gentleman at all.' "'There! And was that not evading the point, Sir Miles?' "'Was it? Sure, I'm inclined to agree with him.' "'I declare you are both in league against me,' she cried, with greater truth than she knew. "'I mean, was he perhaps a titled gentleman?' "'But how should Jack know that?' "'Because I'm sure he knows him, or at least of him.' "'Listen, Mistress Di,' broke in my lord, shooting a warning glance at O'Hara. "'I will tell you all about Mr. Everard, and I hope you will be satisfied with my tale.' He paused and seemed to cudgel his brain. First, he is, of course, titled. Let me see. Yes, 
He is a duke. Oh, he is certainly a duke. And I am not sure but what he is royal. Now you are ridiculous, cried Miss Betty. You are very teasing, said Diana, and tried to frown. First you pretend to know nothing about Mr. Everard, and then you tell me foolish stories about him. A duke, indeed! I believe you really do know nothing about him. As Carstairs had hoped, she refused to believe the truth. "'He is playing with you, child,' said O'Hara, who had listened to Jack's tale with a face of wonder. "'I warrant he knows no Everard, eh, Jack?' "'No, I cannot say that I do,' laughed his lordship. "'But, but, you said—' "'Never mind what he said, Miss Di. "'Tis a scurvy fellow he is.' She regarded him gravely. "'Indeed, I almost think so. "'But the dimple peeped out for all that. "'The next instant it was gone, "'and Diana turned a face of gloom to her aunt, "'pouting her red lips adorably, so thought my lord. "'Mr. Bettison,' she said in accents of despair. "'At these mystic words Jack saw Miss Betty frown "'and heard her impatient remark. "'Drat the man!' He looked towards the house and perceived a short, rather stout young man to be walking with a peculiar strutting gait towards them. The boy was good-looking, Carstairs acknowledged to himself, but his eyes were set too close, and he did not like his style. No, certainly he did not like his style, nor the proprietary way in which he kissed Diana's hand. "'How agreeable it is to see you again, Mr. Bettison," said Miss Betty, with much affability. "'I declare—' "'Tis an age since we set eyes on you.' "'Oh, no, aunt,' contradicted Diana sweetly. "'Why, it was only a very short while ago that Mr. Bettison was here. "'Surely!' She withdrew the hand that the young man seemed inclined to hold fast to, and turned to John. "'I think you do not know Mr. Bettison, Mr. Carr,' she said. "'Mr. Bettison, allow me to present you to Mr. Carr. Sir Miles, I think you know.' The squire bowed with a great deal of stiff hostility. Carstairs returned the bow. "'You will excuse my not rising, I beg,' he smiled. "'As you perceive, I have had an accident.' Light dawned on Bettison. This was the man who had rescued Diana. Confound his impudence! "'Ah, oh, yes, sir. Your arm, was it not? My faith, I should be proud of such a wound.' It seemed to Carstairs that he smiled at Diana in a damned familiar fashion. Devil take his impudence! It was indeed a great honour, sir. Mistress Di, I have finished sorting your green silks. Diana sank down on the cushion again, and shook some more strands out on to his knee. How quick you have been! Now we will do the blue ones. Bettison glared. This fellow seemed prodigious intimate with Diana. Devil take him! He sat down beside Miss Betty and addressed my lord patronizingly. "'Let me see, er, uh, Mr. Carr. I met you in town, I wonder. At Tom's, perhaps. This country bumpkin would belong to Tom's,' reflected John savagely for no reason at all. Aloud he said, "'I think it extremely unlikely, sir. I have been abroad some years.' "'Oh, indeed, sir. The Grand Tour, I suppose?' Mr. Bettison's tone was not the tone of one who supposes any such thing. Jean smiled. "'Not this time,' he said. "'That was seven years ago.' Mr. Bettison had heard rumours of this fellow who, it was murmured, was not but a common highwayman. "'Really? After Cambridge, perhaps?' "'Oxford,' corrected Carstairs gently. "'Curse his audacity,' thought Mr. Bettison. Seven years ago. Let me think.' "'George must have been on the tour, then. Selwyn, I mean. Miss Bullet. Jack, who had made the tour with several other young bucks fresh down from college, accompanied, as far as Paris, by the famous wit himself, held his peace. Mr. Bettison then launched forth into anecdotes of his own tour, and seeing that his friend was entirely engrossed with Miss Diana and her silks, O'Hara felt it incumbent on him to draw the enemy's fire, and taking his own departure to bear the squire off with him, for which he received a grateful smile from my lord, and a kiss blown from the tips of her fingers from Mistress Di, with whom he was on the best of terms. End of chapter 13 Recording by Tara Mendoza, Phoenix, Arizona, August 2011
For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tara Mendoza The Black Moth by Georgette Hare Chapter 14 Mistress Diana is Unmaidenly The idyllic summer days passed quickly by, and every time that my lord spoke of leaving, the outcry was so indignant and so firm that he hastily subsided and told himself he would stay just another few days. His shoulder, having mended up to a certain point, refused quite to heal, and exertion brought the pain back very swiftly. So his time was for the most part spent with Mistress Di out of doors, helping her with her gardening and her chickens. For Diana was an enthusiastic poultry farmer on a small scale, and ministering to her various pets. If Fido had a splinter in his paw, it was to Mr. Carr that he was taken. If Nelly, the spaniel, caught a live rabbit, Mr. Carr would assuredly know what to do for it, and the same with all the other animals. The young pair grew closer and closer together, while Miss Betty and O'Hara watched from afar, the former filled with pride of her darling and satisfaction, and the latter with apprehension. O'Hara knew that his friend was falling unconsciously in love, and he feared the time when John should realize it. He confided these fears to his wife, who, with young David, was staying at her mother's house in Kensington. In a long and very Irish letter, she replied that he must try and coax my lord into coming to stay with them, when her charms would at once eclipse Mistress Diana's, though to be sure she could not understand why Miles should not wish him to fall in love for as well he knew twas a prodigious pleasant sensation. If he did not know it, then he was indeed most disagreeable. And had he ever heard of anything so wonderful? David had drawn a picture of a horse. Yes, really, it was a horse. Was he not a clever child? Further, would her dearest Miles please come and fetch her home? For although Mamma was prodigious amiable, and wanted her to stay several weeks, she positively could not live without her husband an instant longer than was necessary. As soon as O'Hara read the last part of the letter, he brushed Carstairs and his love affairs to one side, and posted straight to London to obey the welcome summons. Bit by bit my lord discovered that he was very much in love with Diana. At first his heart gave a great bound, and then seemed to stop with a sickening thud. He remembered that he could not ask her to marry him. Disgraced as he was, and he immediately faced the situation, realizing that he must go away at once. His first move was to Mr. Bullet to tell him of his decision. On being asked why he must so suddenly leave Horton House, he explained that he loved Diana, and could not in honour speak of love to her, at which Mr. Bullet gasped and demanded to know the reason. Carstairs told him that he was by profession a highwayman, and watched him bridle angrily. Before so agreeable and so smiling, Mr. Bullet now became frigidly polite. He quite understood Mr. Carr's position, and, uh, yes, he honoured him for the course on which he had decided. But Mr. Bullet was very, very cold. Carstairs gave Jim orders to pack immediately, that he might depart next day, and reluctantly informed Miss Betty of his going. She was startled and bewildered. She had imagined that he would spend all June with them circumstances he regretted willed otherwise he should always remember her great kindness to him and hope that she would forgive the brusque nature of his departure when he told diana her eyes opened very wide and she laughed pointing an accusing finger at him you are teasing mr carr she cried and ran into the house that evening miss betty confirmed jack's words and seeing the hurt look in the girl's eyes wisely held her peace Next morning, in the plaisance, Diana came across my lord and went to him, gravely questioning. "'You are really leaving us to-day, Mr. Carr?' "'I am afraid I must, Mistress Di.' "'So suddenly? Then you were not teasing yesterday?' "'No, mademoiselle. I was not. I fear I have tarried too long, taking advantage of your kindness.' "'Oh, no, no,' she assured him. "'Indeed you have not.' Must you really go? Looking down into her big eyes, John read the answering love in them, and grew pale. It was worse to think that she cared, too. If only he thought she was indifferent, parting would not seem so unbearable. Mademoiselle, you overwhelm me. I must go. 
Oh, but I am sorry. Your being here has been such a pleasure. I— She stopped and looked away across the flowers. You— prompted Jack, before he could check himself. With a tiny laugh she brought her gaze back. "'I am sorry you must leave us naturally.' She sat down beneath an arbor of roses, and patted the place beside her invitingly, with just the same unconscious friendliness that she had always shown him. My lord stayed where he was, with one hand on a tree trunk, and the other fidgeting with his quizzing glass. "'Mistress Di, I—' I think it only right that I should tell you what I have told your father, and what I told your aunt some time ago, when she refused to believe me. To some extent, I am here under false pretenses. I am not what you think me. Diana laced and unlaced her fingers, and thought that she understood. Oh, no, Mr. Carr. I am afraid, yes, mademoiselle. I am a common felon, a highwayman. He bit the words out, not looking at her. But I knew that she said softly. "'You knew it?' "'Why, yes. I remember, when you told Aunt Betty. You believed me. You see,' she apologized. "'I always wondered why you were masked, and yet you permitted me to stay. How silly of you, Mr. Carve. Of course I do not care what you are. I owe so much to you.' He wheeled round at that and faced her. "'Madame,' I can bear anything rather than gratitude. Is it only that which has made you tolerate me all this time? Her fingers gripped one another. Why, sir! Why, sir! The flame died out of his eyes, and he drew himself up stiffly, speaking with a curtness that surprised her. I crave your pardon. I should be whipped at the cocktail for asking such an impertinent question. Forget it, I beg. Diana looked up at the stern face half amazed, half affronted. "'I do not think I quite understand you, sir.' "'There is not to understand, mademoiselle,' he answered with dry lips. "'Twere merely that I was a coxcomb enough to hope that you liked me a little for mine own sake.' She glanced again at his averted head, and with a wistful little smile, "'Oh!' she murmured, "'Oh! And it is very dreadful to be a highwayman,' she sighed. "'Yes, mademoiselle.' "'But surely you could cease to be one,' coaxingly. He did not trust himself to answer. "'I know you could. Please do.' "'That is not all,' he forced himself to say. "'There is worse.' "'Is there?' she asked, wide-eyed. "'What else have you done, Mr. Carr?' "'I once—' "'Heavens, how hard it was to say! "'I once—' "'Cheated. "'At cards. "'It was out.' Now she would turn from him in disgust. He shut his eyes in anticipation of her scorn. His head turned away. "'Only once?' came the soft voice filled with awed admiration. His eyes flew open. "'Mademoiselle!' She drooped her head mournfully. "'I'm afraid I always cheat,' she confessed. "'I had no idea it was so wicked. Although Auntie gets very cross and vows she will not play with me. He could not help laughing. <laughs> it is not wicked in you, child. You do not play for money. Oh, did you? Yes, child. Then that was horrid of you, she agreed. He stood silent, fighting the longing to tell her the truth. But do not look so solemn, sir. The pleading voice went on. I am sure you must have had a very strong excuse. None. And now you are letting it spoil your life she asked reproachfully. "'It does not wait for my permission,' he answered bitterly. "'Ah, oh, but what a pity! Must one moment's indiscretion interfere with all else in life? That is ridiculous. You have, what is the word, expiated. Yes, that is it. Expiated it. I know. The past can never be undone, madame. That, of course, is true.' She nodded with the air of a sage, but it can be forgotten. His hand flew out eagerly, and dropped back to his side. It was hopeless. He could not tell her the truth and ask her to share his disgrace. He must bear it alone, and above all he must not whine. He had chosen to take Richard's blame, and he must abide by the consequences. It was not a burden to be cast off as soon as it became too heavy for him. It was for ever, for ever. 
he forced his mind to grasp that fact. All through his life he must be alone against the world. His name would never be cleared. He could never ask this sweet child who sat before him, with such a wistful, pleading look on her lovely face, to wed him. He looked down at her somberly, telling himself that she did not really care, that it was his own foolish imagination. Now she was speaking. He listened to the liquid voice that repeated, "'Could it not be forgotten?' "'No, mademoiselle. It will always be there. To all intents and purposes, might it not be forgotten?' she persisted. "'It will always stand in the way, mademoiselle.' He supposed that mechanical voice was his own. Through his brain thrummed the thought, "'It is for Dick's sake. For Dick's sake. For Dick's sake you must be silent.' Resolutely he pulled himself together. "'It will stand in the way of what?' asked Diana. "'I can never ask a woman to be my wife,' he replied. Diana wantonly stripped a rose of its petals, letting each fragrant leaf flutter slowly to the ground. "'I do not see why you cannot, sir. No woman should share my disgrace. No? No. You seem very certain, Mr. Carr. Pray, have you asked the lady? No, madame. Carstairs was as white as she was red, but he was holding himself well in hand. Then— The husky voice was very low. Then why don't you? The slim hand against the tree trunk was clenched tightly, she observed. In his pale face the blue eyes burnt dark. Madame. Because twere the action of a— Of a— Of a what, Mr. Carr? A cur. A scoundrel. A blackguard. Another rose was sharing the fate of the first. I have heard it said that some women like curs and— And scoundrels? Even blackguards? Remarked that provocative voice— through her lashes, its owner watched my lord's knuckles gleam white against the tree bark. Not the lady I love, madame. Oh, but are you sure? I am sure. She must marry a man whose honour is spotless, who is not a nameless outcast, and who lives not by dice and highway robbery. He knew that the brown eyes were glowing and sparkling with unshed tears, but he kept his own turn exorably the other way. There was no doubting now that she cared, and that she knew that he did also. He could not leave her to think that her love had been slighted. She must not be hurt, but made to understand that he could not declare his love. But how hard it was, with her sorrowful gaze upon him, and the pleading note in her voice. It was quivering now. Must she, sir? Yes, madame. But supposing, supposing the lady did not care, supposing she loved you, and was willing to share your disgrace. The ground at her feet was strewn with crimson petals, and all around and above her roses nodded and swayed. A tiny breeze was stirring her curls, and the lace of her frock, but John would not allow himself to look, lest the temptation to catch her in his arms should prove too great for him. She was ready to give herself to him, to face anything, only to be with him. In the plainest language she offered herself to him, and he had to reject her. It is inconceivable that the lady would sacrifice herself in such a fashion, madame, he said. Sacrifice? She caught her breath. You call it that? What else? I, I, I do not think that you are very wise, Mr. Carr, nor that you understand women very well. She might not call it by that name. It would make no difference what she called it, madame. She would ruin her life, and that must never be. A white rose joined its fallen brethren, pulled to pieces by fingers that trembled pitifully. Mr. Carr, if the lady loved you, is it quite fair to her to say nothing? There was a long silence, and then my lord lied bravely. I hope that she will, in time, forget me, he said. Diana sat very still. No more roses were destroyed. The breeze wafted the fallen petals over her feet lightly, almost playfully. Somewhere in the hedge a bird was singing, a full-throated sobbing plaint, and from all around came an incessant chirping and twittering. The sun sent its bright rays all over the garden, bathing it in gold and happiness, but for the two in the pleasance the light had gone out, and the world was very black. 
"'I see,' whispered Diana at last. "'Poor lady! I think it was a cursed day that she saw me come into her life,' he groaned. "'Perhaps it was,' her heart made answer. He bowed his head. "'I can only hope that she will not think too hardly of me,' he said very low, "'and that she will find it in her heart to be sorry for me also.' She rose and came up to him, her skirts brushing gently over the grass, holding out her hands imploringly. "'Mr. Carr!' He would not allow himself to look into the gold-flecked eyes. He must remember Dick, his brother, Dick. In his hand he took the tips of her fingers and bowed, kissed them. Then he turned on his heel and strode swiftly away between the hedges toward the quiet woods, with a heart aflame with passion and with rebellion and impotent fury. He would go somewhere quite alone, and fight the devil that was prompting him to cry the truth aloud, and to throw aside his burden for love, forgetting duty. But Diana remained standing amongst the scattered flowers, very still, very cold, with a look of hopeless longing in her eyes, and a great hurt. End of chapter 14 Recorded by Tara Mendoza Phoenix, Arizona August 2011chapter 15 of the black moth this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by tara mendoza the black moth by georgette hare chapter 15 o'hara's mind is made up jim salter folded one of my lord's waistcoats and placed it carefully in an open valise then he picked up a coat and spread it on the bed preparatory to folding it in such wise that no crease should afterwards mar its smoothness all about him my lord's clothing was strewn mechlin ruffles and cravats adorned one chair silk hose another gorgeous coats hung on their backs shoes of every description red-heeled and white riding boots and slippers stood in a row awaiting attention Wigs perched coquettishly on handy projections, and piles of white cambric shirts peeped out from an almost finished bag. Jim laid the coat tenderly in the valise, coaxing it into decorous folds and wondering at the same time where his master was. He had been out all morning, and on his return had looked so ill that Jim had been worried and wished that they were not leaving Horton House quite so soon. A little while ago my lord had been closeted with his host, Jim supposed he must still be there. He reached out his hand for another waistcoat, but before his fingers had touched it he stopped and lifted his head, listening. Hasty, impetuous footsteps sounded on the stairs and came furiously along the corridor. The door was twisted open, and my lord stood on the threshold. Jim scanned the tired face anxiously and noted with a sinking heart that the blue eyes were blazing and the fine lips set in a hard, uncompromising line. The slender hand gripped the door-handle, twitched in a way that Jim knew full well. Evidently, my lord was in an uncertain mood. "'Have you finished?' rapped out Carstairs. "'Not quite, sir. I wish to leave this year, and not next. If tis all the same to you.' "'Yes, sir. I didn't know you was in a hurry, sir.' There was no reply to this. My lord advanced into the room and cast one glance at his scattered baggage and another all around him. "'Where is my riding-dress?' Jim shivered in his luckless shoes. "'I, uh, tis packed, sir. Do you want it?' "'Of course I want it. Do you suppose that I am going to ride in what I have on?' "'I rather thought you were driving, Yana. "'I am not. The scarlet suit at once, please.' He flung himself down in a chair before his dressing-table and picked up a nail-file. Salter eyed his reflection in the glass dismally and made no movement to obey. After a moment, my lord swung round. "'Well, what are you standing there for? Didn't you hear me?' "'Aye, sir, I did. But your pardon, sir. But do you think tis wise to ride to-day for—for for the first time?' The file slammed down on to the table. "'I am riding to Holy this afternoon,' said his master dangerously. "'Tis a matter of fifteen miles or so, Yana. Hadn't you better—' "'Damn you, Jim, be quiet!' Salter gave it up. "'Very well, sir,' he said, and unearthed the required dress. 
I'll see the baggage goes by coach, and saddle the mare and Peter. Not Peter. You go in the coach. No, sir. What? My lord stared at him. There had been a note of finality in the respectful tone. My lord became icy. You forget yourself, Salter. I ask your pardon, sir. You will travel in charge of my things, as usual. Jim compressed his lips and stowed a shoe away in one corner of the bag. You understand me? I understand you well enough, sir. Then that is settled. No, sir. My lord dropped his eyeglass. What the devil do you mean? No, sir. I ask your pardon, sir, and I presume, but I can't and won't let you ride alone with your wound but just healed. There was not a hint of defiance or impertinence in the quiet voice, but it held a great determination. You won't, eh? Do you imagine I am a child? No, sir. Or unable to take care of myself? I think you are weaker than you know, sir. Oh, you do, do you? Jim came up to him. you let me ride with you, sir. I won't trouble ye, and I can ride behind. But I can't let you go alone. You might faint, sir. I can assure you I am not like to be a pleasant companion, said Carstairs with a savage little laugh. Why, sir, I understand there's something troubling you. Will you let me come? My lord scowled up at him, then relented suddenly. As you please. Thank you, sir. Salter returned to his packing, cording one bag and placing it near the door, and quickly filling another. The piles of linen grew steadily smaller until they disappeared, and he retired into a cupboard to reappear with a great armful of coats and small clothes. For a long while my lord sat silent, staring blankly before him. He walked to the window and stood with his back to the room, looking out. Then he turned and came back to his chair. Jim, watching him, covertly noted that the hard glitter had died out of his eyes and that he looked wearier than ever. Carstairs studied his nails for a moment in silence. Presently he spoke. Jim. Yes, sir. I shall be going abroad again shortly. If Carstairs had remarked that it was a fine day, the man could not have shown less surprise. Shall we, sir? John looked across at him, smiling faintly. You'll come, Jim. I would go anywhere with you, sir. And what about the little girl at Fittering? Salter blushed and stammered hopelessly. My dear fellow, since when have I been blind? Did you think I did not know? Why, sir, well, sir, yes, sir. Of course I knew. Can you leave her to come with me? I couldn't leave ye to stay with her, sir. Are you sure? I do not want you to come against your inclinations. Women ain't everything, sir. Are they not? I think they are, a great deal," said my lord wistfully. I'm mighty fond of Mary, but she knows I must go with you. Does she? But is it quite fair to her? And I believe I am not minded to drag you cross-continent again. You won't leave me behind, sir. You couldn't do that. Sir, you're never thinking of going by yourself. I, I, I won't let you. I am afraid I cannot spare you. But if you should change your mind, tell me, is to promise. Aye, sir, if I should change my mind. Salter's smile was grimly sarcastic. I am selfish enough to hope you'll not change. I think no one else would bear with my vile temper as you do. Help me out of this coat, will you? I'll never change, sir. And as to tempers, as if I minded. No, you are marvellous. My breeches. Thanks. He shed his satin small clothes, and proceeded to enter into white buckskins. Not those boots, Jim, the other pair. He leaned against the table as he spoke, drumming his fingers on a chair back. A knock fell on the door at which he frowned and signed to Jim, who walked across and opened it slightly. "'Is your master here?' inquired a well-known voice, and at the sound of it my lord's face lighted up, and Salter stood aside. "'Come in, Miles.' The big Irishman complied and cast a swift glance round the disordered room. He raised his eyebrows at sight of Jack's riding boots and looked inquiringly across at him. My lord pushed a chair forward with his foot. "'Sit down, man. I thought you were in London. I was. I brought Molly home yesterday, the darling, and I heard that you were leaving here this afternoon. Ah? 
and as I'm not going to let you slip through me fingers again, I thought I would come and make to show of ye. Ye are a dear too slippery, Jack. Yet I was coming to see you again, whatever happened. Of course. You're coming now, to stay. Oh, no. O'Hara placed his hat and whip on the table and stretched his legs with a sigh. Sure, tis stiff I am. Jim, I've a chase outside for the baggage, so ye may take it down as soon as ye may be. Leave it where it is, Jim. Miles, tis monstrous good of you, but keep your butts to yourself, Jack. Me mind's made up. And so is mine. I really cannot. Me good boy, ye are coming to stay with us until ye are recovered. If I have to knock ye senseless and then carry ye. The lightning smile flashed into Jack's eyes. How ferocious! But pray do not be ridiculous over a mere scratch. Recovered indeed. Ye still look ill. Nigh, Jack. Take that frown off your face. Tis of no avail. I am determined. The door closed softly behind Jim as Carstairs shook his head. I can't, Miles. You must see tis impossible. Pooh. No one who comes to Thur's house knows ye, or anything about ye. Ye need not see a soul, but come ye must. But, Miles, Jack, don't be a fool. I want ye, and so does Molly. Tis no trap, so ye need not look so scared. I'm not. Indeed, I'm very grateful, but I cannot. I'm going abroad almost at once. What? Yes, I mean it. O'Hara sat up. So it has come. I knew it would. What mean you? You found out that you loved Mr. Stye. Nonsense. And she you? Jack looked at him. I'm a tactless oaf. I know. And me manners are atrocious to be for trying to break through the barriers you've put around yourself. But I tell you, Jack, it hurts to be kept at the end of a pole. I don't want to force your confidence, but for God's sake... Don't be treating me as if I were a stranger. I beg your pardon, Miles. It's confoundedly hard to confide in anyone after six years of solitude. He struggled into his coat as he spoke and settled his cravat. If you want to know the whole truth, tis because of Diana that I am going. Of course. You are in love with her. It rather points that way, does it not? Then why the devil don't you just ask her to marry ye? Why don't I ask her? Because I will not offer her a smirched name. Because I love her so much that— He broke off with his shaky, furious laugh. <laughs> How can you ask me such a question? I am a desirable parte, eh? Non, de non. For what do you take me? O'Hara looked up, calmly studying the wrathful countenance. Chivalrous young fool, he drawled. Again the short— angry laugh. <laughs> it is so likely that I should ask her to marry me, is it not? Mademoiselle, you see in me an improvident fool. I began life by cheating at cards, and since then, oh, I shall believe it myself ere long. I seem to have told it to so many people, and I lay myself open to the impertinences of— He checked himself, thinking of the interview downstairs with Mr. Bullet. Rubbish, Jack! Tis not rubbish! I have one recommendation, only one. Faith, have ye as much? What is it? My lord laughed bitterly. I dress rather well. A fence better as far as I remember. I have no reason to. That is but another point to damn me. What woman would marry a fencing master? Oh, my God, what a mess I have made of my life. He tried to laugh and failed miserably. I rather fancy Mr. Stye would. She will not be asked thus to demean herself, was the proud answer. My dear Jack, ye forget. Ye are the Earl of Wincham. A pretty Earl. No, thank you, Miles. Richard's son will be the Earl, no son of mine. O'Hara brought his fist down on the table with a crash. Damn Richard and his son! My lord picked up a jewelled pin and walking to the glass proceeded to fasten it in his cravat. The other followed him with smouldering eyes. "'Retired into your cell again, eh?' he growled. Carstairs, with his head slightly on one side, considered the effect of the pin. Then he came back to his friend. "'My dear Miles, the long and short of it is that I am an unreasonable grumbler. I made my bed, 
and I suppose I must, er, uh, lie on it. And will you be after telling me who helped you in the making of it? Carstairs sat down, and started to pull on one boot. I foresaw we shall be at one another's throats ere long, he prophesied cheerfully. Did I tell you that I informed Mr. Bullet of my, er, uh, profession to-day? Miles forgot his anger and surprise. "'You never told him you were a highwayman,' he cried. "'Yes, I did. Why not?' "'Why not? Why not? God help us all! Are ye daft, man? Do ye intend to tell every other person ye meet what ye are? Be dad, tis mad ye are entirely!' Carstairs sighed. "'I was afraid you would not understand. "'Twould take a wizard to understand ye. Another chivalrous impulse, I doubt not.' Shiv no, it is just that I, I could not let him think me an honourable gentleman. He took it well on the whole, and is now frigidly polite. Polite? I should hope so, the old scarecrow, after he'd saved his daughter on him, too. And was he made ye so furious? Carstairs laughed. <laughs> he and myself. You see, he lectured me, oh, quite kindly, on the error of my ways. And it hurt. "'Tis as well ye are coming to me, then. The way things are with ye at present." My lord opened his mouth to speak, encountered a fiery glance, and shut it again. "'Anything to say?' inquired O'Hara, with a threatening gleam in his eye. "'No, sir,' replied Jack meekly. "'You will come, please.' O'Hara sprang up joyfully. "'Good lad! Lord, but I was afraid at one time. Put on your other boot, while I go and look for that rascal of yours. He hurried out of the room to find Jim, who, having foreseen the result of the contest, was already stowing the luggage away on the chaise. Half an hour later, his undo made, Jim and the baggage following, my lord rode out with O'Hara on his way to Thur's house. For some time there was silence between the two men, with only a perfunctory remark or two on the fineness of the day and the freshness of the mare to break it. Carstairs' mind was, as his friend well knew, dwelling on all that he had left behind him. His parting with Diana had been quite ordinary, she at least making no sign that he was anything beyond a chance acquaintance. Indeed, it had almost seemed to him that her attitude was slightly aloof, as if she had drawn a little into herself. Her hand when he had kissed it had been lifeless and cold, her smile sweetly remote. He knew that he had held the hand a fraction of a minute longer than was strictly in accordance with the rules on good manners and he feared that he had clasped it in most unseemly wise, pressing it hard against his lips. He wondered whether she had remarked it. He little guessed that long after he had ridden out of sight, she continued to feel that pressure. If he could have seen her passionately kissing each finger separately for fear her lips might pass over the exact spot his had touched, his heart might have been lighter. It was true that she had retired into her shell, a little hurt at what she termed his man's blind obstinacy. She had laid her heart bare for him to read. She had offered herself to him as plainly as if she had spoken in terms less general than in the plaisance. She had fought desperately for her happiness, thrusting aside all thought of maiden modesty, and when she afterwards had realized what she had done, and tried to imagine what he must think of her, she had blushed dark and mentally flayed herself for her lack of proper pride and manners. Terrified that he might think her immodest, Overwhelmed with sudden shyness, she had been colder in her attitude towards him than she had intended, even in her anxiety not to appear forward. But in spite of her coldness, how intensely had she hoped that he would sense her love, and all that she wanted him to know. Incomprehensible the ways of women. Not endowed with feminine perspicacity or intuition, how could John hope to understand her dual feelings? He only knew that he had hurt her, and that she had drawn back that she might not lay herself open to more. He could not hope to understand her when she did not fully understand herself. Reflecting on the swiftness with which love had come to them, he believed that with a like swiftness it might fade, at least from Diana's memory. He told himself that he hoped for that end, but he was honest enough to know that it was the last thing in the world he wanted. The mere thought of Diana indifferent to him, or worse, another man's bride, made him bite on his under lip and tighten his hold on the rein. O'Hara cast many a surreptitious glance at the stern young profile beside him, wondering whether his lordship would last out the tedious ride or no. 
He knew enough of Carstairs' indomitable courage to believe that he would, but he feared that it would prove too great a strain on him in his present weakened condition. Very wisely he made no attempt to draw Carstairs out of his abstraction, but continued to push on in silence, past fields knee-deep in grass, soon to be hay, with sorrel and poppies growing apace, along lanes with hedges high above their heads on either side, over hill and down dale, always in silence. Presently O'Hara fell a little to the rear, that he might study his friend without palpably turning to do so. He thought he had never seen Jack's face wear such a black look. The fine brows almost met over his nose, with only two sharp furrows to separate them. The mouth was compressed, the chin a little prominent, and the eyes, staring ahead between Jenny's nervous ears, seemed to see all without absorbing anything. One hand at his hip was clenched on his riding whip, the other mechanically guided the mare. O'Hara found himself admiring the lithe grace of the man, and his upright carriage and splendid seat. Suddenly, as if aware that he was being studied, my lord half turned his head and met O'Hara's eyes. He gave a tiny shrug, and with it seemed to throw off his oppression. The frown vanished, and he smiled. "'I beg your pardon, Miles. I am a surly fellow.' "'Mayhap your shoulder troubles you?' suggested O'Hara tactfully. "'No. I am barely conscious of it. I've no excuse beyond bad manners and a worse temper. From thence onward he set himself to entertain his friend, and if his laugh was sometimes rather forced, at least his wit was enough to keep O'Hara in a pleasurable state of amusement for some miles. By the time they arrived at Thur's house, Carstairs was suspiciously white about the mouth, and there was once more a furrow, this time of pain, between his brows. But he was able to greet my lady O'Hara with fitting elegance, and to pay her at least three neat, laughing compliments, before O'Hara took him firmly by the arm and marched him to his room, there to rest and recover before the dinner hour. Shortly after, Jim arrived, highly contented with his new surroundings, and able to give a satisfactory verdict on Jenny's stalling. He had quite accepted O'Hara as a friend, after some jealous qualms, and was now well pleased that his master should be in his house instead of roaming the countryside. At five o'clock, as the gong rang, my lord descended the stairs resplendent in old gold and silver trimmings, determined to be as gay and light-hearted as the occasion demanded, as though there had never been a Diana to upset the whole course of a man's life. Not for nothing had he fought against the world for six long years. Their teaching had been to hide all feeling beneath a perpetual mask of nonchalance and wit, never for an instant to betray a hurt, and never to allow it to appear that he was anything but the most carefree of men. The training stood him in good stead now, and even O'Hara wondered to see him in such spirits after all that had passed. Lady Molly was delighted with her guest, admiring his appearance, his fine courtly manners, and falling an easy victim to his charm. O'Hara, watching them, saw with content that his capricious little wife was really attracted to my lord. It was a high honour, for she was hard to please, and many of O'Hara's acquaintances had been received, if not with actual coldness, at least not with any degree of warmth. At the end of the meal she withdrew with the warning that they were not to sit too long over their wine, and that Miles was not to fatigue his lordship. O'Hara pushed the decanter towards his friend. "'Ave a piece of news for ye, I dare say will interest ye,' he remarked. Carstairs looked at him inquiringly. "'Aye, tis that his grace of Andover—' has withdrawn his precious person to Paris. Carstairs raised one eyebrow. I suppose he would naturally wish to remain in the background after our little fracas. Does he ever wish to be in the background? Oh, you'd probably know him better than I do. Does he? He does not. Tis always in the front he is. Mighty prominent. Damn him. My lord was faintly surprised. Why that? Has he ever interfered with you? He has interfered with me best friend to some purpose. I fear the boot was on the other leg. Well, I know something of how he interferes with Dick. Carstairs put down his glass, all attention now. With Dick? How? O'Hara seemed to regret having spoken. Oh, well, I've no sympathy with him. What has Tracy done to him? Tis nothing of great moment. Merely that he had that worthless brother of his seek to squeeze him dry. Robert. Andrew. I know very little of Robert. Andrew. But he was a child. 
and as rakish a young spendthrift as ye could wish for. Dick seems to pay their debts. Devil take him! Why? Heaven knows. I suppose Lavinia insists. We all knew that was for the reason Tracy flung you both in her way. Nonsense. We went of our own accord. She had but returned from school. Exactly. And whose doing was that but Tracy's? Carstairs opened his eyes rather wide and leant both arms on the table, crooking his fingers round the stem of his wine-glass. Do the debts amount to much? I can't tell ye that. Twas but by chance I found it out at all. The bellmen was were never moderate in the manner of living. No, we're any of us. Don't be so hard on them, Miles. I knew, of course, that the bellmen was estate was mortgaged, but I did not guess to what extent. I don't know that either. But Dick's money does not go to pay it off. Tis all frittered away on gambling and pretty women. My lord's brow darkened ominously. Yes, I think I shall have a little score to settle with Tracy on that subject. Some day. Miles said nothing. How does Dick manage without touching my money? I don't know. O'Hara's tone implied that he cared less. I hope he is not in debt himself, mused Carstairs. "'Tis like enough he is in some muddle. I wish I might persuade him to accept the revenue.' He frowned and drummed his fingers on the table. O'Hara exploded. "'Sure, twould be like you to be doing the same. Let the man alone for the Lord's sake, and don't be after worrying your head over a miserable spalpeen that did ye more harm than—' "'Miles, I cannot allow you to speak so of Dick. You do not understand.' "'I understand well enough. Tis too Christian you are entirely.' and let us have an end of this farce of yours. I know that Dick cheated as well as you do, and I say tis unnatural for you to be wanting him to take your money after he's done you out of honour and all else. Carstairs sipped his wine quietly, waiting for Miles's anger to evaporate, as it presently did, leaving him to glower balefully. Then he started to laugh. Oh, Miles, let me go on my own road. I'm a sore trial to you, I know. Then suddenly sobering, but I want you not to think so hardly of Dick. You know enough of him to understand a little how it all came about. You know how extravagant he was, and how often in debt. Can you not pardon the impulse of a mad moment? That I could pardon. What I cannot forgive is his unutterable meanness in letting you bear the blame. O'Hara, he was in love with Lavinia. So were you. Not so deeply. With me twas a boy's passion. But with him it was serious. O'Hara remained silent, his mouth unusually hard. "'Put yourself in his place,' pleaded Jack. "'If you—' "'Thank you,' O'Hara laughed unpleasantly. "'No, Jack. We shall not agree on this subject, and we had best leave it alone. I do not think you need worry about him, though. I believe he is not in debt. Does he have fair luck with his racing in his—' O'Hara smiled grimly. "'Dick is a very changed man, John. He does not keep racehorses. Neither does he play cards, save for appearance's sake. Dick not play? What then does he do? Manages your estates and conducts his wife to routes, when in town, bitterly. He inhabits your house. Well, there is none else to use it. But I cannot imagine Dick turned sober. Tis easy to be righteous after the evil is done, I'm thinking. My lord ignored this remark. A curious smile played about his mouth. Egad, Miles! "'Tis very entertaining. "'I, the erstwhile sober member, what is the matter? "'Am now the profligate. "'I dice, I gamble, I rob. "'Dick the ne'er-do-wheel is saint. "'He uh, lives a godly and righteous life, "'and uh, is robbed by his wife's relations. "'After all, I do not think I envy him over much. "'At least you're enjoying life more than he does,' said O'Hara, grinning. "'For you have no conscience to reckon with. Carstairs' face was inscrutable. He touched his lips with his napkin and smiled. "'As you say, I enjoy life the more. But as to conscience, I do not think it is that.' O'Hara glanced at him, sitting sideways in his chair, one arm flung over its back. "'Will you be offended if I ask you a question?' "'Of course not.' "'Do you intend to go back to this high-road robbery?' "'I do not.' "'What then will you do?' The shadows vanished, and my lord laughed. <laughs> to tell you the truth, Miles, I've not yet settled that point. Fate will decide, not I. 
End of chapter 15. Recording by Tara Mendoza. Phoenix, Arizona. August 2011. Chapter 16 of The Black Moth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tara Mendoza. The Black Moth by Georgette Hare. Chapter 16 Mr. Bettison Proposes. Mr. Bettison could make nothing of Diana of late. Her demeanour at first, so charming and so cheerful, had become listless and even chilling. She seemed hardly to listen to some of his best tales, and twice she actually forgot to laugh at what was surely a most witty pleasantry. It struck him that she regarded him with a resentful eye, as if she objected to his presence at Horton House, and had no desire to be courted. But Mr. Bettison was far too egotistic to believe such a thing, and he brushed the incredible suspicion away deciding that her coldness was due to a very proper shyness. He continued his visits until they became so frequent that scarce a day passed without his strutting step being heard approaching the house, and his voice inquiring for the Miss Bulays. Mr. Bulay, who secretly hoped for Mr. Bettison as a son-in-law, would not permit the ladies to deny themselves, and he further counselled Miss Betty to absent herself after the first few moments, leaving the young couple together. Thus it was that it so continually fell to Diana's lot to receive the squire and to listen to his never-ending monologues. She persistently snubbed him, hoping to ward off the impending proposal. But either her snubs were not severe enough, or Mr. Bettison's skin was too thick to feel them, for not a fortnight after my lord's departure he begged her hand in marriage. It was refused him with great firmness, but taking the refusal for coquettishness he pressed his suit still more amorously, and with such a self-assured air that Mistress Di became indignant. "'Sir,' she cried, "'it seems you have indeed misread my attitude towards you.' Mr. Bettison was struck dumb with amazement. It had never entered his brain that Diana could seriously refuse him. He could hardly believe his ears at this quite unmistakable tone of voice, and sat gaping. "'I must beg,' continued Diana, "'I must beg that you will discontinue.' your all-too-frequent visits here. Please do not deem me unkind, but your persecution of me, I can call it nothing else, is wearying, and, you will forgive the word, tiresome. I confess I am surprised that you had not perceived your attentions to be distasteful to me. Distasteful! cried Mr. Bettison, recovering after two or three unsuccessful attempts from his speechlessness. Do you mean what you say, Miss Diana? that you will not wed me. She nodded. Yes, Mr. Benison, I do. And that my attentions are displeasing to you. Well, Miss Bullet, well, indeed. Diana softened a little. I am indeed sorry that you should have misconstrued. No misconstruction, madame, snapped the squire, who was fast losing control over his temper. Do you dare, Ava, that you did not encourage me to visit you? I do most emphatically. Oh, I see what is. You cannot hoodwink me. T'was never thus with you before that fellow came. Mr. Bettison, I am entirely at a loss, but I desire you to leave this room before you say aught you may afterwards regret. He disregarded her. You are infatuated by that overdressed popinjay, that insufferable car, who, from all I hear, is but a shady fellow, and who— with a sweeping movement, Diana had risen and walked to the bell-rope. She now pulled it with such vigour that a great peal sounded throughout the house. She stood perfectly still, a statue of disdain, tall, beautiful, and furious, with compressed lips and head held high. Mr. Bettison broke off and mopped his brow, glaring at her. Startled, Thomas appeared at the door. "'Did you ring, madame?' "'Show Mr. Bettison out,' was the proud answer. The squire got up awkwardly. "'I am sure I apologize if I said aught that was untrue,' he mumbled. "'I hope you will not take my words amiss.' "'I shall try to forget your insult, sir,' she replied. "'The door, Thomas.' Mr. Bettison went out, and his step had lost some of its self-confident swagger. For a full minute after the great front door had shut behind him, Diana stood where she was, and then the colour suddenly flamed in her cheeks, 
and she turned and ran out of the room, up the stairs to her own chamber, where she indulged in a luxurious fit of crying. From this enjoyable occupation she was interrupted by a rap on the door, and Miss Betty's voice desiring to know if she was within. She instantly started up, and with hasty fingers straightened her tumbled curls. "'Pray, enter!' she called, trying to sound jaunty. To complete the illusion, she started to hum. Her aunt entered. "'I came to see if you had my embroidery. I cannot find it, and I am sure it was you brought it in from the garden this morning. Yes, oh yes, I am so sorry. Tis in that corner on the chair, I think,' replied Diana, keeping her face averted. Miss Betty cast a shrewd glance at her, and sat down on the sofa with the air of one who means to stay. "'What is it, my love?' she demanded. Diana pretended to search for something in a cupboard. "'Nothing, aunt. What should there be?' "'I do not know. Tis what I want to find out,' answered Miss Betty placidly. "'There is not amiss, I assure you.' To prove the truth of this statement, Diana essayed a laugh. It was a poor attempt, and wavered pitifully into a sob. "'My pet, don't tell me you are crying!' "'I'm not!' avowed Diana, hunting wildly for her pocket-handkerchief. "'Tis a cold in the head I have at these three days.' "'Indeed, my love, longer than that, I fear. "'Yes, perhaps so. What do you mean?' "'I doubt what you all caught it the day that Mr. Carr left us.' Diana started. "'Pray, do not be ridiculous, Auntie.' "'No, my dear.' "'Come and sit beside me and tell me all about it,' coaxed Miss Betty. Diana hesitated, gave a damp sniff, and obeyed. Miss Betty drew her head down on to her shoulder soothingly. "'There, there, don't cry, my sweet. What has happened?' "'Tis that odious Mr. Bettison,' sobbed Diana. "'He—he he had the audacity to ask me to m marry him.' "'You don't say so. Oh, my love, I thought I heard him arrive. So you sent him about his business? Not, not before he had time to insult me.' "'Insult you? Di? He, he dared to insinuate. Oh, no, he accused me outright of being infatuated by Mr. Carr. Infatuated?' Over her head, Miss Betty opened her eyes at her own reflection in the glass. "'The brute! But of course, tis true.' No answer. "'Is it not?' The sobs came faster. Uh, "'Of course it's true! <laughs> but how dare he say so?' "'Die, my love. You really are in love with that boy.' "'I, I, I asked him to marry me, and he wouldn't.' "'Good gracious heavens!' Miss Betty was genuinely horrified. "'My dear Diana, not, not outright, but, but he understood. And he loves me, and I'd do it again to-morrow if I could, immodest or no. So there!' "'Yes, yes,' soothed Miss Betty hastily. "'Tell me all about it.' Diana lifted her head. That's all. And he loves me. He does. He does. Did he say so? N no, but I could tell. And I love him. And, and I'd sooner die than live without him. And he won't ask me b because he has not got a spotless b past. And he'd be a cur. And horrid things. And my husband must not be an, an outcast. And Her bewildered aunt unravelled this with difficulty. "'He'd be a cur if he asked you to marry him?' she asked with knitted brows. "'Yes, because he's a highwayman.' "'A highwayman? Then t'was true, what he said. Well, well, I should never have thought it. That nice boy!' Diana disengaged herself. In her eyes was a threatening gleam. "'Don't you dare say a word against him!' "'No, no, 
"'No, of course not. I was only surprised. But I am thankfully glad he did not ask you, for all of that. Glad? How can you be so cruel? My dear, you could not possibly marry a—a— a Common felon? sobbed Diana. I can! I can! And heaven alone knows what else he may have done. Why, child, he said himself that he had a—a a spotty past— at this, her niece gave a tearful giggle. <laughs> "'Law, what ails you now, Di?' He, "'He never said spotty,' Miss Betty smiled reluctantly. "'A doubtful past, then. I don't believe it.' Her aunt pursed up her lips. "'I won't believe it. He couldn't be wicked, you forget. He saved me.' Miss Betty relented. "'No.' I do not, my love, and to be sure, I think he is a dear boy. But I also think twas very right of him to go away. She was enveloped in a rapturous embrace. Auntie, you know you love him almost as much as I do. No, that I do not, was the grim retort. I am not like to want to marry him. There was another watery giggle at this and Diana went over to the dressing-table to tidy her hair. "'I doubt I shall never see him again,' she said wretchedly. "'Oh, Auntie, if you could but have seen his dear, unhappy eyes!' "'Stuff and nonsense! Not see him again, forsooth! He will call upon us in town. Tis but common politeness.' "'You forget. He is a highwayman and not like to come nigh us again.' "'Well, my dear, if he cares for you as you say he does, he will see to it that he takes up some decent occupation. Mayhap he will go into the army or what not. Then wait and see if he does not come to you.' "'Do you think so?' doubtfully. "'Of course I do, sweetheart. And if he does not try to mend his ways, and you see him no more, why then snap your fingers at him, my love.' for he will not be worth one tear. Diana sighed and poured out some water to bathe her face with. Is that not sensible? coaxed her aunt. She raised her head and looked unutterable scorn. I think tis remarkably silly, she answered. Then her dignity fell from her. Oh, are all men such big stupids? she cried. Most of them, nodded her aunt. But can't he tell that I shall be— Oh, so miserable, and that I should not ruin my life if I married him. My dear, once a man gets an idea into his head, tis the very devil to get it out of him. Not but what I think Master Jack is right, mind you. And your dear papa and I had looked higher for you. After all, what is Mr. Carr? He is the only man I will ever marry. So you may cease looking higher for me. I suppose you want me to marry that great gabby Sir Dennis Fabian. You are for ever inviting him to the house. Or perhaps this gallant Mr. Bettison, or Mr. Everard. How can you be so unkind? I am not. But I could not bear to see you throw yourself away on a highwayman, my dear. Diana ran to her, putting her arms round her neck. Dearest auntie, forgive my rudeness. I know you did not mean to be unkind. But you do not understand— I love him. I always said you'd take it badly, nodded Miss Betty gloomily. Take what badly? Love. And no man is worth one teardrop sweet. The confident, tender little laugh that answered this statement made her look at her suddenly changed niece in surprise. You don't know, said Diana. Her eyes were soft and luminous. You just do not know. Before Miss Betty could think of a suitable retort, a knock fell on the door. It was opened, and Thomas was found to be without. "'My Lady O'Hara is below, madame.' For an instant the two ladies stared at one another, then— "'Law and drat,' said Miss Betty, "'with the drawing-room in a muddle after cleaning.' Diana nodded to the man. "'We will come, Thomas.' Then as soon as he had withdrawn, she stared again at her aunt. "'Lady O'Hara!' But why? 
I suppose she felt that she must call after Sir Miles had been here so often. But why, for goodness' sake, must she choose the one day that the drawing-room is all untidy? Drat again, I say. Diana was powdering her little nose, and anxiously looking to see if the tear-stains had quite vanished. "'Tis not untidy, Aunt Betty. Oh, I am quite eager to see her. I think she must be charming, from all Sir Miles said. Do hurry, Aunt. Miss Betty stuck a pin into her hair and smoothed out her dress. "'And me in this old taffeta,' she grumbled. Diana swirled round her own peach-coloured silk rustling fashionably. "'Never mind, dear. You look very sweet. But do be quick.' Miss Betty suffered herself to be led to the door. "'Tis all very fine for you, my love, with a new gown fresh on to-day. Will you just take a look at my petticoat, though?' "'Nonsense. You are beautiful. Come.' Together they descended the stairs and went into the drawing-room. A dainty, very diminutive little lady arose from a chair at their entry, and came forward with outstretched hands, and such a fascinating smile that Miss Betty's ill-humour vanished, and she responded to her visitor's deep curtsy with one of her best jerky dips. "'I am vastly delighted to welcome you, madame,' she said primly. "'Tis good in you to come this long way to see us.' She drew a chair forward for my lady and presented her niece. Lady O'Hara gave the girl a swift, scrutinizing glance, and curtsied again. "'Tis a great pleasure to me to meet you at last, Miss Bullet. She smiled. "'My husband has told me so much of you. I declare I was all agog to meet you.' Diana warmed instantly to the little lady's charm. "'We, too, have heard much of you from Sir Miles. We have wanted to meet you.' Lady O'Hara seated herself and nodded briskly. "'I expect he told you some dreadful tales of me,' she said happily. "'I must ask your pardon for not having visited you before. But, as I dare say you know, I have been away, and gracious me, when I returned, everything seemed topsy-turvy.' She laughed across at Miss Betty. "'I promise you, I have had my hands full putting things to rights, Miss Bullet. Miss Bullet drew her chair closer— and in a minute they were deep in truly feminine conversation. The prodigious extravagance of the servants, the helplessness of menfolk when left to themselves, and then London, its shops, its parks, the newest play. Lady O'Hara was begged to take a dish of Miss Betty's precious bohea, a very high honour indeed, and when Mr. Bullet came into the room, he found his sister and daughter seated on either side of a pretty, animated little lady whom he had never before seen, talking hard, and partaking of tea and angel-cakes. Whereupon he retired hastily, and shut himself up in his library. End of chapter 16 Recording by Tara Mendoza Phoenix, Arizona, August 2011Chapter 17 of the Black Moth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tara Mendoza. The Black Moth by Georgette Hare. Chapter 17 Lady O'Hara Wins Her Point. Lady O'Hara looked across at her sleeping husband with no little severity in her glance. He was stretched in a chair beneath a giant oak, and she was busied with some needlework a few paces from him. O'Hara's eyes were shut, and his mouth open. Milady frowned and coughed. She rasped her throat quite considerably, but it was not without effect. Her spouse shut his mouth and opened one lazy eyelid. Immediately Milady assumed an air of gentle mournfulness, and the eye regarding her twinkled a little, threatening to close. Molly looked reproachful, and began to speak in an aggrieved tone. "'Indeed! And I do not think it at all kind in you to go to sleep when I want to talk, sir.' O'Hara hastily opened the other eye. "'Why, my love, I was not asleep. I was, er, uh, thinking.' "'Do you say so, sir? And do you usually think, with your mouth open, snoring?' O'Hara started up. "'Oh, swear! I did not snore.' he cried. "'Molly, tis a wicked tease ye are. "'Miles, tis a big baby ye are,' she mimicked. "'There is a caterpillar on your wig, and tis on crooked.' "'The caterpillar?' asked O'Hara, bewildered. 
"'No, stupid. The wig. I had best straighten it for you, I suppose.' She rose and stooped over him, settling the wig and removing the caterpillar by means of two leaves, judiciously wielded. Then she dropped a kiss on her husband's brow and sat down at his feet. First, you have never asked me where I was gone to all yesterday afternoon. O'Hara had been carefully broken in, and he now knew what was expected of him, and put on an expression of great interest. Where did you go, my lady? I went to call on Miss Pulet and her niece, sir. She looked up at him triumphantly and a little challengingly. The devil you did! Certainly, sir. I knew that there was something in the air, and I remembered your letter to me, saying that Jack was in love with Diana. So I thought I would go and see for myself. Miles looked down at her half indulgently, half vexedly. Did you, Puss? I did, and I found that she was in love with him as well as he with her, of course. Of course? Who could help falling in love with him? He's so monstrous captivating. I would like to marry him myself. She bent her head to hide the roguish smile that had sprung to her lips. I beg your pardon, asked O'Hara, startled. My lady traced patterns on his knee. Provided, of course, that I had not already married you, Miles. But O'Hara had seen the smile. He heaved a great sigh and said in lugubrious tones, There is always the river, madam. My lady's finger wavered and stopped, and her hand tucked itself away into his. That is not a nice joke, Miles. He laughed and tweaked one of her curls. Sure, and did ye not ask for it at the store? Of course I did not. But about Jack, dear. I thought it was about Jack. Miles, will you be quiet and attend? Yes, my dear. Very well, then. As I have told you, I drove over to Little Dean yesterday afternoon, and I made the acquaintance of the Miss Bulets. And what did you think of them? I thought Diana was wonderfully beautiful. Such eyes, Miles, and such hair. Miss Bulet is very amiable, and so droll. I drank a dish of tea with them, and I spoke of Jack. Madcap, never tell me you called him Carstairs. No, you great Gabby, of course I did not. As it chanced, Miss Bulet mentioned him first, and she called him Mr. Carr, so I did too. And I noticed that Diana said scarce a word about him, and when she did, twas of the coolest. That, of course, made me all the more certain that she loved him. O'Hara was plainly puzzled. But why should you be certain if she did not speak of him, Rana? Tis what you'll never understand, my dear, because you are but a man. But no matter. I knew. I quite adored Diana, and determined to talk to her alone. So I admired the roses, and she offered to escort me round the garden, which was what I wanted. We went out together. I think Diana must have liked me for— Nonsense! Be quiet, Miles! For she dropped her ice and became quite friendly, and I talked a lot. She was unaware of a convulsive movement above her and a suppressed cough. She raised inquiring eyebrows. Well, sir? Nothing, Astor, nothing. Go on with the tale you were saying. That I talked a lot. She paused, and her eyes dared him. Then she dimpled and dropped her lashes over them. I shan't tell you all I said. A relieved sigh interrupted her. And if you continue to behave in this disagreeable fashion, I shall not say another word about anything. Having satisfied herself that he was not going to venture a retort, she continued. We had a long chat, and I gathered from all she said and left unsaid that Jack, for some foolish reason, will not ask her to marry him. Foolish reason, Astor, he interrupted. Oh, I know you consider it a remarkable fine reason, but I tell you, tis rank cruelty to that poor child, as if she cared about highwaymen. T'was not so much that. I take it as— Yes, but— But he could tell her he was innocent. Oh, Miles— do not look so provoking. Of course he could. I vow if you had treated me so, I would never have let you go until you had truly repented. I am of a mind to speak to Jack. T'would be an entertaining sight, but you'll kindly have a care how you touch him, my lady. He does not understand. I know she would be proud to marry him. And you'd think it a fine thing in Jack to ask her. 
the way things are with him at present. I—' "'Oh, I don't know.' "'No, me love. Jack is right. He must first clear his name.' "'Thank goodness gracious me! Why does he not?' cried Molly, exasperated. This time it was O'Hara's turn to look superior. "'Well, Ilana, that's a question you cannot hope to understand, because you are but a woman.' Lady O'Hara ignored the challenge. "'But what is to be done?' "'Not. He will have to work it out himself. He bound me to secrecy some time ago, or I would be tempted to speak to Richard.' "'I quite hate Richard,' she cried. "'He must be a selfish, unkind person. And now Jack swears he must go away almost at once, and, oh, you should have seen Diana's face of despair when I mentioned that he was going abroad again.' "'Miles, we must keep him here as long as ever we can. "'Oh, dear, tis all very worrying.' "'She broke off as O'Hara pressed her hand warningly. "'My lord was coming across the lawn towards them. "'I am in dire disgrace,' he said. "'I was left with your ferocious baby, Molly, "'and to quiet him I gave him a string of beads "'that you had left on the table.' "'My precious Indian wooden beads?' "'Yes, I believe so.' Anyway, the paint came off, and when Jane returned, David looked as though he had some horrible disease. She was most annoyed about it. He sat down in Molly's lately vacated chair, and carefully wiped a daub of green from his forefinger. Molly laughed. "'Poor Jane! She will have such a task to clean him. But you've arrived most opportunely. We were talking of you.' O'Hara groaned inwardly and tried to frown her down. "'You were?' "'I am flattered. May I ask what you were saying?' "'Why, that we do not want you to go back to France.' O'Hara breathed again. "'That is very kind of you, my lady. I regret the necessity myself.' "'Are you sure it is necessary? You might just as well live in a nice place near here, with a dear old woman to keep house for you, and—and Jim, and, and lots of pleasant things.' My lord shook his head. "'No, thank you.' "'Yes, yes.' "'And later on you could choose a wife,' she continued audaciously. "'Not at all. There would be no choice. I should be made to marry the dear old woman. You would bull me into it.' She laughed. "'Seriously, Jack, could you not settle down near here?' "'Not with that old woman, Molly.' "'Never mind her. Won't you consider it? No one need know you. In fact, you need see no one. Oh, and Jack! "'Don't look like that. Miles, is he not ridiculous?' "'Sure, Lana. Tis a dreary life he be leading,' chuckled O'Hara. "'I see what it is, Molly. You have planned to make me a recluse, and to marry me to my housekeeper. I protest. Tis great ill-usage.' Molly eyed him doubtfully. "'Would you much object to the life, John?' "'Madame,' he replied solemnly. "'You would find my corpse in the garden at the end of the first week.' "'Of course I should not like that,' she pondered. "'But I do not see what else we can do for you. "'Oh, and that reminds me. "'I drove over to Little Dean yesterday. "'Miles, my love, will you be so kind as to fetch me my hat? "'I protest the sun.' "'We will move more into the shade,' said her disobliging husband. "'Oh, well, tis of no account.' though I did hear that Brown was wanting to speak to you about the new cob. "'Tis prodigious thoughtful of you, Molly. But I met Brown some time ago. Lady O'Hara gave it up. Well, as I was saying, Jack, I went to call at Horton House. Dear me, what a beautiful girl Diana is, to be sure. Carstairs tried to think of something to say, and failing, made a non-committal sound. They both sent their kind wishes and hoped you were better. "'Goodness, tis very close here. I wonder if you will give me your arm round the garden. And would you fetch me my hat? I left it in the hall, I think. Thank you very much.' She waited until he was out of earshot before she turned to her husband. "'Now, Miles, you must please to stay where you are. I'm not going to do anything indiscreet.' "'Molly, I can't have you worry him.' "'No such thing. I'm going to coax him to stay here, instead of going abroad.' I feel sure that if we can but persuade him to stay, something will happen. What will happen? Something. How do you know? I don't know. I only feel it. 
"'Very well, Astor. If you can tease Jack into staying, I'll bless ye. "'That will be most enjoyable, I make no doubt,' she answered, and stepped back out of reach. "'Oh, thank you, John.' She tied the hat over her curls and placed her hand on my lord's arm. "'Lazy Miles is going to sleep again,' she said. "'And I so dislike to hear him snore. So let's go a long way away, into the rose garden.' "'Don't go so far as all that,' drawled Miles, closing his eyes. "'You will tire yourselves.' "'Do you allow him to make these ribald remarks?' inquired Jack, waiting for her to extricate a stone from her shoe. "'Not usually,' she answered. He takes advantage when you are here. She dropped the pebble on top of O'Hara and strolled away with my lord. As soon as they had rounded a corner in the shrubbery, she commenced the attack. "'I want to speak to you of Miles,' she confided. "'He is so worried.' "'Is he, Molly?' "'Faith, I hadn't noticed it.' She reflected that neither had she, but continued, nothing daunted. "'Ah, but he is.' "'What worries him?' "'You.' sighed the lady mournfully. "'Tis the thought of you leaving us. I feel it myself. Why, he had hoped you would be with us for a long time, as I had. "'Tis monstrous good of you both, but I am sure I do not know what I shall do with Miles when you are gone. He was so looking forward to having you with him. Molly, and indeed it has come as a great disappointment to both of us to hear you talk of leaving. Won't you think better of it?' "'Molly, you overwhelm me. How can I remain here indefinitely?' "'If you only would. You don't know how happy it would make us. I declare Miles will worry himself quite ill if you persist in being so unkind.' "'Oh, Molly, you rogue!' She could not repress a smile, but checked it almost at once. "'I mean it, Jack. What? That Miles is worrying himself ill over me? Fie!' "'Perhaps not as bad as that,' she admitted. "'But, indeed, he is much perturbed, and, oh, I wish that you would not make us so unhappy.' She dabbed at her eyes with a wispy handkerchief, but managed to watch his face all the same. "'David loves you so, the pet, and Miles is so delighted to have found you again, and I like you, and, and, and I think twill be indeed rude and horrid if you do go, besides being so silly.' "'Do you, Molly? You make me feel I should be an ungrateful ball to refuse.' The handkerchief was whisked away. "'Then, of course, you won't try to refuse. You'll stay. Promise?' "'I cannot thank you enough. Oh, you nice Jack. Till the autumn. Promise. Molly, I really promise. I shall cry if you do not. I cannot. How could I prey upon your hospitality for so—' "'What rubbish, Jack!' "'As if Miles had not spent months and months at Wincham when you were boys. "'That was different. "'When you were boys, and now you are so proud "'that you refused to stay three miserable little months with us? "'No, no, Molly, indeed, tis not that. "'Confess, if Miles were a bachelor, you would not hesitate.' "'He was silent, nonplussed. "'You see, and just because he has a wife, you are disagreeable and proud. "'You feel you cannot bear to stay with me.' "'I swear I do not.' "'Then why do you refuse?' she triumphed. "'Molly, really, I—' he broke off, laughing. "'You little wretch! You leave me nothing to say.' "'Then you will stay as I ask?' "'You are quite sure. Quite. Thank you very much. I will stay. "'Tis monstrous good of you, I vow. When you are tired of me, say so.' "'I will,' she promised. "'Oh, but we shall do famously. How pleased Miles will be. By the way,' she continued airily, "'I asked the Miss Pilets to honour us on Wednesday, but unfortunately they could not. Still, perhaps some other day—' She stopped a little frightened, for he was standing before her, gripping her shoulders in a very elder brotherly fashion. "'Listen to me, Molly. I know that you have discovered that I love Diana, and I know that you think to be very kind and to bring us together. But I tell you, that will not be kind at all, only very cruel to us both. If you worry her to come here, I must go. Do you see? Molly looked into the stern eyes, and her lip trembled. I'm very sorry, she faltered. Jack drew her arm through his once more, 
"'Tis nothing to be sorry about. "'And, indeed, I am very grateful to you for trying to make me happy. "'But please do not. "'No, I promise. I will not. "'But, but do you think you are being quite fair to—' "'Molly, tell me this. "'Do you think you are being quite fair to disobey your husband?' "'The blue eyes were dancing. "'She smiled doubtfully. "'What do you mean, Jack?' "'Do you tell me that Miles did not expressly forbid you to mention this subject to me?' She pulled her hand away, her mouth forming a soundless O. Oh. "'Well, well, well! How horrid of you!' she cried, and shook her fist at him. "'I'm going now!' Later she found her husband in the library, and ran into his arms. "'Do you mind holding me tightly?' she asked. "'I've—I've I've been put in the corner.' "'What?' O'Hara drew her on to his knee. "'Yes, figuratively, by Jack. I think perhaps I shouldn't like to marry him after all.' "'What has he done?' "'Nothing, I'm afraid,' polishing one of his buttons with an assiduous finger. "'I'm afraid that it was rather my own fault.' "'Oh?' "'Yes, but I only said very little about the Miss Bulays, and he suddenly turned into an iceberg and made me feel like a naughty little girl.' but he is going to stay all the same. So kiss me, Miles. End of chapter 17 Recording by Tara Mendoza Phoenix, Arizona, September 2011Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tara Mendoza. The Black Moth by Georgette Hare. Chapter 18. Enter Captain Harold Lovelace. At the end of August, after having spent a moderately quiet summer in the country, Lady Lavinia was again seized with a longing for town and its attractions. She would not listen to Richard's warnings of the atrocious condition of the roads, declaring that she cared not one jot and go to London she must. After that one protest, he desisted, and promised to take her there the following week, secretly counting himself lucky to have kept her so long at Wincham in comparative cheerfulness of spirits. Lavinia was overjoyed, kissed him again and again, scolded herself for being such a wicked tease, and set about making her preparations for the journey. The roads proved even worse than Richard had prophesied, and twice the coach nearly upset, and times without number stuck fast in the mire, causing the inmates much inconvenience. Carstairs rode by the side of the heavy vehicle, in which were his wife, her maid, her tiny dog, and countless bandboxes and small parcels. In spite of the worry, the constant stoppages entailed, he quite enjoyed the journey, for Lavinia was in excellent spirits, and made light of their mishaps, receiving each fresh one with roguish laughter and some witty remark. Even when the chimney of her bedchamber, at one of the inns at which they halted, smoked most vilely, she did not, as Richard quite expected she would, fly into a rage and refuse to spend another moment in the house, but, after looking extremely doleful, cheered up and told dear Dicky that she would have his room while he should have hers. Then in the morning she would find him all dried up and smoked. In high good humour she went down to dinner with him, voted the partridges excellent, the pasties quite French, and the wine marvellously tolerable for such an out-of-the-way place, and kept him laughing at her antics until bedtime. The journey was of necessity very slow, not only on account of the bad roads, but because whenever my lady caught sight of wild roses growing on the hedges, she must stop to pluck some. Then she and Richard would stroll along for some way, he leading his horse, the coach following at a walking pace all of which was very idyllic, and had the effect of sending Richard to the seventh heaven of content. When at length they arrived at Wincham House, Mayfair, they found that the servants had arrived a week before, and had made good use of their time. Never, declared Lavinia, had the house looked so inviting, so spick and span. One of her black pages proffered a small monkey, with much bowing and grinning, and the murmur of, Massa's present. Lady Lavinia flew to embrace her dicky. How did he guess that she had for so long yearned for a monkey? Surely she had but once or twice mentioned it. Oh, he was the very best of husbands. She danced off to her apartments in a state of ecstasy. The beau monde was retiring to town, 
and when a few days later Carstairs conducted his wife to Ronley, they found the gardens fairly crowded and very gay. Lamps hung from tree branches, although it was still quite light. The fiddlers scraped away almost without a pause. Fireworks shot up from one end, the summer houses had all been freshly painted, and the pavilion was a blaze of light. Consciousness of her beauty and the smartness of her Georgia silk gown, with its petticoat covered in gold net, considerably added to Lavinia's enjoyment. Her hair she wore powdered, and elaborately curled down on both sides with dainty escalloped lace half concealing it, and a grey capuchin over all. Her tippet was gold lace to match her petticoat, and to fasten it she wore a brooch, composed of clustered rubies. Rubies also hung in her earrings, which last were of such length that the other ladies turned to stare in envy, and the bracelets that she wore over her long gloves flashed also with the great red stones. She was well pleased with Richard's appearance and reflected that, when he chose, he could be very fashionable indeed. The claret-coloured velvet he was wearing was most distinguished, and the gold clocks to his hose quite ravishing. They had not been in the gardens ten minutes before a little crowd of men had gathered around them, professing themselves in rapture to behold the fair Lady Lavinia once more. One of them fetched her a chair, another a glass of negus, and the rest hovered eagerly about her. Becomingly flushed with triumph, my lady gave her little hand to Mr. Selwyn, who had been once a very ardent admirer, laughed at his neat compliment, and declared that he was a dreadful flattering demon, and positively she would not listen to him. Sir Gregory Markham, who brought her the negus, she discovered to have just returned from Paris. On hearing this, she broke off in the middle of a conversation with an enchanted French chevalier, and turned to him, raising her china-blue eyes to his face, and clasping tight-gloved hands. "'Oh, Sir Gregory!' Paris? Then tell me, please tell me, have you seen my darling devil? Why, yes, madame, responded Markham, handing her the glass he held. She sipped the negus and gave it to the chevalier to take care of. I declare, I quite love you, then, she exclaimed. What is he doing? And, oh, when will he return to England? Sir Gregory smiled. How can I say? he drawled. I fear monsieur's amuse. She flirted her fan before her face. "'Dreadful creature!' she cried. "'How dare you say such things?' "'Belmanoir,' inquired Lord d'Egmont, twirling his cane. "'Enamoured of the Pompadour, is he not? Saving your presence, Lady Lavie.' Lavinia let fall her fan. "'The Pompadour? He had best have a care.' "'I believe there has already been some unpleasantness between His Majesty and the fair Jean on the subject of devil.' since then he is supposed to have turned on him a cold shoulder i heard twas he wearied of madame said markham well whichever it was i am glad the episode is closed decided lavinia tis too dangerous a game to play with louis's mistresses oh mon cher chevalier if i had not forgot your presence but i am sure you say dreadful ill-natured things of our george now don't you oh and have you held my negus all this time how monstrous good of you! There, I will drink it, and Julian shall take the glass away. Voila! She handed it to de Edgemont and wrapped Mr. Selwyn's knuckles with her fan, looking archly up at him as he stood behind her chair. Naughty man! Will you have done whispering in my ear? I vow, I will not listen to your impudences. No, nor laugh at them, neither. Sir Gregory, you have given me no answer. When will Tracy return? for the Cavendish route on Wednesday week. Ah, say yes. Certainly, I will say yes, fair tormentor. But to tell the truth, Tracy said no word of coming to London when I saw him. She pouted. Now I hate you, Sir Gregory, and he has been absent since May. Oh, Julian, back already. You shall escort me to the fireworks, then. Oh, my fan, where is it? I know I dropped it on the ground. So, if you have taken it, oh, Dicky, you have it. Thank you. See, I am going with Julian, and you may ogle Mrs. Clive, whom I see walking over there. Yes, positively you may, and I shall not be jealous. Very well, Julian. I am coming. Chevalier, I shall hope to see you at the route on Wednesday week, but you must wait upon me before then. The Frenchman brightened. Madame is too good. I may call at Winter Mouse, vraiment? I shall both exist until then. In a perfectly audible whisper, he confided to Wilding that Milady Dieter Vesant, 
Merevesant. Lady Lavinia went off on her gratified chevalier's arm, encountering many bows and much admiration as she passed down the walk, leaving her husband not to ogle the beautiful Kitty as she had advised, but to saunter away in the direction of the pavilion in company with Tom Wilding and Markham. De Edgemont guided my lady into one of the winding alleys, and they presently came out on a large lawn dotted over with people of all conditions. Towards them was coming Lavinia's brother, Colonel Lord Robert Belmanois, very richly clad and rakish in appearance. When he saw his sister, a look of surprise came into his florid face, and he made her a sweeping leg. Pon my honour, Lavinia. My lady was not fond of her brother, and acknowledged the salutation with a brief nod. "'I am delighted to see you, Robert,' she said primly. "'The mere word delighted in no way expresses my sensations,' replied the Colonel in the drawling, rather unpleasant voice, peculiar both to him and to the Duke. "'Your servant, de Edgemont. I imagined, Lavie, that you were in the country.' "'Richard brought me to town last Tuesday,' she answered. "'How unwise of him,' taunted the Colonel. "'Or had he no choice?' She tossed her head angrily. "'If you are minded to be disagreeable, Robert, pray do not let me detain you,' she flashed. De Edgemont was quite unembarrassed by this interchange of civilities. He knew the Belmanois family too well to be made uncomfortable by their bickerings. "'Shall we leave him?' he asked Lavinia, smiling. "'Yes,' she pouted. "'He is determined to be unpleasant.' "'My dear sister, on the contrary, I believe I can offer you some amusement. Lovelace is in town.' "'Captain Harold!' she cried incredulously. "'The same.' "'Oh, Bob!' Impulsively she withdrew her hand from Julian's arm, transferring it to the Colonel's. "'I must see him at once, to think he has returned after all these years. Quick, Julian, dear lad, go and find him, and tell him tis I, Lavinia, who want him.' You know him, do you not? Yes, I thought you did. Send him to me at once, at once. De Edgemont looked crestfallen at having his walk with the goddess thus cut short, but he had perforce to kiss her hand and to obey. Yes, I thought you would be pleased, remarked Lord Robert, and chuckled. <laughs> Allow me to point out to you that there is a chair, two chairs, in fact, quite a number of chairs, immediately behind you. She sat down, chattering excitedly. "'Why, tis nigh on five years since I saw Harry. "'Has he changed? Lord, but he will deem me an old woman. "'Is he like to be in town for long, I wonder? "'Dear me, Bob, look at the two ladies over behind that seat. "'Gracious, what extraordinary quarfs, to be sure, and cherry ribbons, too. "'Tell me, Bob, where did you meet Harry Lovelace?' "'The Colonel, who far from attending to her monologue, "'had been sending amorous glances across to a palpably embarrassed girl "'who hung on her papa's arm while that gentleman stopped to speak to a stout dowager, "'brought his gaze reluctantly back to his sister. "'What's that you say, Lavvy? "'How provoking of you not to listen to me! "'I asked where you met Harold.' "'Where I meant him? Let me see. Hmm, where did I meet him? "'Oh, I remember. At the cocoa tree, a fortnight since.' "'And he is altered?' "'Not in any way, my dear sister. "'He is the same mad, reckless Rachel as ever, and unmarried.' "'How delightful! "'Oh, I shall be so glad to see him again!' "'You must present him to Richard,' sneered the Colonel, "'as an old flame.' "'I must indeed,' she agreed, his sarcasm passing over her head. "'Oh, I see him! "'Look, coming across the grass!' She rose to meet the tall, fair, young guardsman, who came swiftly towards her, curtsying as only Lady Lavinia could curtsy, with such stateliness and coquetry. "'Captain Lovelace!' she put forward both her hands. Lovelace caught them in his, and bent his head over them, so that soft, powdered curls of his loose wig fell all about his face. "'Lady Lavinia! Enchantress! I can find no words. I am dumb.' "'And I—' "'In that case—' drawled the colonel. You are not like to be very entertaining company. Pray give me leave. He bowed and sauntered away down the path, with a peculiarly malicious smile on his lips. Lavinia and Lovelace found two chairs slightly apart from the rest, and sat down, talking eagerly. "'Captain Lovelace, I believe you had forgot me,' she rallied him. "'Never,' he answered promptly. "'Not, though. You well-nigh broke my heart.' "'No.' 
"'No, I did not do that. I never meant to hurt you.' He shook his head disbelievingly. "'You rejected me to marry some other man. Do you say you did not mean to?' "'You naughty Harry! You never married yourself.' "'I?' The delicate features expressed a species of hurt horror. "'I? Mary? No. I was ever faithful to my first love.' She unfurled her fan, fluttering it delightedly. "'Oh, oh, always, Harold. Now speak the truth.' "'Nearly always,' he amended. "'Disagreeable man. You admit you had lapses, then?' "'So very trivial, my dear,' he excused himself. "'And I swear.' My first action on coming to London was to call at Wincham House. Imagine my disappointment, my incalculable gloom on the top of having already dropped a thousand at Pharaoh, when I found the shell void, and Venus. She stopped him, her fan held ready for chastisement. Sir, you said your first action was to call upon me. He smiled, shaking back his curls. I should have said— my first action of any importance. You do not deem losing a thousand guineas important? She asked wistfully. Well, hardly. One must enjoy life. And what's a thousand, after all? I had my pleasure out of it. Yes, she breathed, her eyes sparkling. That is how I think. What pleasure can one get if one neither hazards nor spends one's money? Oh, well, she shrugged one shoulder, dismissing the subject. "'Have you seen Tracy of late?' "'He was at a court ball I attended at Versailles, "'but I did not have a chance of speaking with him. "'I heard he was very popular at Paris.' "'Ay,' she said proudly, "'he has the French air. "'I so desire to see him again, "'but I fear he does not think of returning. "'I know he was promised for the Duchess of Devonshire's route "'months ago, before even the date was fixed. "'She so dotes on him. "'But I do not expect to see him there.' She sighed, and drummed on the ground with her diamond-buckled shoe. "'Harry, I am chilled. Take me to the pavilion. I doubt they are dancing, and Dicky will be there.' "'Dicky,' he repeated. "'Dicky, Lavinia, do not tell me there is another claimant to your heart.' "'Wicked and delicate creature. Tis my husband.' "'Your husband, in fiend. She cast him a sidelong glance of mingled coquetry and reproof. "'Your mind is at rest again, I trust?' "'Of course. A husband. Pooh! A bagatelle, no more.' "'My husband is not a bagatelle,' she laughed. "'I am very fond of him.' "'This grows serious,' he frowned. "'Tis very unfashionable, surely.' She meant his teasing eyes and cast down her lashes. "'Captain Lovelace, you may take me to the pavilion.' "'Sweet tormentor, not until you cease to misname me so.' "'Harold, I am indeed chilly,' she said plaintively, and snatched her hand from his lips. "'No, no. People will stare. Look, there is my odious brother returning. I declare I will not stay to listen to his hateful, sneering remarks. Come.' They walked across the grass together, keeping up a running fire of raillery, punctuated on his side by extravagant compliments filled with classical allusions, all more or less erroneous, and on hers by delighted little laughs and mock scoldings. So they came to the pavilion, where the musicians fiddled for those who wished to dance, and where most of the company had assembled now that it was growing chilly without. Down one end of the hall, card-tables were set out, where members of both sexes diced and gambled, drinking glasses of burgundy or negus, the men toasting the ladies, and very often the ladies returning the toasts with much archness and low curtsying. Lavinia cast off her capuchin and plumed her feathers, giving a surreptitious shake to her rouged skirts and smoothing her ruffles. She rustled forward with great stateliness, fan unfurled, head held high, her gloved fingers resting lightly on Lovelace's velvet-clad arm. Richard, hearing the little stir caused by her entry, glanced up and perceived her. He did not recognize her companion, but the sparkle in her eyes and the happy curve to her full lips were quite enough to tell him that it was someone whom she was very contented to have meant. He had ample opportunity for studying Lovelace, as the good-looking pair drew near, and he could not but admire the delicate handsome face, with the grey eyes that held a laugh in them, the pleasure-loving, well-curved mouth, and the chin that spoke of determination. Here was not one of Lavinia's lisping, painted puppy-dogs, for in spite of the effeminate curls it was easy to see that this man had character and a will of his own, and above all a great charm of manner. 
He saw Lavinia blush and rap the captain's knuckles in answer to some remark, and his heart sank. He rose and came to meet them. Lady Lavinia smiled sweetly upon him, and patted his arm with a possessive little air. "'Dicky, dear, I have found an old friend, a very old friend. Is it not agreeable? Captain Lovelace, Mr. Carstairs.' The two men bowed, Richard with reluctancy, the captain with easy bonhomie. "'Sir, I claim to be a worshipper at the shrine of which you, I believe, are high priest,' he said impudently, and bowed again, this time to my lady. "'You are one of many, sir,' smiled Richard. Lady Demereaux came tripping up to them and kissed Lavinia with a great show of affection. "'My dearest life, my sweet Lavinia!' Lady Lavinia presented a powdered cheek. "'Dearest Fanny, how charming to see you again!' she cooed. Through her lashes she gazed at her friend's enormous headdress with its rolls of powdered curls and the imitation flowers perched upon the top of the erection. "'But my angel!' exclaimed Lady Fanny, stepping back to view her. "'Surely you have been ill!' "'How strange!' smiled Lavinia. "'I was about to ask you that same question, my dear. "'Tis age, I doubt not. "'Do we both look such dreadful hags?' She turned her bewitching little countenance to the men, and smiled appealingly. Compliments showered upon her and Lady Devereux, who was conscious that her own sallow countenance, in spite of rouge and powder, must appear even more sallow beside Lavinia's pink and whiteness, flushed in annoyance, and turned away, begging her dearest Lavie to come to the pharaoh with her. But Lavinia, it appeared, was going to watch the dicing at Richard's table. She vowed she should bring him monstrous good luck. "'I don't doubt it, my dear,' replied her husband. "'But I am not playing to-night. "'Will you not take your luck to Bob?' "'He nodded to where the Colonel was lounging, dice-box in hand. "'Lavinia pouted. "'No, I want you to play.' "'Tis of no avail, Lady Lavinia,' drawled Sir Gregory. "'Richard is the very devil to-night.' "'Selwyn, rattling his dice, paused and looked round at Markham "'with a face of innocent surprise. "'Then he turned slowly and stared at Carstairs' grave, almost stern countenance, "'with even more surprise.' He started to rattle the dice again, and shifted back to face his opponent with pursed lips. "'Is he?' he inquired with studied depression. Even Lavinia joined in the general laugh, not so much at the wit's words as at the comic expression, and the extreme deliberation with which he had enacted the little scene. Someone cried a bet to Lovelace, which was promptly accepted, and Lavinia's eyes glowed afresh as she followed the captain to a table. Richard went to fetch her some refreshment, and on his return— found her leaning over Lovelace's chair, her hand on his shoulder, eagerly casting the dice onto the table. He was in time to see her clasp her hands and to hear her cry of, "'My luck! Oh, my luck is in! I will throw again!' Glancing round, she caught sight of her husband, and her face fell. "'Do you mind, Dicky?' she pleaded. He did mind, but he could not appear churlish before all these men, so he laughed and shook his head and went to her elbow to watch her play. When she at length ceased, her luck had run out, and she had lost her much-prized ruby earring to Mr. Selwyn, who placed it carefully in his vest pocket, vowing he should wear it next to his heart for ever. Then and then only did she consent to leave the gaming tables for the dancing hall, and for another hour Richard had the felicity of watching her tread the minuet with various young bloods, but most often with her new-found Harry Lovelace. End of chapter 18 Recording by Tara Mendoza Phoenix, Arizona, September 2011.